We are not able to place conditions on their entry into our markets by saying if you enter here, you are going to pay taxes. If you enter here, you are going to leave something here. If you enter here, you're going to leave money in the institutions. You're going to contribute to our schools. You're going to contribute to our recreational centers. You're going to contribute to the employment of our people and to the stability of our families. If you cannot contribute to these things, if you cannot create jobs, if you cannot contribute to the education of our people, then we cannot permit you to operate within our borders. This is the way a nation runs. You don't let another people walk in and have their way and walk out and leave you impoverished as a people in the name of a free market. There's no such thing as a free market. Yeah, that's white folks' propaganda. Free and open market. No free market. They forced people into that market. Castro was not free to say, I don't want to be a part of it. When he said, I don't want to be a part of it, they did what? Embargoed him and locked him out. The, China, the Japanese in the early uh, part of the century said, we don't want to be a part of your market. What did the United States do? Sent Admiral Perry in there and blasted those markets open. What free markets do you have there? There are no such things as free markets. And when you learn that, you're going, to, you, you, you're going to be the better for it. And we got the markets, but we are not taking advantage of them. We have gotten ourselves in a situation where we are locked out of other people's markets, and we permit them into our own, such that we are locked out of our own market. And then we wonder why we suffer the way we do. It is not because we are poor. If we were that poor and impoverished, then why do those people come to us to earn their living and their wealth? It means then we must be a wealthy people. I was looking over here at a recent report. You see, we have as a people everything that it needs to make a nation. We have telephones, fax machines, computers, highways, bridges, riverways, waterways, trucks, everything that many nations in the world, in fact, the vast majority of nations in the world wish that they had available to them what the African-American nation has available to it. They wish they had the highways. They wish they had the trucks. They wish they had the trains. They wish they had the ships. They wish they had the computers, the telephones, and all of those kinds of things that you can just pick up and dial right away, and they don't have to be rooted through France and somewhere else. The lights don't go off at 2 o'clock every day or just flip on and off. You got it all here. Then why then are we not better off than we are? Because it is not enough. As I told you earlier, it is not enough to have gold in your soil or oil in your soil or diamonds in your soil. You must have a consciousness. It is only with an appropriate consciousness that these things can be transformed and converted into what? wealth and power and can be used for the advancement of a people and the survival of a people. The same is true here then. You cannot just have telephones and faxes and this and that and not just have money in your pocket. That's not enough. You must have a consciousness that transforms those phones and transforms those faxes into a communications network that unites a people across regions and places and cities and becomes a basis for a system of distribution, a basis for uniting and creating a market from which one earns wealth to feed one's family and to stabilize one's social situation. But you can have all of these things, but if you don't have a sense of nation, if you don't have a group consciousness, if you do not identify yourself as a nation, then these are but so many instruments and becomes, as a matter of fact, the means by which we destroy ourselves. We are looking at the black, uh, black buying power in America here, 1990 to 95. We got a report here called the Georgia Business and Economic Conditions. 
published here by the Selick Center at the University of Georgia, titled Black Buying Power by Place of Residence, 1990 uh, to 95. The second of a two-part analysis of buying power in specific markets. What are we talking about here? Is this published for us? No. no. What it's published for is for white folk. Right. And it's telling them how much money black folk got. Right. And it's telling them that the, black, the money black folk got is the difference between their success and their failure. It reads in part here, Georgia's African-American uh, population thus controls approximately 16 cents of each dollar in spending power. That is about one dollar. Uh, that is about one dollar in six is spent by black consumers. How aware are we of the kind of power right. we have as African people? Right. Clearly, they are a substantial economic force throughout the state. Uh. All right. But without a nation of consciousness, you don't recognize that. Right but they recognize it. They go on to say, for many of Georgia's businesses, the ability to capture black spending can make the difference between success and failure. Right. They're putting it right in your face. If black spending power, if black spending can make the difference between the success and failure of Georgia businesses, and we're talking about what? white folks' businesses, that means black folk got what? Power. Because power is about what? The ability to succeed or to bring about what? Failure. And when somebody else's success or failure depends on your own behavior, then you have what? Power. New York State, the largest black market in the world, the largest black market in the world and the largest black market in this country. How much money are we worth in New York State, black people? You know how much money we are worth? $61 billion. That is a lot of money. This represents well over 10% of the buying power in New York State alone. I'm speaking of the, the, the area, the New York, Connecticut, tri-state area. And uh, what does that mean? Now, but don't look at that absolute figure. Look at what would happen if we reinvested that $60 billion. If we put that $60 billion in black businesses, in black trade, if we invested that $60 billion in gaining equity in the major American corporations, if we gained that, used that $60 billion to gain equity in African countries. You know, I was just reading a piece this week about the fact that black investment bankers, a couple of black investment bankers, are selling as much as $100 million of bonds for the, the African uh, Development Bank. Yes, another black investment banker is selling something like $500 million of securities for African businesses and infrastructural development. What does that mean, African people? That means that if we were knowledgeable of corporate finance, if we were knowledgeable of investment vehicles, we could literally finance the development of Africa. And by buying securities, in the African Development Bank, by buying bonds, by buying other investment instruments in African corporations, even if they're owned by white folk, because once we buy the shares, we become the owners. In other words, then, by using black wealth, we can become the vehicle for financing African growth and development. And by, by using our own wealth and financing our own businesses, developing our own economic system, we would multiply our wealth, and we would not only be then worth 400 billion, we'd be worth uh, 800 billion or more, and we would go stronger. And the stronger we go, grow, the more others would depend upon how we spend in order to survive, and to that degree, we will gain power over them. If tomorrow we decided as African people 
to build co-op supermarkets across this country, and we can do it. All right. So that we can sell our people grocery and food at below wholesale prices. Right. If we decided using our church organizations as a means for sponsoring these co-op uh, food markets across the country so that we can open them literally simultaneously and centered then the buying uh, power for all of those co-op centers in a way that then we would have billions of dollars to spend with the suppliers of food we could then manipulate those producers in terms of the buying power that we have. We can begin then to place our people on their boards. We can begin then to have real and substantial power right. in America. We have it in our hands, but you gotta think of it as nation. Right. It becomes interesting, by the way, if you study this particular breakdown of black spending in Georgia, and I wish we would get these breakdowns across the country. You see, when you become a state and a nation, you develop statistics. All right. you. you see, and that's where statistics come from. Right. It is the means by which a state and a nation gathers information about itself so that it can use that information to reorganize itself and to set itself up in ways to advance its interests. So once you become a nation, you become sensitive to the fact that you need a lot of information right. so that you can use this information. Now, when I read about the percentage of black buying power in Georgia by counties, something becomes very surprising. You note, for instance, that black buying power is as high as 25 and 26 percent in many of these counties. For instance, in Liberty County, Georgia, black buying power there uh, is a is 22% of the total buying power. In, Mer uh, in Merkweather, 25%. Peach County, 25%. Uh, and you can just go on and on. In some of these counties, black buying power is as much as 45%, 35%. In other words, the black consumer has these counties by the balls. And they are able, if that buying power was to be coordinated and used, to have real impact and to transform the power relations of those societies and of those counties. They would be able, if they are buying half or 25% or 30% of what is being bought in those counties to establish their own businesses and enterprises there. And they would be able to defend those businesses and enterprises through the use of the boycott weapon. All right. So what are we saying here then this evening, ladies and gentlemen? That African power is based on an African consciousness, based on an African-centered culture, based on an African-centered personality. And the degree to which our personalities and our culture are based on African values, based on African interests, based on African goals. To that degree, we empower ourselves as Africans, and to that degree, we escape the power of others over us. Thank you very much for your time. Dr. Amos Wilson. Dr. Amos Wilson. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. It's uh, great to be back here with you again this evening. It's been a while, and I, I always appreciate uh, coming and, and being with you. 
and uh, of course appreciate your support. And uh, I know each time I've been here, I've promised you about our next publication, but it's definitely on the way. All right. We uh, we we are definitely now expecting to be out in November. And of course, each time I talk with you, the book gets larger. <laughs> At last count, Brother Sababu, my co-partner there, told me we were around about 800 pages. So we're going to try to split it up for you, maybe four and four. Give you some good uh, wintertime reading. But then in a way, it's when we recognize that uh, we, are a, we are as complicated as any other people. And one of the things sometimes we underestimate the degree to which we must address ourselves as a people. And too often we have people who think that our issues and the things that we have to deal with can be described in 25 words or less. And that, uh, and so there are people who think that uh, we are small people and small-minded people, so uh, they don't have to write sometimes some sizable uh, material. If other nations and other people require libraries to deal with their issues, so do we. And uh, the interesting thing about the upcoming book is that with that 800 pages, it's basically a survey right. looking at various areas of life. Uh, if you recall, we, we, we titled it Blueprint for Black Power. And we are essentially then trying to lay out a blueprint, a prescriptive uh, book. Now we are coming into more and more into prescriptive type of writing, laying out very practical kinds of steps and very practical methods for achieving what it is we must achieve as African people. This means we have to cover a lot of territory. We are covering psychology, we are covering, of course, history, sociology, a great deal of political science, a great deal of uh, economic, uh, economics and uh, related fields, anthropology and so forth, because all of these have to be combined in the process of nation building. And this is what we really have to be about, is the process of building a nation All right. as a people. All right. If you're not thinking in terms of nationhood, then I must say, frankly, you're not thinking seriously of being liberated. All right. All right. Trying to integrate and merge with our enemies is not going to solve our problem. And it's not going to happen, as a matter of fact. It is a fantasy that has kept us uh, from taking care of business for far too long. The idea that we are going to one day be one with these people. <laughs> that we are going to merge into invisibility <laughs> with these white folks. And even if that were possible, we should question our motives for wanting to do so. <laughs> now, why would you want to merge with the world's greatest criminals and thieves, right. with the people who have the worst values right. the world has ever known? Right. It amazes me sometimes how we can hear some of our parents telling our children we want to be just like them. <laughs> yeah. It's a joke. It's an insult to hear Dan Quayle or to hear uh, President Clinton come and lecture black folk on values. How dare we let these people into our churches to try to lecture us on values? Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing situation to try to talk to us about values. 
to try to talk to us about population control. <laughs> Another joke. Yeah. Yeah. They're gonna, the first thing we think about when people talk about uh, population control is the overproduction of African people. You know, uh, so-called third world people. As I said, we can solve the overpopulation problem quickly if we could reduce the European population drastically. Mm -hmm. Yes, and people, are, they, of course, as I tell you, this world has to always be backwards, you see. The, the ones who need to be reduced most drastically have the world thinking the other way around. Because a good deal of the problem sometimes is not the number of people in the world, but the number of greedy people in the world, where you have a so-called minority of people who consume the vast majority of the world's resources. All right. All right. This large population that they talk about could eat better if these people weren't eating everything up. All right. And so to a good extent sometimes, to have more for everybody to eat, you have to get rid of the greedy ones. The ones who are over-consuming. Who are taking the food out of other people's mouths. You see? But here you have the people who rob you and take everything you got and then say, you don't have enough to support yourself. You know? And this is the kind of joke that we got going at here. And we're gonna come back to this issue of values. But we're going to talk a little bit about African-centered consciousness, personality, and culture as instruments of power. Because ultimately, this is what this whole struggle is about, power. Not loving one another and all those things we hear, power. And to a great extent, the problems that we are confronted with today as African people and African people in America flows from our powerlessness or our inappropriate use of power. Right. We've been made to even talk about it. We've been made to think that power is sinful mm -hmm. and that to pursue it is a sinful pursuit. All right. That's right. And that it's wrong. But you cannot exist without power. Without power, there is no life. A battery without power is dead. You need power to, to act, to behave in the world, to deal with the world. And consequently then, we must interpret what we are about in terms of power. And we have the power, ladies and gentlemen. We have the possibilities. We just need to reorganize ourselves, reorganize our consciousness and our personality and our culture and see them as instruments of power and use them as instruments of power to transform our situation. So we should not look at consciousness as some abstraction. As I often tell people, the most practical thing you can have is a good theory, is a good concept to guide your behavior, to be used as an instrument to measure reality as an instrument to test reality. A good theory then organizes the world and organizes one's approach to the world. It permits one to be able to evaluate the world in terms of where one wants to go and in terms of what one wants to do. To be without theory then is to approach the world on an ad hoc basis, you know, just to meet it uh, here and there and, and, and to not approach it in a systematic form to live reactionarily, always reacting to what other people are doing, always being overwhelmed by events and overwhelmed by the future instead of creating events and creating the future and making the future. Right. See, when one has then a good theory and a good concept, one is able to do that. Consciousness, without human consciousness, there is no world. It is the presence of human consciousness that brings meaning into the world. Without human beings in this world, conscious human beings in this world, 
In effect, there would not be a world. We bring the world into being through our consciousness. And through our consciousness, we create the world right. we live in. Out of the totality of, of reality, our consciousness cuts out a world that befits itself. In other words, the kind of world you exist in reflects the kind of consciousness that you have. And notice if you change your, 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 your consciousness or change your values and orientation, you enter into a different world. You interact with different people. People often that you didn't even know existed in the world. Social situations that you, you, you might not have even recognized until you entered into a, a new level of consciousness. You see people, say for instance, who become addicted, say to crack or something, and now enter into a whole world and enter into a whole social system that before they became addicted, they hardly noticed. They didn't know what it was all about. And they picked up new friends and new relations, whole new ways of acting, whole new purposes in life. They lost old friends, broke with old families, and all kinds of things. In other words, the consciousness, that addictive consciousness, brought into the world a new foreground and put other things into the background. Therefore, man's consciousness is a creative act. And the kind of consciousness you have will determine the kind of world you create. All right. And consequently, when you look at the world that we live in, African people, we must recognize to a great extent it is a world of our own creation. All right. It is a world that has been generated by the type of consciousness we've been permitted to be instilled in us as a people. Right. As I told you earlier today on the radio, we talk about the white man as having power. And I want you to recognize that power ultimately has to do with a relationship right. between people. And that the white man's so-called power is to a great extent based upon the nature of the relationship he has with the black man. We empower him by the nature of our own behavior and attitudes as a people. He cannot be, as I said earlier, what he is unless we are what we are. All right. I'm telling you. <laughs> to a good extent, to a good extent, the European is our creation. Mm. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. If we look at our behavior, we will see that to a good extent, it is our behavior, our values, our consciousness, the kind of personalities we've established in ourselves, our tastes, our desires and needs that maintains the European in this position. We talk about the civil rights movement and the apartheid system of the South. When blacks decided just to get out of the buses and walk, the system changed. Right. Yeah. When they just stopped sitting behind the white driver, just changing that relationship right. changed the nature of power right. in that system. When they decided then to walk side by side, when they decided to walk abreast and line themselves up, because they had not walked that way before, for the, the ends before, the relationship changed. When they kept their monies in their pockets, when they sat on those stools and blocked the other people from them, and changed the nature of the interaction between themselves and Europeans, the nature of the system changed. So therefore, we have tremendous power. It depends upon how we align ourselves as a people and how we decide to relate to other people in the world because they cannot have what they have unless we are who we are. And that is why we don't have to spend a great deal of time always appealing to them and analyzing them because we can better appeal to our own sense of self and our own consciousness 
and we waste a lot of time trying to transform them when through transforming ourselves, they will be transformed automatically. <laughs> the power is in our hands. We are not destined to be the servants of white folk. That is not the destiny of black folk. No way. And we, and we have to change this idea because many of us are still operating on that concept. As I said this morning, many of us go to these schools to become what? Qualified. To work for whom? For them. Why do we assume that they're going to have the jobs for us? Yes. These people are having difficulty making jobs for themselves. The greatest problems that the Europeans are facing today and the European economies are facing today is that they are not generating enough jobs for their own people. And even though America is bragging about the millions of jobs it's creating, those jobs are part-time jobs. The bulk of them are part-time jobs, low-wage jobs, and jobs that have little or no future. So when people talk about creating jobs, you got to ask what kind of jobs are being created. That is why, of course, this system is not investing in black education. It no longer needs black people to maintain its employment structure. You see it bringing in people from outside of the nation to be employed. You see, it even is hiring in the world itself, in other nations and other places. Already, it has reached the point where its need for black males is pretty much saturated. And it literally then is warehousing us in the jails and prisons and provoking us to kill each other and to destroy each other out here in these streets. And yet, we are still organizing the education of our children as if the white man still has jobs waiting for them in multitudes. How different our education would be if we sent our children to school to create jobs for themselves. <laughs> to create their own economic and political systems. To see themselves as the major sources of their employment. As I remarked earlier today while we were in the radio station, I heard something about some people out here uh, protesting for jobs and uh, pushing these other people for jobs. And I asked the question, do we know how many jobs we really create for other people? Right. We are a job creating people. We don't realize it because we don't think in terms of nation. You see, if we saw ourselves as a nation, we could see that we create jobs like any other nation. All right. I mentioned that today. How many jobs are created by black music? All right. Yeah, look at the whole structure of the music industry. From promoters to, to manufacturers of the records and the tapes and what have you, to the whole entertainment field, to the sellers of, of music in the stores, you know what we say, the Tower Records and the other uh, great uh, sellers of records and music and so forth, advertising that uses our music and all these things. How many thousands of jobs are we creating as people? We're creating them, but they have them. You see? We sing the music, they sell it. We sing the music, they market it. We sing the music, they promote it, you see. We sing the music, they produce great uh, conglomerates like Sony, CBS Music, creating all kinds of jobs. We're creating tremendous jobs for a lot of people. How many jobs do we create just buying from Koreans? Buying from other ethnic groups out here. How many people are we creating employment for in terms of our spending habits? as a people and our consumption habits 
as a people. How many jobs are we creating going to jail? We're creating all kinds of jobs and wealth. And we must come to understand this. We are creating these jobs, and yet we are begging for jobs. This means that in somewhere our consciousness has been impaired. We are begging for what we are making already. And we cannot use our own creations as a source of our own wealth. I told you earlier today that the Creator could not have intended for us as African people to be a poor people if the Creator implanted in our soils all the wealth all right. that was planted there. All right. We talk about the minerals and the oil and the gold and the this and the that that's implanted in African soil, so it seems as if the Creator blessed us from the very beginning with wealth and possibility. Therefore, for us to be going hungry over this wealth and to be starving in the midst of it and to be perceived as a dependent, indebted people while our wealth is being shipped out to other people, we are actually selling a lot of it for pennies and nickels and dimes and less means that there is something wrong with our consciousness. Because ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, we've said what? That the wealth of a people is ultimately not in their land. But where is it? It's in the mind. All right. The wealth of man is in his mind, All right. in his consciousness. You gotta look at it. And we mentioned the example of Japan no mineral wealth to speak of whatsoever. Nothing at all. A nation, by the way, which is totally dependent. Of course, we get, them, we get things backwards, don't we? We see ourselves as depending on Europeans when the reality is the other way around. When they depend on us and our souls and our people. We have to be backwards in order for this situation to be the way it is. Our reality has to be turned backwards, and we have to live in an almost permanent state of deception in order to be used the way we are used. The Japanese must depend on others for their vital resources, their oil, their timber, all of these things that they use to create their technology and so forth is taken from the soils of other people and then sold back to them. And yet they are seen as rich and powerful. And the people whose wealth they take or buy are seen as poor and poverty stricken. Ultimately then, you cannot rob or take from wealth from a what? Poor people. You cannot get wealth from a poverty stricken people. People who have nothing, you can get nothing from. So if you're getting all your diamonds and your gold and your magnesium and all this other stuff, then from African people, then African people must be what? Wealthy and rich. And therefore, if African people are poverty stricken with this material wealth, then it must be because our consciousness as a people is impoverished. And we are suffering then an impoverishment of our mentality. As we said before, if you have a good mind, you can con another joker out of his land. You can con him out of his diamonds and his gold. And this is what the other people have done. They have used their mind and their cleverness and taken from us what they did not have originally. And therefore, consciousness is not an abstract concept. It is not a theoretical concept. It is a concept that is directly related to the reality one lives in and to the reality that one experiences. It is directly related to the type of life that one will live 
and does live. So I'm going to look at this for a minute, particularly the consciousness of Africans in America. I'm often somewhat amused and taken aback by the number of people in this society who claim that slavery occurred somewhere back there. That, and you got some so-called black conservatives who claim that slavery no longer influences the nature of African people. I wonder what those people have to conserve in the first place. Are they conserving power? They conserving wealth? What does a black conservative conserve? You know, you have to conserve something. And since they have very little, if anything, they must only be conserving the system that has created their poverty to begin with. And you see them ultimately justifying the poverty of African people and justifying the political and social and economic subordination of African people in the name of some kind of higher principles. So slavery is not supposed, the experience of slavery is not supposed to be operating in the mentality of black folk. And you hear a lot of our youngsters will say that as well. How do you talk about slavery? That was back there. Or you know, whites talk about it. Well, you know, that was back there. We don't have anything to do with that anymore. You see? And it's an amazing situation because you have to remind them that you're still a living off the interest of the wealth that your forefathers earned from slavery. You are still enjoying the accumulated wealth that began with the enslavement of our people. And if you're, you're going to enjoy the wealth that was generated by evil, then you must take the curse that comes along with it. And therefore, even though you personally had nothing to do with it, but because you have received stolen goods, you must pay the price as well. And because you fight and struggle to protect those stolen goods, and you defend them, and you organize your society and your relationship to my people to maintain them and to continue to enhance them, then you must pay the price. That's why you live in terror. That's why you are stabbed in these streets. That's why you're going to suffer, no matter how good you are. No matter how liberal you are. Mm -mm. Ladies and gentlemen, when we behave as adults, we must recognize that our behavior will be visited upon our children. And that our children pay for our misbehavior. As we say, an act does not end at the point of its occurrence. Right. It continues to reverberate into the future right. and down across the generations. Right. And that's why when you behave in a particular way, you have to think in terms of seven generations from your behavior as to how what you're going to do is going to affect those generations later on. And even though those children may appear to be so-called innocent, they will still pay the price of your own misbehavior. This country whose parents and whose adults have misspent its treasure, and, uh, and while they have enjoyed that treasure, ultimately their children will have to pay the taxes or will have to pay the price. So we have a bunch of people out here who think they can rape and rob the world and think that they could have enslaved the world and, and think then that they are going to sleep well at night. It doesn't work that way. So we have some of our people here who think then that slavery was back then and had nothing to do. and had nothing to do with them. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we've never escaped slavery. We still share the slave consciousness of our great-great-grandparents. We are of the same mind to a great extent that they were. We have not advanced beyond these people. How can I say that? I generally ask a series of questions. You say that you, that slavery has nothing to do with you and slavery was back there. And I ask you the question then, what language do you speak? Mm -hmm. When did you learn that language? Was that the language African people were speaking when we were taken into slavery right. in America? Right. In other words, the language we speak, the language we speak at this moment is what? A slave language. All right. All right. The language that our slave ancestors were forced to learn. All right. And we still speak it and you can still hear the pigeon, the Creole, and the other kinds of stuff right. in our language right at this moment that they had to go through. That language with its words defined by history and by an experience is the language we use today to guide our behavior. It's the language we use today to talk to ourselves. It's the language we use today to learn about ourselves and to learn about the world. Is the language today we use to try to understand ourselves. Is there no wonder then that we are still confused? So we have not escaped slavery because we are still using a slave language and we speak the language of slaves. What kind of food do you eat? You say soul food? Was that the food of African people? Slave food. The food that we find most satisfying, the food that we find that sticks to our ribs, the food that we call down home, a food that we learn to eat in the quarters. And yet we dare say that we have escaped slavery, that we have nothing to do with those people back there, that that was back there. When our whole very social life and social relationships our very definition of ourselves as a people, our very attempt to commune with ourselves is mediated by the food of slaves. Understand what I'm trying to get at? And how can you say that you exist in a different consciousness from another people? What kind of uniforms are we wearing? Huh? What kind of clothes are we wearing? Were these the clothes of African people? All right. Huh? All right. This is what we got to look at. All right. Yes. What is this to say then that we've escaped slavery? All right. What kind of names do we respond to? Right. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. Tamikas and all these other things we got going out here. All right. What kind of names do we identify with? Why is it that African names sound strange to us now as a people? And yet we dare say that we have a different consciousness from our great slave grandparents. How can we say that? We are still of the same consciousness. And we are still in the same position because we are still servants of the white man. And our reason for being in America is to serve white folk and to generate wealth for them. And there has been no change at all in terms of our relationship to these people. The values that we pursue are slave values and the values of servants. The social relations that we create and interact with were built and developed
during the periods of slavery. We have not escaped it at all. But it is time for us to change the slave consciousness, all right. this consciousness of servitude that is still too much with us today. And ultimately, we ask the question that's closest to home for a lot of people. When we claim that we've escaped slavery, and the slavery was something back there, which had nothing to do with us today. And then I ask you the question, what kind of God do you worship? What's the name of it? Who taught you to praise him? Was this the God you were praying to before you were brought to these shores? Was this the religion you had before you were brought to these shores? Can you name one African God? How can you then, who define yourself, the very essence of yourself and the very essence of your soul and organize the very nature of your life here on earth, based on a God handed to us by our slave masters, claim that you have no slave consciousness and are not related to slavery. In other words then, ladies and gentlemen, we are not Africans. We are possessed by spirits and demons. We have let another people's spirit take possession of our bodies and take possession of our minds. When we speak, it is not with our African voice. It is with the voice of that demonic presence that uses our lips to speak its own language. Yes. Yes, and we have to recognize this. We are possessed. And if we are to transform ourselves and to transform that the nature of our relationship with those who are our masters, we must engage in an exorcism and clear the devils out of our minds. And at this time, then, it'll pay you to, to read a little bit about demonic possession. And you have to be demonically, we have to be demonically possessed. Because if we talk about black on black violence, right. self-defeating behavior, self-destructive behavior, then we could not be possessed by a beautiful and wonderful God. Right. We must be possessed by a demon. Right. It's interesting to look at the literature on possession we have uh, several, uh, a couple of types of possession. One is called a somnambulistic possession. Somnambulistic. Soma, in this instance, having to do with uh, sleep. You hear it in the word somnex. You know, ambulistic to move around, ambulatory. Right. So we are talking about people who are what? Sleepwalking. Not a, you know, they're not awake, but they're walking around. The body is moving, and it is walking in an organized fashion and walking systematically, but the person is still asleep. And in somnambulistic uh, possession, then, the individual's original self has been repressed and displaced and the spirit, and he identifies with the spirit that possesses him. And his eye and the spirit's eye are one and the same. And we have a lot of that here today. Where the spirit that has been implanted in us, we have taken to be us. And we've identified with it. That is why in, in defending ourselves, we end up defending the people who rule over us. 
in defending our ego, we end up maintaining the social structure that has destroyed our ego to begin with. And you see it in our youngsters who will fight and kill in the name of respect and fight because their egotistic uh, orientation has been insulted. And therefore, in defending their ego, they do not kill the people who destroyed their ego. They kill each other. And maintain the ones who destroyed them in the first place in power. And that's why the subtitle of my book, Black on Black Violence, was Black Self-Annihilation in Service of White Domination. We are killing each other in order to maintain this system. We have let ourselves become possessed by a spirit such that when we become aggressive, we aggress against the self instead of those who are the source of our aggressive orientation. We talk a lot as a people about self-hatred. Self-hatred is a personality configuration. It is a form of personality organization. It is an orientation toward the world and toward oneself. Self-hatred then is the white man's greatest protection against being destroyed by the black man. <laughs> to a good extent, self-hatred is the white man's defense mechanism, is the white man's form of self-defense. How can we say that? To a great extent, one function of the personality is to direct energy, to direct aggression, to channel aggression and energy and wishes and impulses in particular directions, to organize feelings, to organize energy, to achieve certain ends. Those things that we hate, Often then, when we are angry or hostile, we aggress against them, don't we? We attack them often. We destroy them. Then we have a problem, don't we? If we attack the things we hate, if we attack the things toward which we hold hostility, when we are overly frustrated and when we are angry, then what happens if that thing we hate is ourselves? It means then, ladies and gentlemen, that when we become frustrated and angered as a people, when we are overwrought by feelings of hostility, and our self-hating personality seeks to channel that hostility and channel that aggression, it's going to channel the aggression right back on to the self. Because that's the thing we hate most. So consequently, black anger then becomes a conduit for black self-destruction, for black self-defeat. The object of our hostile, aggressive feelings becomes ourselves. And you can see then how the white man is protected by that personality structure, right? While he stokes our anger, while he stokes our hostility, while he stokes our frustration, and while we get mad and we want to strike out, when we decide to strike out and aggress, we strike out and aggress against the self. And by doing so, he is left untouched and unscathed. And therefore, our self-hatred becomes his principal means of defending himself and of maintaining himself. One of the things that frightened him most about the Ferguson case was that Ferguson's self-hatred mechanism broke down. Uh, 
unlike many deaf, dumb, and blind Negroes, he knew who his enemies were. And so when he got angry and hostile, instead of going out to drink himself to death, instead of going out to smoke crack and destroy himself, instead of going out to killing someone who looked like himself, instead of going out to commit suicide and put himself in a place to be destroyed by somebody else, he went directly to the source of his frustration. And this is what frightened those people. They were wondering how many more are there like that and are they increasing? <laughs> yes. So you can see why the seed of self-hatred is planted in the minds of the black man. We spend a lot of time about what it does to us, but we got to look at it because I've told you before, every maladaptive characteristic in the black psyche is there for white folk. And it's not purely there because they hate you, or they misunderstand you, or they don't know who you were, what you are. Uh, it has nothing to do with all of that. I tell people when you analyze the so-called aberrations in the black personality, you must always ask the question, what are their social functions and roles? Who benefits from this aberration in the black man's mind? What are the social and political and economic benefits, and for whom? Who gains from this particular orientation in our minds? And then you begin to see why it's there and what its function is. And so every complaint we have about ourselves has a political, economic, and social intent beneficial to white folk and detrimental to ourselves. And that means then, somewhere along the way, we became possessed by these orientations. And they were implanted in our personalities. We have come to identify with them as our natural selves, as our natural orientations. We have assumed that they represent who we are. And we have now then found many ingenious ways to defend the demons that possess us. And ultimately then, those demons destroy us and have us destroy others like ourselves. There's another form of possession we call lucid uh, possession. In this sense, the person at least has a sense of self and they have the sense that there's another spirit in them and they struggle with that spirit, sometimes losing the battle every now and then. They become obsessed with their struggle, with the spirit, and in a sense then are disenabled by that struggle. So some of us are in that state. We're not quite satisfied with the identity we have. We know somehow that there's a deeper African self in us. We also aware that there's a Eurocentrically implanted demon in us and we wrestle with it daily. There's another type of possession we talk about here and that's spontaneous. What has sort of occurred spontaneously against our will. This is in contrast to one we, we, we uh, talk about as artificial one deliberately created. What do we mean by that? When we go into a particular social setting, such as a church or such as a rock concert or the like, and we go through a set of rituals and behavior, we go there and go through these behaviors and rituals and songs and dance as a mean of deliberately being possessed by what? The spirit and having our bodies taken over 
and being possessed. And then we say, we feel what? The spirit. We feel the spirit living within us. And so consequently, much of our life is about provoking through artificial means spirits which take over us and assume control of our behavior. Latent possession means when we are possessed and we don't even know that we are possessed. And I think that defines a lot of us. We're not even aware, and those are the hardest ones to break through because they don't sense any kind of split within the personality. They and their possessing spirit are one and the same. And when you try to exorcise their possessive spirit, they feel as if you are attacking them personally. And in defending their person, they defend the spirit that possesses them. Let's be a little more concrete, and I want to just give you an example of what I mean by this. You know, and in the literature, we talk about these spirits as what we call the incubi and the succubi. The spirit that lies in the body or lies on the body, the incubus, and the one that lies under the spirit, the succubus. When we talk about this spirit, though, that possesses us. When we talk about this spirit that the European implanted in us in terms of the language, in terms of the food, in terms of the religion, in terms of the values, in terms of the social relations, in terms of the name, we are talking about a spirit that's just not a spookish uh, entity in ourselves. It actually incarnates in us. What do we talk when we talk about incarnate? We're talking that we, we are dealing with the Latin root carnes, which has to do with what? Meat, flesh. In other words, the spirit comes to dwell in our very flesh and comes to sculpt our very bodies. And therefore, the spirit is a physical thing as much as it is a psychological thing. The bodies that we have tonight, ladies and gentlemen, are bodies that have been created by the European experience mm. and are not our natural bodies as African people. Just as the surface of our bodies reflect the influence of another people, the very internal nature and the physiology of our bodies reflect those people as well. That's why when you get rid of them, you're going to have a healing experience. And your whole body will change. I've read some of this before, but let me read it again, I think, in this context. This is most dramatic, and the things I'm talking about are most dramatic when we study the so-called multiple personality. And let me read you a description here that was printed in the Times. And those who might be familiar with it, indulge me here, because I think it, it points out to something. It begins, when Timmy drinks orange juice, he has no problem. But Timmy's just one of close to a dozen personalities who alternate control over a patient with multiple personality disorder. And if those other personalities drink orange juice, the result is a case of hives. What are we saying here? We got one body, but depending on what consciousness possesses that body, that body will react to the drinking of orange juice with or without hives. It will break out in blisters. So if it drinks orange juice, when one of the other personalities is possessing it, welts and hives will break out right there. If Timmy comes back, if the new consciousness comes back and takes over that body, the hives will disappear almost on the moment. In other words, then, there's a different body for a different consciousness. It goes on to say, then, that medical disorders are found to differ 
from one sub-personality to another. In other words, even though these so-called personalities possess the same so-called body, each personality has a different order of illnesses associated with it. Each personality is vulnerable to a particular type of ailment, one way or the other. So what are we talking about? We are saying that each consciousness, which is represented by each personality, creates its own body, creates its own physiology, and thereby creates its own vulnerability to various ailments and so forth. You see, you get people in medical school who try to teach you that disease only occurs as a result of some kind of viral syndrome or some kind of entry into the body of some bacteria or other thing. And certainly, that is a part of it. And certainly, there's reality there. But the body must interact with the viruses and must interact with the disease entity. And this is what we talk about when we talk about the immune system, that health is not necessarily the absence of the disease, but the capacity of the body to resist the disease, to stand up against the disease. And so consequently then, when these bodies are taken over by different personalities, these personalities apparently change the nature of the immune system of those bodies, making them vulnerable to diseases when one, when one personality is present and not so when another is present. Which means, ladies and gentlemen, then, that the nature of the consciousness which possesses us as persons will to a degree determine the illnesses to which we are vulnerable as, as a person and as people. And a lot of the illnesses, physical and other diseases that we suffer then, are mediated by the nature of the consciousness that we've permitted to possess us as a people. So to a great extent, the defeat of disease, the maintaining of health, must not only be pursued in terms of discovering new drugs and these kinds of things, but must involve self-discovery and self-knowledge. It goes on to state that in people with multiple personalities, there is a strong psychological separation between each sub-personality. Each will have his own name and age. Does that strike the bell? What did we say earlier? To what names do we respond? Are they the same names to which we responded prior to slavery? Do, so in other words, as we got the new slave personality, we got what? New names. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and we were changed. To a good extent, our names were given us to designate our new consciousness and our new situation. Each will have his own name and age, and often some specific memories and abilities. In other words, each personality has its own history, has its own biography, has its own memory. And you look at Negroes when they have a certain consciousness and look at the history they remember. Look at the things that they keep in their memories and look at the histories they study and identify with. Look at them fight African history. All right. Yes. Look at them want to identify with the history of Europeans. Look at them wanting to define themselves in terms of that history. And look at them having memories only for that history. Look at those Africans who are still under the possessive influence of the European and planted spirit and know that they have little or no knowledge of African history and therefore little or no knowledge of their own history as a person and an individual. So there's a consistency between the consciousness and the history 
that a person has and the memory that an individual has. They often have, they are frequently, for example, personalities differ in handwriting, artistic talent, or even in knowledge of foreign languages. Speak a different language, depending on the personality that's in there. Multiple personalities typically develop in people who were severely and repeatedly abused as children, apparently as a means to protect themselves against the pain of abuse. Does that strike another note in you? Often only one or two of the subpersonalities will be conscious of the abuse, while the others would have no memory or experience of the pain. To a great extent, the personality of the African American today has been shaped by our desires to escape the memory of the slave experience, to deny its existence. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to come in terms with it. We don't want to re-experience it psychologically. We don't want to know about it. And therefore, our lives become defined by eternal escape and avoidance of reality and of history and of a knowledge of who we are and how we came to be, who and what we are. And consequently, we cannot act upon the reality of our history and we guide our behavior and define ourselves in terms of a fantasy as history and a misinterpretation of reality. This is what it is. Yes. How did we get this religion we talked about earlier? I talk about Star Trek. And we talk about the what? The time war that Star Trek depicts quite frequently. Of how people move from one state of consciousness and one world and are suddenly flipped into a new world. They go through a warp and suddenly, all of a sudden, everything that they used to use to guide themselves no longer counts. The language that they used to speak can no longer be understood in the new world. The values that they used to guide their behavior are no longer uh, workable. In fact, it gets them into trouble. The gods, the culture, the nature of the social relations, and all of the things that they used prior to meeting the walk no longer suffice. Now they must learn new values and new behaviors and new orientations in order to adapt themselves to the new universe that they live in. We are in that kind of position today. Think about the African in the world the African lived in prior to being brought across the oceans. Think about the gods we praised. Think about the organization of our society. Think about the languages that we spoke, the food that we ate, the dress that we wore, the music, the song, the dance, and all of those things that defined us as African people. And think how horrendous it must have been for us to be thrown into this world where there was a whole new language, a whole new social hi uh, uh, hierarchy, a whole new set of authorities, people pushing you around who you don't understand, people who are putting strange tools in your hands, people who are trying to get you to relate to them and to relate to each other in a very different kind of way from what you're used to relating to. Think about the stress and the confusion and think about the abuse. Think about the horror of that situation our parents and great-grandparents were put in. And there was somebody that said then, if you pray to this God, if you talk this way, if you dress this way, if you relate this way, you'll get a greater sense of security. Your anxiety will be reduced. You will feel good. And you'll be able to withstand the pain of your existence. And the God then that I'm going to hand you is one that I have created for you. And a theology that comes with it is one that I have created so that you will continue to serve me as you continue to serve it. And we come to believe in the veracity of that God and that religion. Why? Because we feel so secure when we follow it. And we feel so relieved when we follow it. And yet we wonder why, despite all of our prayers, despite all 
of our devotion, we still suffer the way we do. I often ask the question, why is it that the people who prayed the most have the most of their children in the jails of America today? Who shout and kick over the benches and so forth, are filling up the prisons and have the children killing each other and addicted out here in these streets. There must be a problem here, ladies and gentlemen. We must reorient ourselves to our religion. We must reorient ourselves to our gods because apparently we, are not, we, are not, we don't have the appropriate orientation because as that book you read says, you can tell a tree by what? The fruit it bears. And therefore, if it bears bitter fruit, or if it bears no fruit at all, the God you worship says it is but fit to be hewn down and thrown into the flame and consumed. Read your own Bible. It gives you a very practical measure as to whether the religion you're pursuing is an appropriate one. And that measure says, look at the fruit that it bears. And if then the kind of religion and the God you're pursuing ends up having your sons in the jails of America and ends up maintaining African people in slavery and servitude in their own lands and everywhere, then something is wrong in terms of how we relate to that religion and that God because the outcome is wrong and the outcome is destructive. And it's because we don't want to confront the abuse that we went through and deal with. You see, when you go through that time warp, the only way you can ultimately come to understand the new world is to understand what happened when you went through that warp. That transformed what? The personality. That made the personality what it was. And I find that interesting when further over, when I read here, of what happens when the personality moves from one personality to another, when the body is possessed by one personality and, and that personality is displaced and another one comes in. It says, during the switch, there is typically a period of seconds or even minutes when heart rate, uh, breath rate, and other physio, uh, physiological markers show a disorganization that is followed by a new pattern typical of the personality that is emerging. In other words, then, we go through a period of disorganization of, and stress, and then the personality is reorganized to fit into the new circumstances. We can't continue to pursue this, but it's interesting to look at the changes in blood pressure that each personality brings about the other kinds of changes, uh, physical changes that are representative of the personality. So what are we saying here then? That each personality has its own name, its own history, its own memory, biography, way of speaking, language, way of thinking, way of perceiving itself, its own vulnerabilities. Each personality generates its own life space and generates its own types of social relations. Each personality has its own tastes and appetites and its own morality. So to a great extent then, if we look at the problems and issues that confront us today as African people and see those issues in terms of the consciousness, we would recognize that we must rid ourselves of the consciousness that has been implanted in us by our European masters. One other thing I want to bring about in this situation we notice that if you engage people in behavior therapy and you scan their brains and look at how their brains metabolize energy, there's a relationship between the areas of the brain that are rapidly using energy and the type of mental activity a person is undergoing and the type of uh, physical behavioral activity the person is undergoing. Each personality, each type of orientation 
has a blueprint in the brain in terms of the various areas of the brain that are functionally relating one to the other. And it's interesting to note, for instance, if we look at something called the uh, obsessive compulsive personality, the person who cannot stop uh, repeating a particular behavior, no matter how ir irrational it may be, the person who must wash their hands every 30 minutes, even if they are not dirty, but who are compelled to the point that they wash their hands to the point of rawness because they cannot stop is this kind of person. The person who is absorbed by a particular type of image, by a particular kind of thought or orientation that they cannot get out of their minds. This is what we were talking about. We were talking about the obsessive compulsive personality, a rigid, repetitive personality. We note then, if you scan the brains of these personalities, that certain areas in their brain are intensely active. For instance, we talk about their frontal lobes, the so-called orbital lobe of the brain, the orbital cortex of the brain, the part of the cortex that is above the eyes, the part of the cortex that concerns itself with intentionality and purpose and direction and motivation and the connection of that cortex to the, to the lower brain, to the what we call the chordate nucleus, that part of the lower brain that deals with repetitive behavior, that deals with monitoring, that deals with modulating behavior, that deals with, in its connection with the hypothalamus and with the thalamus, with senses, with the distribution of the senses and with organizing the senses. When we look then at the compulsive personality, we notice that these areas are intensely active and active in a way that they maintain the symptoms of that personality. It has been shown then that when these people take a drug such as Prozac, the intensity of the, and they, they respond to them in a way that their, that their symptoms are relieved, the intensity of the interaction between these three brain areas is uh, decreased or delinked. It has also been noted then that you can put these same types of people through behavior therapy. That is by changing the nature of the social relationship between the therapist and the patient, changing the nature of the rewards and punishments that the patient undergoes in an effort to change the patient's behavior, by changing the way the patient thinks about what is in their mind, thinks about the problems that they're in. And when you had, can successfully then reduce the symptoms of the compulsive uh, disorder through this social conditioning, we note too the same kinds of physiological brain changes that occurs with the intake of the drug occurs with the intake of social training. Now what are we saying then? That the, yes that too, but what we're saying ultimately then is that the nature of the consciousness and the nature of the experience of the individual physically transforms the brain and physically transforms the way the brain operates. And therefore, when we talk about consciousness, we're talking about something that is real. We're talking about something that transforms both the psyche and the body. One of the things that you note when the individual is possessed, that the facial muscles change and that the body itself changes in a way that it literally incarnates and represents the nature of the spirit that, contain, that, it, that uh, is possessing the individual. So to a good extent, if you're in certain religions, you can tell what particular spirit is possessing the person by the very nature of the behavior that the individual is exhibiting and the very shape of their very physiological uh, body and their face. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, once we get the spirits of these demons that the Europeans have implanted in our bodies, our faces and our bodies themselves will be transformed. To a great extent then, a lot of the way we look and a lot of the way we have organized ourselves physically is a result of the type of consciousness that we have. To a great extent, and I will begin to wrap it up here, to a great extent, the kind of consciousness that inhabits us reflects the kind of culture
that we live in, the nature of the culture that we are a part of. Recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that culture cannot exist outside of our minds and of our bodies. Culture does not exist out there. History does not exist out there. History and culture can only exist in the minds and bodies of people. If there were no people in the world, there would be no history in the world, no culture in the world. Culture does not stand outside and direct us. It is where? Inside of us. And it directs us from the inside. Culture is instilled in our bodies and in our minds. And we have to keep that in mind because sometimes we tend to see it as something separate from ourselves. Culture indwells in us and it inhabits our bodies. Our history dwells in us and it inhabits our bodies. We reflect our history and, the, and we reproduce our history when that history becomes a part of us and is one with us. We tend to see culture in terms of music, in terms of the kind of dance we have, in terms of the songs we sing. And that is a part of culture. But ultimately, culture is deeper than that. Culture is a way of thinking. Ultimately, culture is a conspiracy. That is, it is a means by which a group of people organize the way they think, organize the way they believe, organize the way they see the world, so as to create a consciousness by which they can cooperate in achieving certain ends so that they can mutually aid each other and gain ends that they cannot gain as separate individuals. So culture is an instrument of power. The individual through culture extends his power and the culture extends the power of the group. When we talk about music and song and dance, what we are talking about here then is how culture ultimately comes to be implanted in our bodies. You see, we tend to look at, at song and dance and music as entertainment. And this is our serious mistake. We have a lot of our youth out there looking at music as mere entertainment. When we say that we are being enculturated, enculturated, it means that a spirit is being implanted in us by the culture. It means our group is instilling in our bodies and in our minds a possessing spirit such that when our culture calls our name, we respond to it. When our culture is, is in need of defense and support, we then defend it and support it because we are at one with it. In other words, why does the black man respond to the white man? Why does the black man serve the white man? Why does everything the black man do benefit the white man? Why does the black man say freedom is doing what I want to do? And why is it that everything he wants to do enriches the European? Why is it that our youth say that they are being free and that they're doing what they want to do and they're expressing themselves and it involves buying a hundred dollar pair of sneakers from white folk? Yes. Yes. All of this kind of stuff. Why? Because the spirit that is implanted in the human mind and in the human psyche 
is there to only respond to its creator and to its master. And therefore, when you let another people generate a spirit in you, when you let another people generate certain values in you, when you let another people generate a certain look, in, uh, generate a certain reality for you, when you let another people let you see yourself in a particular sort of way and see your own people in a particular sort of way, they have implanted a spirit and that spirit has been created by them and that spirit only responds to them. And it only responds to them in terms of furthering their interest and working against the interests of the body it possesses. And this is why there's that self-destructive spirit in us. Because the demon that possesses a body is not there for that body. It is there for the creator that placed it there. And if necessary to obey its creator, it destroys that body. It will destroy the body it inhabits. The taste that that spirit has will be taste that can only be satisfied by buying from its master creator. The values that that spirit wishes to, to satisfy and realize can only be realized by going through the ages of the master that created it. That is why every value and every taste and every desire and every need that provokes us, every one of these things that we seek to desire ends up having us going through white folk. And that's why we think we need them. And every time we satisfy them, they in some way benefit in our seeking satisfaction because of the demon that we call ourselves is answering to the call of, uh, of its master. So a culture creates its own possessing spirits and enculturates and inculcates those spirits into the bodies of its members so that those members in defending their own egos, in defending their own interests, in defending what they perceive as their own needs, in satisfying their own taste, in satisfying their own values, satisfy the needs of the culture, enrich the culture, empower the culture, defend the culture, advance the interests of the culture. And how then does the culture implant its spirit into its members? It does it in a very strong and primordial way. It uses vehicles. And one of the major vehicles that's used is music, rhythm, song, dance. A culture involves people moving what? Together, in tandem, in rhythm. It involves them having the same temporal sense, the same kind of time clock, so that they can move in synchrony one with the other. And music is about synchrony. Poetry is about synchrony. Song is about synchrony. Music is about symbols. And you see, ultimately, it is through symbols that you evoke behavior from people. So when a culture creates symbols, those symbols are designed to evoke particular types of reactions and feelings and moods in its members. And a culture establishes the potency of those symbols through ritual, through song, and through dance. And one of the best ways then to inculcate cultural values, a cultural spirit, is through entertainment. Is while the members are being entertained, while they are feeling good, the song is carrying the cultural values into the mind and into the body. The lyrics that represent the cultural interests, the lyrics that represent cultural values are being carried on the vehicle of the music, carried through the vehicle of the poetry, 
the togetherness, the cooperativeness, the mutual movement together and the synchrony of the culture is being entrained through the music and through the rhythm of the dance. Therefore, you see, when you let another over your music, when you let another people take over your dance and attach their content to it, they will use your own music and your own dance and your own rap lyrics and your own poetry and your own cultural symbols to carry their message into your body and into your mind such that you can only respond then to their beck and call and to their wishes. And you see then, yes, you see then that they get you to buy those sneakers and they get you to buy all of those things by what? Associating them with your what? Your music, with your cultural symbols, you see, with your poetry, with your rhythms. And so they attach their content to our rhythm, their content to our song. Yes. But in a way, they take our own instruments and turn them against the self. Notice how quickly, when one of our youngsters was rhyming to kill the police, the con that kind of content was washed right out immediately. Yes. But what wash out occurs when they sing about shooting each other with their glocks and the other things? When their contents of self-destructiveness ride on the rhythm of their song and of their dance. And when the symbols are loaded then with self-destructive elements and content. So what are we saying here then? That enculturation is the process of building in responsivity and ultimately responsibility. The ability to respond to a particular call. And we then have appropriately enculturated ourselves when we can respond to our own culture and to our own values and to our own needs. One other thing here then, as we rapidly bring these things to a close, we have to look at personality in this light as well. We think our personality is ours. You must recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that the human being is a social animal. We exist in society. We exist in groups. We are born dependent, not independent. We have long periods of dependency. And it is the social relationship between ourselves and our mothers and ourselves and our group that protects us during our long periods of dependency. And in a sense, we never quite get over our dependency and need for one another. And so consequently, we are social animals and we must then respond to social situations. Our personalities, because they may be our personality, does not mean that they are not inculcated with a social spirit, and they're not designed for a social end. In other words, the individual exists for the social unit, not for himself. We see individuality as something that, that, that is just for ourselves. Why are we individuals? We're individuals to a great extent because when our culture and our group confronts problems, we want to maximize the possibility that we will solve those problems by the fact that different individuals look at those problems in different ways and they can contribute their particular perspective to the group and those perspectives can be used as a means for solving the problem for the group. So even individuals are there to strengthen the group. You see, if all the people in the society thought just alike and saw the world just alike, they thought no differently one from the other, the society would be soon defeated because it would be uncreative. It would, be un, it would not be innovative. 
it would not be able to change its perspective of a problem in a way so that it can solve it. So what does it do then? It creates individuals. It's like the reasons why we have genetic variations. We say no matter how uh, intense a plague may be in a nation or a people, there are always one or two people left standing. Because in some way or another, their genetic uh, structure has permitted them to withstand the plague. And as long as we got a few of those survivors left, and as long as they can reproduce, the race continues and goes on. But if the race had all exactly the same genetic structure, then a plague would wipe out the total race and the species would cease to exist. And the same thing then operates in terms of differences in personalities. We differ in personality ultimately because these differences contribute to the survival of the species. And therefore our differences adhere to maintain the whole. So the main problem of a society is to maintain enough cohesion so people can act together and behave together and act in synchrony one with the other and cooperate with each other, but not be too overly organized so that they cannot bring their own creative perspectives to problems and issues. You see, and this becomes the problem of society. So there must always be that tension between uh, being in the society and obeying its rules, but being a little bit off so that we can say, hey, maybe if you look at it this way, we can work it out and we can deal with it this way. So the personality itself must carry the element of society within itself. But the thing we must note, that personality, consciousness, and culture are cultural creations. And the type of culture that people exhibit and the type of consciousness we exhibit and the type of personality we exhibit reflects the type of history and experience we've undergone as people. When you let another people then be the determiner of your history and experience, they then become the determiners of your consciousness, of your personality, and of your culture. Ultimately, we must recognize that we use consciousness to deal with the world. Culture is an adaptative tool. It's an instrument by which we deal with reality, by which we adapt to reality, and by which we adapt reality to ourselves. The kind of consciousness we have will determine how we deal with reality. Consciousness then will, in the fact that it determines how we are going to deal with reality, how we change reality, then is a power. Because ultimately, power is about enabling something to take place. The ability to do something. The ability to change something. The ability to adapt. The ability to defend oneself. The ability to change oneself in order to solve a problem. This is what culture is about. Culture is not static. Culture is not stuck in one place. Culture itself must reconstruct itself if the system in which it exists is reconstructed and rearranged. That is why some of us get in trouble because we want to find an African culture stuck somewhere back in the 13th century and want to apply it to ourselves at this point in a different context. African culture is not a culture stuck in place and time. African culture is constantly changing and evolving because the context in which African people live changes and evolves. What makes it African culture is that it operates in the interest of African people. It is designed to advance African people and therefore the consciousness must be measured in terms of the degree to which it maintains our survival and advances our interests and puts us at the center of our concerns and at the center of our purposes. When then we talk about black culture, make sure we're not talking about a reactionary culture, a culture that has been generated 
by our reaction to our abuse by white folk and to our control and domination of white folk. Because it's a good part of what we call black culture that we need to exorcise from our psyches so that we can evolve a, a culture and an African-centered culture to advance our interests as a people. Another very important aspect then of consciousness is what we call values. Those things that we prefer, those things that we see as right, those things that we think we should, we should need, those things the pursuit of which determines our behavior, organizes our minds. Con uh, values are what I call di the directional factors of consciousness. What are we talking about here? When you value something, and that value is implanted in your brain, the brain calls forth all of its resources, all of the contents that it has, the knowledge it has available to it, the behavioral skills it has available to it, the cognitive skills, the thinking skills, and things like that that it has available to it, and organizes those things and relates those things one to each other in such a way that the value can be achieved. When we then think about something that we value and we want to realize something that we value, we consciously or unconsciously assess our minds and say, do I have the relevant knowledge? Do I have the relevant skills? Do I have the relevant thinking and cognitive skills? so that we can organize these knowledge and skills in a way that we can achieve those values? If we believe we have those skills, if we believe we have the content, if we appropriately organize those contents through thought, then we pursue those values. And chances are we may realize those values. If though we have those values and we assess ourselves, we recognize that we don't have the appropriate skills, we don't have the appropriate knowledge and content, we don't have the appropriate thought styles and so forth, we then say, well, maybe we should develop the requisite skills. Maybe we should learn the requisite knowledge. Maybe we should develop the means of thinking. And once we do this, we will then organize them away in a way to achieve our values. Once we then have values and are guided by values, and those values guide those skills and contents and so forth, we are empowered to realize those values. And therefore, values are a type of power. Where am I going with this? I'm going with this to say this. If values are a type of power, if values are the things that guide our behavior, if culture is a type of power, and consciousness is a type of power, and personality is a type of power, if we let another people determine the nature of our consciousness, our personality, and our values, they then gain power over us. If consciousness, culture, personality, and values are instruments of power, they then use our consciousness, our values, our culture as their instruments of power. How does this work out in reality? They take our cultural products, our music, our song, and use them as their instruments of power. Yes, and benefit from them. So then, what is an African-centered consciousness? An African-centered consciousness is one that is based on African-centered content, based on African-centered knowledge, based on African-centered values, based on an African-centered consciousness. To the degree that our consciousness is based on African-centered values and so forth, we are empowered as African people. To the degree those values and consciousness are determined by other people, we become their instruments of power, and they use us against ourselves. So consequently, if we are to be empowered, and if our power is to work in our interests, then our consciousness must be an African consciousness. Our values must be African values. Our personality must be an African-based personality.
If not, we may suffer. First, ethnocide and then genocide. What are we saying? It means that our culture will not be functional in a way that it protects our interests. We must then, as a people, develop a new African consciousness, a, an African-centered consciousness, and that means we must develop it based on an African history, African culture, and African values. Most of all, we must develop an African sense of nationhood. Mm. All right. yeah. To a great extent, many of the problems we suffer today is a result of the fact that we do not see ourselves as a nation. And yet, we complain about how we are segregated from everybody else. We complain about how we are not a part of the mainstream, how we are not a part of the economy, how we are shut out from the government and the political process. If we are not a part of these things, and yet these things are what defines a nation, then we are not a part of the American nation. That nation is a white nation. We are then, in effect, a de facto nation, but we are afraid to recognize it. If we looked at ourselves as a nation, we'd see many of the reasons why we are where we are as a people. Why? Because if we looked at ourselves as a nation, we would see why we have the problems we have. Why do we have some of the problems we have? For the same reason other African nations have the problems they have. Why? Because we permit our resources, human resources and material resources, to be used by another people. We export them. We, like any other African nation, are an indebted nation. We are over-indebted. When we talk about the African nation suffering from over, overburdened, uh, being overburdened by debt, we don't recognize that we're talking about ourselves. When I ask here tonight, how many of us owes another black institution, another black person major debt, we would get very few hands. But if I ask how many of us in this audience tonight owed a white person, a white institution, a non-African institution, great debt, we probably all had to raise our hands. If you recognize that then, and you add this up in terms of a nation, not if you, just to yourself as an individual, but if you look at all of us as individuals and in terms of a nation, you will recognize then that as a nation, we owe an enormous debt to other people. And one of the reasons why then we are poverty stricken is not because we don't have money, it's because all of our money is being used to service the debt that other nations own, that the white nation in America owns. And because we spend so much time paying our installment plans and paying our money out to these other nations of people, we cannot save our monies, we cannot accumulate our money and create wealth so that we can employ ourselves as a people, so that we can support our families as a people, so that we cannot build the schools we need to build to educate our children the way we need to educate them as a people. And consequently, we have the similar problems that all African nations have almost, where they cannot build highways or build schools or build hospitals or build institutions, communication systems and other systems because all of the wealth that they are generating is being exported out to European nations and other nations to whom they owe debt. But you can only see this when you look at yourself as a nation. And when you look at yourself as a nation, then you can see that you can change this problem by changing the debt relationship you have to other people. I was looking at an issue here the other day when we're talking about looking at African nations, and we talk about the African nations as monocultures, meaning that they often exist by shipping out one or two major products, cocoa or cocoa beans or, or uh, oil or gold or something like that. And they ship these products out into what we call a buyer's market. That is, the people they sell these products to set the prices that they're going to pay 
for these products. So that many of these nations now are being paid less for their products than they were paid 30 years ago. And yet the nations that buy their products and lower the prices on their products are selling them back those products in process form and selling them back their own products that have been manufactured here for higher and higher prices. And then we wonder why Africa is in debt and why Africa is impoverished. But that is the result of the fact that they are caught up in an impoverishing mechanism. But we need not talk about the continental African because we are in the same situation here today. African, the African American nation is a monoculture. What is the commodity that we sell? Labor. We're not selling much manufacturing. We're not selling much other products. The major commodity that we have to sell was the commodity that we were bought over here for in the first place. And what was that? Labor. And now we are selling our labor in a buyer's market, meaning that the people who buy our labor are buying it at the prices they set. And they keep devaluing the price that they're willing to pay for our labor. On top of devaluing the price, they are no longer even demanding the labor. So after a while, we won't be able to sell our labor at any price. And we will then be totally deprived as a people. And therefore, we are caught in a similar position. And just as there's social disorganization in our African nations, there's social disorganization in the American nation. You cannot have your wealth flowing out of your nation. You cannot enrich other people at the expense of yourself and not have social disorganization. And that means then, if we look at ourselves as a nation, the African-American nation must do what all African nations must do. We must capture our own internal resources. We must gain control of our own internal markets. We must trade within ourselves as a people and a group and generate wealth within our own nation as a means of counterbalancing our dependence upon Europeans and upon the white nation itself. But in order to do this, we must have a nation consciousness. We must now organize and relate to ourselves as a nation of people. When we look at our relationship, we say to the Koreans as a nation, we see the same relationship that Japan has to America as a nation. You notice that they are bargaining right now, negotiating, right? Japan is building up its resources. It is blocking out US industry from its nation, yet it is entering into the American markets and selling there and taking out the wealth of the American markets. If we look at our relationship to Koreans, to Dominicans, to other groups, we'll see the same relationship where those groups can enter into the African American nation, set up shop, ship out its wealth day by day and night by night, and yet the African American entrepreneurial nation is not permitted to set up shop in their midst is not permitted to carry wealth from their, from their nations. And they then grow fat on the surplus that they gain from the African American nation. This means then that if we think of ourselves as a nation, we must protect our internal markets from the intrusion of outsiders. We must not permit them entry into our nation. As I look and I see down the 125th streets, Yes, and look at our people locked outside there in the outside. And some people claim that they are protesting this kind of thing. I agree with our vendors there that if black men and black women cannot make a living on that street, then no other people should be permitted to make a living on that street. We are not obligated in any kind of way to feed the, the children of other people before we feed our own. But it's only if you think in terms of nationhood that you can resolve this kind of problem. We have tremendous possibilities as a black nation that we don't know where. You can see these white boys over there pursuing China, don't you? Right? They're over to China knocking over each other to get to it. What is the China market worth to the European? You know what the China market is worth to the European? $500 billion 
at this point. Do you know what the black market is worth to the European here in America? $400 billion. Our market is as much worth as much as the Chinese market, the Mexican market, which they've drawn up to, to bring in NAFTA. It is worth as much and is worth more than the market of Canada. You know? We are not able to place conditions right. on their entry into our markets right. by saying if you enter here, you are going to pay taxes. If you enter here, you're going to leave something here. If you enter here, you're going to leave money in the institutions. You're going to contribute to our schools. You're going to contribute to our recreational centers. You're going to contribute to the employment of our people and to the stability of our families. If you cannot contribute to these things, if you cannot create jobs, if you cannot contribute to the education of our people, then we cannot permit you to operate within our borders. This is the way a nation runs. You don't let another people walk in and have their way and walk out and leave you impoverished as a people in the name of a free market. There's no such thing as a free market. Yeah, that's white folks propaganda free and open market. No free market. They force people into that market. Castro was not free to say, I don't want to be a part of it. When he said, I don't want to be a part of it, they did what? Embargoed him and locked him out. The, China, the Japanese in the early uh, part of the century said, we don't want to be a part of your market. What did the United States do? Sent Admiral Perry in there and blasted those markets open. Right. What free markets do you have there? Right. There are no such things as free markets. Right. And when you learn that, you're going you, you, you're gonna to be the better for it. Right. And we got the markets, but we are not taking advantage of them. We've gotten ourselves in a situation where we are locked out of other people's markets and we permit them into our own such that we are locked out of our own market. And then we wonder why we suffer the way we do. It is not because we are poor. If we were that poor and impoverished, then why do those people come to us to earn their living and their wealth? It means then we must be a wealthy people. I was looking over here at a recent report. You see, we have as a people everything that it needs to make a nation. We have telephones, fax machines, computers, highways, bridges, riverways, waterways, trucks, everything that many nations in the world, in fact, the vast majority of nations in the world wish that they had available to them what the African-American nation has available to it. They wish they had the highways. They wish they had the trucks. They wish they had the trains. They wish they had the ships. They wish they had the computers, the telephones, and all of those kinds of things that you can just pick up and dial right away and they don't have to be rooted through France and somewhere else. The lights don't go off at two o'clock every day or just flip on and off. You got it all here. Then why then are we not better off than we are? All right. Because it is not enough. As I told you earlier, it is not enough to have gold in your soil or oil in your soil or diamonds in your soil. You must have a consciousness. It is only with an appropriate consciousness that these things can be transformed and converted into what? Wealth and power and can be used for the advancement of a people and the survival of a people. The same is true here then. You cannot just have telephones and faxes and this and that and not just have money in your pocket. That's not enough. You must have a consciousness that transforms those phones and transforms those faxes into a communications network that unites a people across regions and places and cities and becomes a basis for a system of distribution, a basis for uniting and creating a market from which one earns wealth to feed one's family and to stabilize one's social situation. But you can have all of these things.
But if you don't have a sense of nation, if you don't have a group consciousness, if you do not identify yourself as a nation, then these are but so many instruments and becomes, as a matter of fact, the means by which we destroy ourselves. We're looking at the black, uh, black buying power in America here, 1990 to 95. We got a report here called the Georgia Business and Economic Conditions, published here by the Selick Center at the University of Georgia, titled Black Buying Power by Place of Residence, 1990 uh, to 95. The second of a two-part analysis of buying power in specific markets. What are we talking about here? Is this published for us? No. No. What it's published for is for white folk. Right. And it's telling them how much money black folk got. Right. And it's telling them that the, black, the money black folk got is the difference between their success and their failure. Right. It reads in part here, Georgia's African-American our population thus controls approximately 16 cents of each dollar in spending power. That is about one dollar. Uh, that is about one dollar in six is spent by black consumers. How aware are we of the kind of power right. we have as African people? Right. Clearly, they are a substantial economic force throughout the state. Uh. All right. But without a national consciousness, you don't recognize that. Right but they recognize it. They go on to say, for many of Georgia's businesses, the ability to capture black spending can make the difference between success and failure. They're putting it right in your face. If black spending power, if black spending can make the difference between the success and failure of Georgia businesses, and we're talking about what? white folks' businesses, that means black folk got what? Power. Because power is about what? The ability to succeed or to bring about what? Failure. And when somebody else's success or failure depends on your own behavior, then you have what? Power. New York State, the largest black market in the world, the largest black market in the world and the largest black market in this country. How much money are we worth? We are not able to place conditions on their entry into our markets by saying, if you enter here, you are going to pay taxes. If you enter here, you are going to leave something here. If you enter here, you're going to leave money in the institutions. You're going to contribute to our schools. You're going to contribute to our recreational centers. You're going to contribute to the employment of our people and to the stability of our families. If you cannot contribute to these things, if you cannot create jobs, if you cannot contribute to the education of our people, then we cannot permit you to operate within our borders. This is the way a nation runs. You don't let another people walk in and have their way and walk out and leave you impoverished as a people in the name of a free market. There's no such thing as a free market. Yeah, that's white folks' propaganda. Free and open market. No free market. They force people into their market. Castro was not free to say, I don't want to be a part of it. When he said, I don't want to be a part of it, they did what? Embargoed him and locked him out. The, China, the Japanese, in the early uh, part of the century, said, we don't want to be a part of your market. What did the United States do? Sent Admiral Perry in there and blasted those markets open. What free markets do you have there? There are no such things as free markets. And when you learn that, you're going you, you, to be the better for it. And we got 
the markets, but we are not taking advantage of them. We have gotten ourselves in a situation where we are locked out of other people's markets and we permit them into our own such that we are locked out of our own market. And then we wonder why we suffer the way we do. It is not because we are poor. If we were that poor and impoverished, then why do those people come to us to earn their living and their wealth? It means then we must be a wealthy people. I was looking over here at a recent report. You see, we have as a people everything that it needs to make a nation. We have telephones, fax machines, computers, highways, bridges, riverways, waterways, trucks, everything that many nations in the world, in fact, the vast majority of nations in the world, wish that they had available to them what the African American nation has available to it. They wish they had the highways. They wish they had the trucks. They wish they had the trains. They wish they had the ships. They wish they had the computers, the telephones, and all of those kinds of things that you can just pick up and dial right away, and they don't have to be rooted through France or somewhere else. The lights don't go off at 2 o'clock every day or just flip on and off. You got it all here. Then why then are we not better off than we are? Because it is not enough. As I told you earlier, it is not enough to have gold in your soil or oil in your soil or diamonds in your soil. You must have a consciousness. It is only with an appropriate consciousness that these things can be transformed and converted into what? Wealth and power and can be used for the advancement of a people and the survival of a people. The same is true here then. You cannot just have telephones and faxes and this and that and not just have money in your pocket. That's not enough. You must have a consciousness that transforms those phones and transforms those faxes into a communications network that unites a people across regions and places and cities and becomes a basis for a system of distribution, a basis for uniting and creating a market from which one earns wealth to feed one's family and to stabilize one's social situation. But you can have all of these things, but if you don't have a sense of nation, if you don't have a group consciousness, if you do not identify yourself as a nation, then these are but so many instruments and becomes, as a matter of fact, the means by which we destroy ourselves. We are looking at the black, uh, black buying power in America here, 1990 to 95. We got a report here called the Georgia Business and Economic Conditions published here by the Selleck Center at the University of Georgia, titled Black Buying Power by Place of Residence, 1990 uh, to 95. The second of a two-part analysis of buying power in specific markets. What are we talking about here? Is this published for us? No. no. What it's published for is for white folk. Right. And it's telling them how much money black folk got. And it's telling them that the, black, the money black folk got is the difference between their success and their failure. It reads in part here, Georgia's African-American uh, population thus controls approximately 16 cents of each dollar in spending power. That is about one dollar, uh, that is about one dollar in six is spent by black consumers. How aware are we of the kind of power? we have as African people. Right. Clearly, they are a substantial economic force throughout the state. Uh, all right. But without a nation of consciousness, you don't recognize that. Right. But they recognize it. Right. They go on to say, for many of Georgia's businesses, the ability to capture black spending can make the difference between success and failure. They're putting it right in your face. If black spending power, if black spending can make the difference between the success and failure of Georgia businesses, and we're talking about what? White folks' businesses. That means black folk got what? Power. Because power is about what? The ability 
to succeed or to bring about what? Failure. And when somebody else's success or failure depends on your own behavior, then you have what? Power. New York State, the largest black market in the world, the largest black market in the world and the largest black market in this country. How much money are we worth in New York State, black people? You know how much money we are worth? $61 billion. That is a lot of money. This represents well over 10% of the buying power in New York State alone. I'm speaking of the, the, the area, the New York, Connecticut, tri-state area. And uh, what does that mean? Now, but don't look at that absolute figure. Look at what would happen if we reinvested that $60 billion. If we put that $60 billion in black businesses, in black trade, if we invested that $60 billion in gaining equity in the major American corporations, if we gain that, use that $60 billion to gain equity in African countries. You know, I was just reading a piece this week about the fact that black investment bankers, a couple of black investment bankers, are selling as much as $100 million of bonds for the, the African uh, Development Bank. Yes, another black investment banker is selling something like $500 million of securities for African businesses and infrastructural development. What does that mean, African people? That means that if we were knowledgeable of corporate finance, if we were knowledgeable of investment vehicles, we could literally finance the development of Africa. And by buying securities in the African Development Bank, by buying bonds, by buying other investment instruments in African corporations, even if they're owned by white folks, because once we buy the shares, we become the owners. In other words, then, by using black wealth, we can become the vehicle for financing African growth and development. And by, by using our own wealth and financing our own businesses, developing our own economic system, we would multiply our wealth, and we would not only be then worth 400 billion, we'd be worth uh, 800 billion or more and we would go stronger. And the stronger we go, grow, the more others would depend upon how we spend in order to survive. And to that degree, we will gain power over them. If tomorrow we decided as African people to build co-op supermarkets across this country, and we can do it, so that we can sell our people grocery and food at below wholesale prices, if we decided, using our church organizations as a means for sponsoring these co-op uh, food markets across the country so that we can open them literally simultaneously, and centered then the buying uh, power for all of those co-op centers in a way that then we would have billions of dollars to spend with the suppliers of food, we could then manipulate those producers in terms of the buying power that we have. We can begin then to place our people on their boards. We can begin then to have real and substantial power in America. We have it in our hands, but you gotta think of it as nation. It becomes interesting, by the way, if you study this particular breakdown of black spending in Georgia, and I wish we would get these breakdowns across the country. You see, when you become a state and a nation, you develop statistics. You see, and that's where statistics come from. It is the means by which a state and a nation gathers information about itself so that it can use that information to reorganize itself and to set itself up in ways to advance its interests. So once you become a nation, you become sensitive to the fact that you need a lot of information so that you can use this information. Now, when I read about the percentage of black buying power in Georgia by counties, something becomes very surprising. 
You know, for instance, that black buying power is as high as 25 and 26 percent in many of these counties. For instance, in Liberty County, Georgia, black buying power there uh, is a is 22 percent of the total buying power. In Mer uh, in Merthweather, 25 percent. Peach County, 25 percent. Uh, and you can just go on and on. In some of these counties, black buying power is as much as 45%, 35%. In other words, the black consumer has these counties by the balls. And they are able, if that buying power was to be coordinated and used, to have real impact and to transform the power relations of those societies and of those counties. They would be able, if they are buying half or 25% or 30% of what is being bought in those counties to establish their own businesses and enterprises there. And they would be able to defend those businesses and enterprises through the use of the boycott weapon. So what are we saying here then this evening, ladies and gentlemen? That African power is based on an African consciousness based on an African-centered culture, based on an African-centered personality. And the degree to which our personalities and our culture are based on African values, based on African interests, based on African goals, to that degree we empower ourselves as Africans, and to that degree we escape the power of others over us. Thank you very much for your guidance. Thank you very much for your welcome. And I'd like to say it's a pleasure indeed to be back here again with you. I have to apologize for being a bit incommunicado, but uh, as my good brother stated, and that's been the result of the fact that I've been at completing a book, a short one, and often when you can't escape the city, you sort of have to pretend you're out of town, you know, to, to uh, wrap it up. And writing a book is <clears throat> very much like um, when you're playing athletics, you really you get into a uh, state of mind or consciousness or or what we call you get uh, your concentration on you, really try not to break it. So and I have to apologize for, to my friends and others who sort of tried to get through and find it difficult. I managed to finish the galley there last week, and hopefully in February we can, we'll have the first edition of the Black on Black Violence, sort of dealing with uh, black criminality, but it, uh, particularly with the violence that uh, we often express one toward the other and how that is brought about by the social political circumstances under which we are forced to survive. And there are a couple of other, there's another book that's being developed too, uh, which we expect to be out uh, soon as well. You may also look forward to a short book on the education of the African child, of the African American child. Uh, it's probably around March or, or April. It's, I've found it so important that we get our material out. And I'm making them short because at this point, we really don't have the time to put in two or three or four years uh, in develop, into developing books in terms of the challenges that we face as people nowadays. The lecture tonight, of course, will be as written on your flyer, Developing the Undeveloped Minds of Children of African Ancestry. I will have to say that you can consider this lecture part one on this particular subject matter. I will complete it at the African Portrait Theater Sunday. Uh, 
believe it's what uh, scheduled for around 5, 5.30. I'll have to apologize perhaps to the others who are sort of used to what may be called my more dynamic style of delivery tonight. Uh, I'm going to be a bit more professorial, and therefore it means maybe a bit more boring, <laughs> maybe a bit more, uh, I may tend to put some of you to sleep. And, but uh, I'm going to risk that in light of the importance of the subject matter. And therefore, I prefer to emphasize the information than the entertainment. Because I think we, we face such dire problems and circumstances until we really need to do a close analysis of our situation. And we need to come away from these kind of occasions with working knowledge, with information we can use, not just a good feeling, not a good stroking and so forth, not that other speakers leave us without information, but I think in terms of myself, I want to emphasize that a bit more. Sometimes that sort of takes away from the dynamism of the lecture itself. That's another reason why I'm sort of breaking this lecture up into two parts, because we, when we talk about developing the undeveloped mind of our children, we should take the time to analyze the situation and to analyze the minds of our children and how those minds have been created. You cannot appropriately talk about the education of black children without understanding what we call the cognitive style of black children and the behavioral style of black children. I wrote the developmental psychology of the black child for one major reason. And that major reason is the fact that when you talk of rearing children, and when you talk of educating children, you should have a knowledge of their developmental psychology. One of the major problems with the New York educational system and with the American educational system, and in fact, with the African educational system in Africa and other places, is that those systems are not based on a knowledge of the developmental psychology of African children. I've stated the, on other occasions that a school system that pedagogical approaches, that is teaching approaches, that the content and design of curricula are based on the, an implicit child when to teach a particular subject matter, what subject matter is to be taught, how that subject matter is to be taught, what the content will be and so forth, is based upon what we call an implicit theory of the development of the person or individual that you are going to teach. In other words, we decide to teach children reading at particular points, certain types of math at, at particular points in their life, social studies, science, and other things, because we feel that they have a certain readiness due to their biological maturation and due to their social experience. So consequently, if you're going to do a competent job of educating children, you should have a knowledge of their basic developmental psychology, a knowledge of their, their basic developmental, biological, and psychological orientation. Otherwise, there will, be, there will be a mismatch between what is being taught, how developmental history and, and the child's developmental orientation. We have to recognize then that schools in America, and in particular schools in New York City, are built around the implicit white child, the developmental psychology of the white child. I don't have time here tonight to show you a profile of the so-called mental abilities, let us say, of the Jewish child, the Chinese child, the Puerto Rican and black child tonight, to show you the differences in the organization of those abilities and the differences in the level of those abilities between these sets of children. If you saw those organizational uh, 
systems and the levels uh, that differentiate, differentiate these children, you can see immediately then that a school system based upon the psychology of Jewish children will by its very nature, by its very structure, destroy the intellectual potential of black children. So you have to have a knowledge of who your children are if you are to, to appropriately educate them and design an appropriate educational experience for them. And one of the major problems then that we've had as a people is that we do not know our children and consequently we have a difficulty in, the, in designing the appropriate educational experience for them. You have to come to understand that very clearly. Our children are not, as I've said so often, white children who happen to be black. There are substantial psychological, biological, and other differences between the black child and the white child. The education then the black children is not a matter of mere color. The psychology of our children, as I've stated on other occasions, and the psychology of our people is the result of the historical experience of our people. The psychology that is used in educating children today is a psychology based on the history and experience of Europeans. Consequently then, the educational approach based on that psychology is inadequate for meeting the educational needs of African people and of our children. However, our children are blamed for this mismatch. They are then described in terms of deficiencies and deviances and defects and other kinds of things that we hear so much about in, in the everyday world. You as an individual are your history and your psychology is the result of your history. Therefore, I cannot use your history and the psychology that flows from that history to adequately define the behavior of another individual that the behavior of the other individual must be defined and described in terms of that individual's history and experience. The same thing applies when we talk about a people. The psychology of black people and the psychology of black children is, it flows from the history and experience of black people. The behavior and the orientation of black children today carries in them the history and experience of black people for the past several thousands, if not millions, of years. We've indicated that the genetic inheritance that our children receive, the genes that our children carry, are not mere chemical packets that determine their physiological aspects, but the genes are, are capsulated histories of the experience of our people. In other words, the cultural history, the biological history, the climatic, geographical history of our people, the interaction our people have had with other peoples, the interactions our people have had with their environment on the African continent and other places over the thousands and thousands of years are carried right in the bodies of our children and is a part of their psychology as well as their biology. And therefore, the education of our children must be based on the knowledge of that history and the psychology that flows from that history. The other thing, of course, that we must recognize and that we'll talk a great deal about here this evening is that the education of a people must depend upon the problems that people have to solve. And many of you have heard me say again and again that the destiny of the black child is revolutionary, that the destiny of the white child is conservative, that the major thing that the white child must do is to maintain the advantages that whites already have and to add to those advantages. When we talk of the black child and the black people as being disadvantaged, we have referred to the fact that we do not have our share of what this world has to offer. And when we recognize that we will have to take that share from other people, and that we will have to be able to protect that share once we take it, we then must recognize that the destiny of our children is revolutionary 
and that we are in a sense preparing our children for warfare. That means then that they must be reared to take on those tasks. That means that they must be educated to undertake those tasks. That means ultimately then that they cannot be reared or educated in the same ways white children are reared or educated. They must be educated and reared to undertake their appropriate tasks in the world. And then we then have to design then their education in terms of their destiny. Um, and I've said on other occasions, I'll repeat here again tonight, that there is no such thing as standard education. There is no such thing as equal education. These things you must get out of your minds. They will destroy you. There is no universal, non-ethnic, non-political uh, type of education. Education is political to its very core. It's, et it's ethnic to its very core. And anybody that deceives you into thinking that you're going to get the same education with the same result as a lot of people is making a fool of you. And you have to rid yourself of those ideas. You're being destroyed by the concept. There's no such thing as standard of people or the same as, particularly when you have different tasks to accomplish. We're going to then approach this issue tonight in terms of what we call information processing. Just how does the mind process information? So the lecture tonight will be relatively general. We're just going to kind of get an overall view of the mind and how it is developed and how it is influenced by its environment and how it influences its environment. Sunday, we will look at the particular characteristics of the black child's cognitive style. So once we look at the particular characteristics, then we know exactly how our children must be educated. It's not enough for you to go to the new commission and say, we want our children to have a better education. You must be able to, what we uh, call the psychology, operationally defined what a better education means. That is, you've got to be able to list and state in terms of technique, method of approach, and content exactly what you mean when you say you want your children to have a better education. And this has been one of the problems we've had. You know, we, we talk about better education, the same education, standard education, without any definition. You must be able to go down to this commissioner's desk, to the chancellor's desk there, with a, an educational manual that lays out step by step exactly how you want your children educated with the rationale of why you want them educated that way and how you plan for that education to be uh, integrated into the school system. That manual should be a part of all of your community boards and district uh, boards so that they can use it to implement an educational program across the system. In other words, you have to be specific. You have to know what you want and how to get where you want to go. But in order to do that, you've got to know uh, in particular sort of ways how your children think, how they behave, how the system has organized them to behave, how it has organized them to think, so that you will know exactly how you want to reorganize their mental and behavioral structures. In terms of, of generality, I've talked about how, in a sense, we can get a broad concept of how the black child thinks and behaves by trying to answer the question, how must that child behave and how must that child think? How must black people behave, African people behave, how must African people think if the European is to maintain his power and domination over black people? In other words, you must meditate on this question. If you were in power, how would you prefer that the people you rule over behave? 
What kind of mental characteristics would you prefer that they have? Of course, you want them to be passive, wouldn't you? You want them to be obedient, wouldn't you? You want them to love you, even though you kick them up their butt and mistreat them, wouldn't you? You want them to think that you're the greatest in the world, that you're the smartest, that you're invincible, that they're the dumbest and stupidest and the whole bit, wouldn't you? And that'd make life very nice for you, wouldn't it? Then you have to recognize this, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk a little later on about what I call the theory of racial complementarity. You know, how one race in power tries to design another race to complement its power, you see. And what kind of mind and, and personality and behavioral orientation it must interject into the subordinate race in order to stay in power. How, how must their thinking capacities be limited, or if they're not limited, how must they be restricted in their scope so that one race can stay in power and another out of power? And you can show them that you can work out the mental characteristics and behavioral characteristics of that subordinate race in very fine detail. Once you answer those questions, once you answer that central question, and look at it very closely, look at the characteristics that must be introduced into the minds of the subject people, then if you're serious, if you're serious, and I'm, I'm emphasizing that because I really wonder how many of us are really serious. Period. If you're serious about getting out of that situation, you'll know exactly how your children are to be reared and educated to be gotten out of that situation. So we're going to start on this track tonight. Stick with me, stay awake. <laughs> we're going to uh, go through it here, and I'm going to try to keep it as interesting as I can. However, I want you to listen to me carefully as I sort of go through the paradigm here. Right. We're going to look then at the information processing approach to understanding the minds of our children. The information processing approach is defined in the standard developmental psychological text, and I'm mainly using the one by the Pelia and Holmes, uh, refers to the analysis of the processes underlying intelligent behavior, or how we do what we do. I'm taking this approach because I think it's a valuable approach. There's a difference between being told that your child has an IQ of a 90 or 100 or 70 or 150 and being told how your child thinks, how your child processes information, how it solves problems, you see, or fails to solve problems, and one of the reasons it solves problems or fails to solve problems. When you're given the latter type of information, you're given a program you see, you're giving a basis upon which you can operate to transform the behavior and orientation of your child. But for someone to say, well, he has an IQ of 90 or has an IQ of 70, what do you do with that information? What kind of program is contained in that information? You see, so often we get these sort of uh, labeled approaches to our children. Well, they have, they, uh, they made this score, that score or they have a reading level of this point, or that percentage point, or other percentage point, but there's no information there, you see, that you can work with to transform the situation. That says, hey, if you work on this, and if you train the child in this area, if you give the child more practice at this and this point, then this particular behavior will be rectified, or enhanced, or stimulated, for growth. The information processing approach then I think is, is uh, a better approach for approaching, for uh, dealing with problems of this type. And this is in contrast to what we call the psychometric approach where a child is given a test and essentially then a score is what they, the parent or, or another interested person gets, you see. We are deceived in psychology to a great extent uh, by labels. We often think that we have information that we really don't have. 
to say a child is a slow learner, learning disabled, in a sense really says nothing. You know, there's really no value in that. It gives you a sense that you, you know, you know what you're talking about. But in the end, you really think about you know, setting up a program, you have no program, you see. And the same black children have reading problems, or black children have problems in math. Or, this really says nothing at all. What can you get out of that? There's no information there. It only ends up making people feel uh, bad and inferior and so forth. They're making them feel even more frustrated and powerless in terms of how to get out of that situation. So the information processing approach emphasizes how we do what we do. How do you arrive at particular solutions? How do you arrive uh, at a particular problem and solve that problem? The information processing theories then refer to the way people receive information. How is information taken in? And you will see here we're going to talk about input. Because that is the very first segment of learning. The taking in of information. Sunday we will show you why many of our children have problems learning because the intake process is often impaired. The intentional process is impaired in many instances, you see. The focusing of attention is impaired. A child that does not attend well, does not focus well and listens well, more than likely is a child who's going to have learning problems, not because of any inadequacy of the brain or capacity even to think well. The problem is the information didn't get into the system to be thought about, you see. And so, or it may be there's nothing wrong with the child's capacity to think and to compare and contrast and do all the other things, but the search for information is unsystematic. You see, the ability to code and categorize the information is not there. So consequently, the, even if the information gets into the system, it, it, it cannot be processed appropriately. So the, these theories look at how people, the way people receive information from the environment and the way they operate on it. It is not enough to take uh, information into your mind. But the, that information must be operated on appropriately. It must be processed. It must be organized. It must be filed and categorized and classified and related to other information. There must be systems in the brain, as we say, or in the mind, that can perform those processing situations. Uh, activities. Again, you're going to say in a minute that their children have the best brains in the world. But there's a problem often with many of them in terms of how they can program the information that is being made available to them. And information theories then get into the rules and the strategies and techniques that are used by the so-called intelligent people and problem-solving people to process information and use information to their advantage. And it's this kind of knowledge we have to begin to solve as a people. If they not only then look at, it, the, at how information is operated on, but how you integrate that information with information available in memory. I was reading here recently a book about Shaka Zulu, E.A. Ritter's book, Shaka Zulu, and I recommend that you read that book. Uh, you should get all your youngsters to read that book, particularly the, uh, the uh, males. It's uh, so informative, and I'm not saying he's the final authority on Shaka. In fact, you should read that book along with others. <clears throat> but this one I find interesting because you, you see so much in the uh, book. I'm going to talk a little later on about what I call the personalistic approach to history. We as African people now, that we have assuaged our egos and, you know, have sort of gotten over the initial shock of the inferiority complex, uh, it is time now for us to look more critically at ourselves and to move beyond the hero-worshiping approach to history. 
and look at it analytically for the lessons that it teaches us. You see, and look at our heroes critically and analytically so that we can gain important information and lessons for solving our problems. Merely talking about the greatness of Shaka certainly can make us feel good about ourselves, and we should feel good about ourselves. But as I've said on many other occasions, you're going to die feeling good. Yeah, many crack people out there dying feeling good. It's not enough to feel good about yourself to survive. Feeling good about your African self is not going to save your lives. Okay? Knowing that you were great kings in Egypt and great kings in the other parts of Africa is wonderful and it's necessary. But it will not solve particular problems. You have to now look at your heroes in terms of their culture, in terms of the mistakes they made, in terms of the other kind of issues that involve their lives so that you can get the kind of information you need to survive as a people. And believe me, people, our survival is in serious question very serious question. If you are going to talk about statehood, you're going to have to study statehood, the statecraft of the Egyptians. If you're going to talk about developing an African economy, you're going to have to look at the economic situation of Egypt. You have to recognize that every great civilization, African or otherwise, is based on a great economy. You cannot talk about bringing black people to greatness unless you're talking about erecting a great African economy. This is not going to happen. So you must ask the question, how did the Egyptians support economically what they had? Because they could not be what they were unless they had an appropriate economy, and unless they were appropriately economically organized. No, not they weren't what they were simply because they worshipped uh, you know, Ra and worshipped the others. Not by a long shot. That was a part of what they were, but it was not the complete part of who and what they were. They were also what they were because of their economic system and approaches, and those things must be understood. We must understand that history has a thousand faces, that it is designed to answer a thousand questions, and that looking for heroes is only one function of history, only one. The history of our people then can be used to provide various types of answers, economic answers, political answers, statecraft answers, uh, political science answers, all kinds of answers can be provided by history, but you have to ask the history what? The appropriate what? The appropriate questions, you see. And so it's very important that we understand that. One of the reasons why didn't I mention Shaka in this situation, because when I was reading through it a couple of weeks ago, I was reading the situation of where <clears throat> the Zulu, some of whom they had, have had as many as 5,000 head of cattle, could remember individually each of those head of cattle and could tell which one was missing out of the whole lot. You see, and I bring that up, you know, to, to show again that the African brain is by no means suffering from any mem memory deficits at all. The memory of Africans was phenomenal. We often think in this day and age of note-taking and so forth that memory is a weak thing. But you must realize and take yourself back to a time when that was all people had to depend on. And recognize then that their memory capacities were developed to a very high degree of perfection, a degree of perfection that we today could, uh, would be awed by. Memory is literally infinite. You can remember many, many, many things, uh, just a numberless number of things. And they were able to do that because their lives depended upon it. Their social system depended upon it. So there's nothing wrong. The other thing that I read there, too, was how the about the complexity of the Zulu language and how there was no such thing as uh, ungrammatical Zulu speech. You know, that these people spoke their language with clarity and spoke it uh, well. You know, no, no, uh, no broken Zulu in this and that because we've accepted that too as a people. Again, what I'm trying to point out here 
is that when we look at the history of our people, we see the abilities that our people have. So then, to sum it up quickly, the information processing theories refer to the way people receive information from their environment, operate on it, integrate it with the with information available in memory, and use the product as a basis for uh, deciding how to perform. And we're going to be back in a minute with this decision business. Information processing psychologists start their investigation with the study of how people perform on tasks. We have, you've often heard the statement that black people are uh, not taught how to think, but what? What to think. That is one of the basic requirements of a servant people. That's one of the reasons why, one of the characteristics of many of our people's cognitive or thinking styles will be passive, a receptive, taking in kind of style, but not one that is flexible and productive, but one that is similar to uh, that of parents, of taking in, memorizing, and throwing out and thinking that they're thinking when they're merely recalling, you see, and recalling what some white instructor has taught them, and quoting some white instructor, but not doing any original thinking on their own. So we must then look at how our children think and perform on these tasks. For example, information processing psychologists would seek to identify the processes that underlie human reasoning. It's not, as, not to say that a child has a reasoning deficit. We must look at the very processes that are involved in deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, syllogistic thinking, analogical thinking, and so forth. What are the steps involved in there, in, in this kind, in these types of thinking? And let us see then how those steps can be taught and trained into our children if they need be. You look at the scientific me method that's utilized in this culture, and you have to recognize that we are talking about a way of thinking, a way of behaving, a way of dealing with information. And we can see all around us right now the result of thinking in particular kinds of ways. We look at these TV monitors, we look at the cameras here, we look at this building. This is the result of what? Of um, a way of thinking. And that's all it's about. Not about brain, just way of thinking. And therefore, at some point there, when Francis Bacon and others uh, imposed this way of thinking on European society, we saw then a takeoff of knowledge production. We are literally being overrun with knowledge and information. But that being overrun with knowledge and information is a result of applying the scientific method, the scientific attitude of approach, of applying hypothetical thinking and approaching the development of knowledge systematically. The discovery then of information flows more out of the systematic approach than it does out of genius. I'm going to come back to that uh, a little later on because we've been given the genius approach to history of white people. You know, the idea that science is produced by some scientist locked away in his ivory tower. That is a lie. It's a lie. And it is not true. And that approach to science has been particularly projected on us so that uh, so it's to create an inferiority complex in us. And we have to understand that. It has to do with methods of thinking. If you follow the scientific method of thinking and approach, and you have the appropriate equipment, you are going to what? Discover something. I guarantee you. It's set up for discovery. The discovery and the production is where? In what? In the method in the way of thinking, in the way of approaching the world. That's where it is. You then, if you want to get certain things produced from your culture and from your children, you must then put into their minds the appropriate way of thinking. And they will produce it for you. And you must 
learn how to do it, and then proceed to do so. While there are almost as many definitions of intelligence, and I'm going to talk about intelligence here tonight, in terms of, of uh, its relationship to academic achievement. We're not going to get involved in, in trying to decide exactly what it is. But we're talking about it in terms of that uh, aspect of, of behavior and capacity that allows children to succeed in school. While there are almost as many definitions of intelligence as there are researchers, most of them center around two aspects of intelligence, goal, orienta goal orientation and adaptive behavior. We don't have time to discuss this evening the fact that there should be as many definitions of intelligence as there are conscious. And see, there's, a, there's another one of the deception we have and that is the idea that there should be only one definition of intelligence that should apply all across everybody. And that's going to get you in trouble the same way the concept of standard education gets you in trouble as well. The thing, though, that we are emphasizing here then is what all uh, or most definitions of intelligence uh, deal with, and that is goal orientation and adaptive behavior. Goal-oriented means that it is conscious and deliberate rather than accidental. So a lot of people think intelligence in its broadest sense is something that sort of happens on people and something that just sort of just automatically inherited it and people have it or they don't have it. And, and I want you to note that intelligence is related to the setting of goals. Goals. We're going to see in a minute that one of the major reasons for the confusion, unlike children, one of the major reasons for the kind of educational problems African children have over the world is because we as black adults are not clear about the goals that we want to accomplish as people. Because it is the goals, if you know, that we set that organizes and informs intelligence. Yeah. You see? If you have no goals and no sense of purpose, then there is, there is no organization of the intellectual capacities of your children. We're going to come back to that. Yeah. You have got to have cultural goals, people. You just can't send your children to school and expect them to learn when you have no, no real uh, cultural goals and directions and things you want to accomplish. The first thing they ask you is, why am I studying this mathematics? Why do I have to learn this, mama? Why do I have to read this? And because you have no sense of where you want to go as a people, you're at a loss to tell them to. Well, you know, then you get your job. <laughs> Don't you want to learn that? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you want to learn that? people sound like crack. Why do I have to go through all of this? If this is merely what, what it's about, you know, you've got to be able to, to uh, inculcate the children with goals and, and have a goal orientation in order for them to organize their intelligence. And I'm going to show you, because you have let your future be determined by another people, your children's minds and brains have nowhere to go. And they have no reasons for learning. The other aspect of intelligence has to do with the adaptive. The adaptive refers to the fact that intelligence consists of the ability to solve problems. Keep that in mind. To what? To solve problems. Not to score high on the IQ test. That is not intelligence. Not to score high on the SAT. That's coincidental. But to do what? Solve problems. Solve the problems that confront you as a people and solve the problem that confront you as an individual. I don't care how high you score on an IQ test. If you can't solve the problems that confront you as a people and as an individual, you are dumb. And you will be destroyed. See? And I'm telling you, 
You've heard me say before that regardless of the level of education of black people, from the PhD level on down, there is a certain fundamental dumbness in the black community. Yes. A dumbness. You talk about the crack dealer. Though he makes his thousands per month, and maybe millions, who still didn't know how to launder the money, still didn't know how to legitimize the money, gets raided and the money is stacked up in the closet. <laughs> you know? Doesn't know what to do with it. Period. But he is just as stupid as a black middle class who takes that little check and takes every ounce of that check and spends it giving it to a white man to pay inflated rent and other kinds of stuff. Who will not save, who will not invest in the future of the children or in the future of the community. The same idiocy, you know, is characteristic of them both. So you have the same dumbness that runs from the highly educated right down to the one right in the street. You're, no, you're basically no different. Yeah. I was talking to a Buffy one night and he was complaining about the cars that the drug sellers were selling and, and the gold and stuff. I said, but really, brother, he's no fundamentally different from you. <laughs> in a sense, you're just mad because he can buy the car you can buy. Because you're using that car to distinguish yourself in terms of class and, you know, in terms of who you are, in terms of your status. And he's doing the same thing. So you, you're functionally operating on the same plane, you see, no difference. And you're just angry that he, being in one class different from yours, is able to conspicuously consume the same way you do, and now you're having a hell of a way uh, uh, determining how can you be distinguished from this person here. <laughs> it's the same game. You're still feeding white people. You're still buying overpriced junk and garbage. You're still imperiling the future of black people. You should study history in its real aspects. Read Barbara Tuckman's history, uh, I forget what it's called, of the 14th century, the 14th century Europe. Read that. And I'm not one of these Africans to tell you you should only read African history. You need to read European history. You must understand European history. You really cannot appropriately understand African history unless you understand European history. I'm telling you, you can't do it. Because the histories are too inextricably intertwined, one with the other. You only get to know the psychology of the European by reading European history. You will know to a good extent that these great civilizations essentially were based on thievery <laughs> and robbery and criminal activities. In fact, you can read the personal history of some of our most illustrious families today and quickly run into bootlegging and other kinds of legal activity that is the basis of their fortune and influence in America today. You must recognize that war is a pretty name for uh, robbing and thieving. Yeah, that's all it is. One country gets a, a gang together and decides it'll take the product of another country. They call it war. And then they make very beautiful slogans and beautiful mu music to deceive the people so that they can participate in robbing the other people's resources and territories. Realize how many millions of people had to be killed to make this country possible. Understand what I'm saying? You've forgotten it. Yeah. You've forgotten it. Right? How many people have had to be murdered, raped, tortured, robbed, dispossessed? You think you're dealing with nice, good people, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> when you read my new book, you'll see where it talks about European ethics is, is based on, you know, European criminality. <laughs> You robbed enough and stolen enough to be nice. That's all it is. If we took that wealth from you, you'd be out there robbing and stealing in these streets like everybody else. You're not intrinsically nice. Don't deceive yourself. 
your ethics are bought and paid for. They're not intrinsic within your own character and personality. The ultimate test of, of one's ethical character is when one is starving and has nowhere to go. Okay? And when one is standing in front of real temptation and you have no money in your pocket. That's when your ethics are tested. Not when you got all the money to work on them. You know, nice. Come on. <laughs> we let these people run this game. And they have enough nerve. What am I saying here then? <laughs> Intelligence then has to do with solving problems. Solving problems. You are not intelligent until you solve the problems that confront whom? Define intelligence as the ability to solve their problems, not your own. Their problems. They didn't call you intelligent when you can behave and think in a way that adds to their power and maintains their position in the world. Then you're intelligent. Then you have good character. Understand? I want you to think about what I'm saying here. You see? And their measure of intelligence then is intrinsically related to those abilities and ways of thinking that allows them to solve the problems that confront them as a people. Those African Americans then who are often called intelligent within this system are what I will call intellectual mercenaries. They are hired guns who then are used to solve the problems of the European corporate system and economic system, political and social system, but who, when confronted with their own problems, cannot solve their own problems. They can fly European shuttles into the space. They can light European ships up on the moon. They can sit on the board on the Joint Chiefs of Staff and direct European armies and, and develop military strategies for Europeans and yet they cannot run the white man out of South Africa and they cannot military They cannot move Africa into the space race. They cannot get our people in a position where we can commercially exploit space and be a part of the expansion of this system into the universe. You are dominant, ignorant, no matter what position you have in this society, if you cannot solve those problems, ladies and gentlemen. So you got an MBA so that you can be smart and be productive and even better than the white boys and producing for Xerox and producing for IBM and all the rest. But you can't build and take over your own economic systems in Brooklyn and Harlem and the other places. You Africans let these Arabs and these other groups have control of your economy and control of your system. I don't care how much you can go to Cambridge and how many Rhodes scholars you produce and so forth. If you can't solve the salvation of African people, if you cannot move Africa to a position of technological challenge to other powers, if you cannot solve the issue of securing the survival of African people, you are dumb and stupid. I don't yeah, care. Yeah. Therefore, you must define intelligence in terms of your own goals, in terms of your own survival. You must organize the thinking of children and the behavior of your children in terms of your own survival, not in terms of supporting the survival of another people. When you organize the intelligence of these children in terms of the interest of another people, you are making your children traitors to your own causes. Colin Powell will direct armed assaults on African nations and African people. And I bet you 
said you couldn't get an organized army in Africa against the colonial and other forces in Africa. Stand what I'm saying? You have to look at intelligence. You can't accept the standard definition of intelligence. Screw the white folks' definition of intelligence. You must look at it in terms of what do we need to survive? What do we need to be liberated? What do we need as a people to secure our survival? So in this sense, the intelligence involves the constant active interaction between so-called inherited ability and environmental experience. Really, we're going to see intelligence and environment is essentially one and the same thing. We talk about them for convenience as if they're different things, but they are really one and the same thing. Intelligence and behavior and so forth only can make sense within the context of an environment. Otherwise, they have no meaning at all, no value whatsoever. Yeah, no value at all. You can't separate intelligence from environment. Yeah, our goal orientation, our problem solving has no meaning. It only, it only has meaning within a particular context and reflects that context. You can't have criminality where boys kill each other over sneakers in a society that doesn't sell sneakers, can you? No. So in, in a sense, almost every crime is a social act. Almost every behavior is a social act, you see, defined by a social environment and a social system in which that act takes place. And so is the case with intelligence. In a sense, you cannot be the same as white folk unless you what? Ah, white folk. No matter how you try it. No matter how you play it. No matter how you do it. You exist in a context that is unique to you. You are confronted with problems that are unique to you. You have goals that are unique to you. You live under conditions that are unique to you. You have a history that is unique to you. And you cannot be a white person. And a white person cannot be you. And when you then try to, to get to be a white person, you are merely going to drive yourself crazy. And be inappropriate for yourself and not going to be able to solve your problems. It's not going to happen. I have to tell people, when you take a course in, in college, the course is not only defined by its subject matter, you see, and this is the problem often you have with black students in certain classes. They look at the book and they think that what's in the book is what the course is. You know, and I've told you about the situation where often when you're talking about subject matter that's not in the book and the students are looking in the book to see if what you're talking about is there, and they decide if it's not there, then you must be off the subject. You know? Or you must not be talking psychology, you must be talking something else. Because they don't see the guy who wrote the book called Introduction to Psychology talking about this. And then you run to the thing, we're being miseducated, he's not teaching us what's in the book. You know? <laughs> As if, you know, psychology is defined by the author. That's what I'm saying, even in totally black classes, the white man is still sitting there with that book. You know, directing the course, directing people's minds. You can see, as I've said before, people's minds turn off, you know, as soon as they don't see it in the book. But this mind just shut down. You can look at their eyes and it just shut down. They don't hear you anymore. And then when you get back to the book, they wake up, you know, they get back into it because they figure that's going to be on the test. <laughs> what you trying to tell them, you know. Look, when I'm off the book, I'm talking about the most important things around. You see, what, what are we saying here then? That a course is not only defined by its so-called subject matter or its subject, but a course is defined by its problems. You see, by the problems a particular people have to solve. So white psychology books, white uh, sociology books, White books on economics and education and so forth are in part determined to a significant degree by the problems that whites face in these particular areas. You see? And, and when you take an issues course, it will be an issues course that determines their problems, not yours. 
That is why despite the fact that you come out with a head full of knowledge and information, you are still unable to apply that information to your own circumstances. You understand? The economic problems of white folk are not the economic problems of black folk. You see, you've got very different economic organizations of the black community. You have very different issues to deal with. How do you get black folk to spend money with black folk? How do you organize the money that black people have such that money can be used to produce commercial and, and business growth and development? What is the psychology that makes black folk feel good when they give all that money to white folk? How can you as a retailer get around that kind of, of, of uh, psychology if you were a business person? Those are black issues and black problems, you know. How can we get control of the importation of all African products, you see? How do we get control of the distribution of African products within the United States? economic system. How do we take over the United States economic system? Those are, those are black problems. Those are black economic problems. How, given the fact that uh, by mid-next century, white people will be a minority in the United States, over 50% over of the jobs in this country will be held by minorities you see, how do we take advantage of that situation and change this economic system around and make it an African one? And then connect it and organize it in its relationship to African countries. Those are the dissertations you should be writing. Those are the master's thesis you should be getting into. Those are the kind of issues you should be doing in your business courses and so forth. If you are not doing those, you are not doing Afrocentric business. You understand? You can only solve problems based on the information available in your head by using that information, contrasting, comparing, approaching it hypothetically, and so forth, to arrive at possible answers and approaches to problems. How do you solve an African problem without African information in your head? You've got a problem, actually. Even if you're able to think well abstractly, even if you're able to think well conceptually, ladies and gentlemen, even if you're able to do mathematics very, very well, you're still going to have a problem because you don't have the fundamental information. You don't have the fundamental what? Information that is necessary to the solution of a problem. You see? So the mere training in thinking or the mere training in abstract reasoning and so forth, while good is not good enough, Knowledge is not good enough. It's not enough. You've got to have more than knowledge. You've got to have other things. You've got to have uses for that knowledge. And knowledge is organized by goals, by intentions, by plans. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's why it's so important for you to have a sense of nation as a people. Because if you don't have a sense of nation, you can have a fund of knowledge, but still perish. African people have a tremendous amount of knowledge and skill, too. It's just unbelievable. If we were a nation with the kind of knowledge we have, the skills we have, we would be one of the major nations on this earth. You see? But because there is no overarching national goal, no national program, no national administration among black people. That knowledge just sits in isolated bits and pieces, and it's uncoordinated and cannot be used to solve the people's problems or secure their survival. It's the same situation where black people sit with billions of dollars in their pockets and have no economic system. Because an economic system is not the same thing as money. The emphasis is 
some system. It is called the fact that people must have a particular set of relationships with each other and a particular way of allocating and distributing money and distributing their talents and skills and so forth that makes an economic system. Economic systems existed prior to money. The ultimate economic system depends upon social organization and depends upon the nature of a relationship between people, not the mere existence of money. And therefore, here we are as a people with billions of dollars and no economic and social and political influence in America to count for. It's a shame. Why? Is it because you didn't, you, you, you didn't have Andrew Bremer up on the board or whatever, the federal board? That you don't have PhDs in economics? Huh? Hey, educated the wrong way. Intelligence only organized to solve what? Other people's problems, not their own problems. Purpose organizes intelligence. Get to the reason for being. It begins with focusing one focusing one's attention on something. It begins with seeing a problem to be solved. You see? It begins there. We'll see in a second how that works. Intelligence involves the constant interaction between inheritability and environmental experience, which results in an individual's being able to acquire, to acquire the appropriate information for solving a problem, to remember the necessary information for solving a problem, to use knowledge, to understand both concrete and abstract concepts to understand the relationships among objects, the relationship between things, events, and ideas, and to apply this understanding to use all of the above in solving the problem of everyday life. And this is what it's about. If you don't see a problem, how do you organize your intelligence to solve it? How do you know what information is necessary to acquire, to solve? How do you know what behavioral uh, orientations are necessary to solve the problem? One of the major problems I have, ladies and gentlemen, as I move around this lecture circuit, is trying to get our people to see that we have problems. Yes, no problem. Yes, no problem. Real problems. That our very lives are threatened as people. That our existence, our biological existence on this earth is in question. Serious question. It has been projected by the year 2000, 42% of the black population in the United States will have AIDS. That AIDS is running rapidly over the African continent. That is a problem. That problem must be solved. Not by white folk, but by black folk. Yes, sir. Now, once you recognize that that is a problem, you then begin to ask yourself, what kind of information must we gather to solve this problem appropriately? How must we organize our society? How must we organize the economic system? How must we organize the educational approach of our children? How must we organize the college and the university and so forth? How must we organize the hospital system? How must we organize the infrastructural road systems and other systems so that we can meet this challenge and survive as a people? That is what intelligence is about. Then you look, well, he has this information. She has that information. She has this skill. They have this skill. Then how do we coordinate this kind of thing? This money is available. How do we get this money and reroute it in this direction so we can solve this particular problem? But you got to first see the 
about. And many black people don't see the problem. Consequently, they don't develop the appropriate skills and abilities to solve the problem. They don't have that sense of urgency that makes them make those children go down to school and learn what they're supposed to learn. Because you know what? That law is going to take care of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to get into a thing I've been doing before in these other lectures. Maybe I'll come back and deal with you again on that. You know, this law of business. <laughs> it just, just moves total responsibility, you know, from us. Oh, we don't have to think and, and work and so forth. But some of you might have attended my lecture out of Rockdale and out in, um, in uh, New Jersey, so I've heard me deal with that issue before. When I used the book of Moses, Exodus, to show that even though the law that these was there, and even though these were the chosen people of God, they had to get out and fight their own battles. Yes. They had to study war. Right. They had to, to they had to practice government. Mm -hmm. They had to practice political science. They had to plan and organize and do all of these things, and yet they were disposed to be the, what? The chosen people. Right. You understand? Being the chosen people didn't mean that they couldn't uh, take the, their own uh, survival into their own hands. I talked about the situation where God told Moses, Moses sent some spies over into the land of Canaan mm -hmm. and, and to, to collect intelligence about the organization of this land. He didn't even promise them that land, did he? Remember? The promised land we always think about so much. Promise it to him. Say, we're going to give it to you now. But, you know, he just didn't do what? He just didn't hand it over to them, ladies and gentlemen. No. And so he comes to Moses and say, what? Moses, I want you to send people over there for 40 days to collect information and intelligence about this country, its fortifications, its designs, about its army, about its food its system, and the whole thing, and bring it back so that you can make your plans of war and so forth based on this information. Now he is this all-seeing God, this all-knowing God, telling them to do what? You get the information. When he could have just said, hey, here it is, this is the way it's laid out. I just went over there and smoked the people there. So walk on there and take it, children. He didn't do that, did he? And he's not going to do it for you. He didn't give you a brain. He didn't give you a mind so that you couldn't use it. And you could just lay back and lean on Jesus. No, that's not the way it's set up. You're going to have to use your mind. And you're going to have to fight your battles. And you're going to have to confront your enemies. And you're going to have to solve your problems. And you're going to have to study and work and struggle and suffer. When you were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, they told you you're going to have to earn it by the what? The sweat of your brow. Now you've got to sweat it out. That's what it's about. But we've got some people here who want to lay back. It's not work that way. you got to deal with it like it is. You've got to recognize that you have a problem. That's the first essence of intelligence. And then you've got to collect the relevant information and knowledge and the relevant mental strategies to solve those problems. Yeah. You're looking over here at Europe being reorganized. And ain't we happy all that freedom just flowing over there? <laughs> you know, this magazine came out, Newsweek, February 22nd, 1988, and you see the cover? The Pacific Century. And in this particular cover, of course, and of course, they are talking about will the next century belong to whom? The Asians. That's why it's called the Pacific Century. Is America in decline? And I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if America is in decline, you're in a hell of a shape. Hello. <laughs> because you know, there used to be a correlation between a decline in the price of cotton and the number of black people hung. Yeah, in the South, you know, as the cotton price went down, the number of black people sprung up to freeze went up. That's a hard fact of life, ladies and gentlemen. When this country declines in its economic power and so forth, you are going to be hung. I mean, literally. 
You know, and you have to understand that. That's why you got to know what's going on nationally and internationally. So this country went through this whole bit about the Asians. And you know, I often ask this question, are we to get out from under the foot of the white man only to fall under the foot of the Asian? Which is what it looks like is developing here. That is a problem. Your children have got to be educated to solve that problem. However, they cannot be educated unless you yourself are educated because it is adults who educate children. And you must then see your own education. The eighth, the Pacific century. But there's something mysterious going on here. Maybe the Europeans have decided that it's not going to be what? A Pacific century. Huh? Maybe they have seen this Japanese Asian situation developing and realized that they can no longer maintain their tribal problems. That they have to get over their divisions in Western Europe and cut out spending their money for uh, bombers and weapons and all this other garbage that is, has drained their talent and skewed their scientific orientation in such a way that they cannot commercially compete with the Japanese. So maybe they're recognizing now that it is time to end their tribal rivalries and reorganize the European continent in such a way that they can prevent the Asian century from taking over. Problem for African people in there. Now, we used to could play one Asian, uh, one European contingent against another. The Eastern European contingent against the Western European contingent. And fight our wars of liberation based on having to play one against the other. What happens when they are both on the same side? Huh? We got a problem here. You understand? It used to be that Eastern Europe was shut out of the World Bank and shut out of the IMF and the other places that our nations used to be. Now they are coming online and they are going to now hog the trough as well. Which means then the, the, the crumbs that the African nations used to get, they are no longer assured of getting in the future. You have a problem here. You understand? A major problem. And African people on the continent and in America must be prepared to solve that problem. And that means their educational system and their intellectual rules and approaches to life must be drastically changed. And the children must be educated to undertake the task that confront us as a people. You must understand that. So you are going to see before long, I would predict, East Germans in New York City taking your place. You see? Hungarians and all the other ones that don't, where well, they don't have any room for in Europe over here competing with you. Russian Jews and the other types coming in. You have to understand it's one thing to be for immigration and so forth, but you got you got to sit and think a little bit before you just open the doors and just let everybody flood in, particularly when everybody floods in over your back. And where your community is pointed out to as the greatest pickings in the world, you see. There's a problem there. What black men and women have been prepared to solve that problem? <clears throat> Both the mind and the electronic computer are information processing systems consisting of hardware and software. In other words, we get the information processing approach from the electronic computer. Computer hardware refers to the physical aspects of the machine. The key Software consists of the plans, uh, programmed instructions. In other words, the computer doesn't run by itself, does it? The, the computer, no matter how good, no matter how powerful, must be what? Programmed. It must be instructed. It must be organized to deal with the information that will be placed into it. And that information must be placed into it systematically so that it can be processed systematically. You know the common phrase, garbage in, garbage out. Information comes in the wrong way, you're going to get a wrong answer. So the software consists of the plans and programmed instructions that tell the machine how to organize, retrieve, and operate on the information it receives. The mind's 
physical machinery or hardware consists of the brain, nervous system, and sensory receptors. In other words, our senses are the things that take in the information. That's why we focus them. We call it attention or orientation. The first part of learning is the appropriate focusing of the sensory system to take in appropriate information and of closing out from the mind and rejecting irrelevant information. If you have no problems, if you have no questions, you don't know what is relevant or irrelevant. I tell my students this all the time. If you read this textbook and do not remember the ch chapter title, if you do not change the, the, uh, the headings into questions, you will go into the paragraphs not knowing what you're looking for. You won't know what to underline or not underline. All of these sentences have equal weight. You're in, you're in a quandary now because you must try to remember everything. You cannot categorize and classify and add weights to various bits and pieces of information and appropriately organize that information, which is one of the reasons now you are going to have problems on the exam. Because you did not approach your reading with what? Purpose. The world is filled with information. Information all over the place. Everywhere. All the time. There are so many things you can look at and notice right now. But because you came with a purpose, you are directing your sensory equipment. And that equipment now is picking up, and you have told it. I want you to pick up this information, store this information, and so forth, and it doesn't. But without purpose. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, looking is not seeing. Seeing is not merely an act of having your eyes open and allowing stimuli to fall upon your retinas. It's more than that. And Eskimo can, can differentiate over two dozen different types of snow on site. How many can you differentiate? Powders, flurry, or whatever. Why? And, he, and, and now, when you, if you were next to that Eskimo and he started pointing out all this impact, you could not what? See it. Even though your eyes are as good or better than his. Understand what I'm saying? In other words, the act of seeing is also an intellectual act. The act of seeing must be guided by a program, or else you don't know what to look for, and your eyes will not have the correct acuity and cannot differentiate the environment or the system you're looking at. Look at the difference between a trained biologist looking through a microscope and picking out all kinds of bodies and organelles and this and that in a, in a cell and then the student looking through it and seeing nothing but a gray mass of material there. How do you see that? And his eyes may be worse than yours in terms of their actual occurrence. But what? He has what? A program. A, a set of experiences. He has a motivational system. The Eskimo must see these different forms of life because of what? Because their life what? depends on it, you see? And when you connect things then to your survival, when you connect things to the enhancement of your life, to your empowerment, to your liberation, you are going to see a different world from the one you will see if you did not do these things. Right. Every state of consciousness carries with it a different organization of the world. You notice that? If you're into different things, you deal with different people. You see different sides of town. You get into different information. The world is created by consciousness. You see? So therefore, you have to have a plan. And this often then is missing. You will not see the information that you need to see if you don't see a problem or an issue to be dealt with. So you have the bourgeois Negro saying, I don't see it. <laughs> I don't see it that way. No, you can't see it. That's the nature of a 
attention. Attention and strong concentration literally blinds you to irrelevant things. You know? Even though those things may be right in front of your eyes. But since you're not looking for that particular thing at that particular moment, since you're emotionally hooked up in something else, in a sense you literally do not see it. You see? And consequently then, in order for us to be in the condition we're in, ladies and gentlemen, we must not be able to see the obvious. You understand? That's why I said earlier, we have to have a certain fundamental dumbness, blindness, even though we may be very well educated. Because that education is also an education into ignorance as well as knowledge. Because when you're focusing on one thing and learning one thing, you ignore another. And if you never focus on the things you ignore, you become what? Ignorant of those things. So therefore, in a sense, education is both a movement into knowledge and a movement into what? Ignorance. Understand? And when you let other people then define your problems for you, and define what you are attending to, the very educational process itself becomes one of making you ignorant. And white people depend upon our ignorance, whether educated or otherwise, to maintain their power over us. Yeah. Right. I'll speed on here, I guess we've reached the highway now. No, take Because babies can't talk and the whole bit. 
but very interestingly, uh, you can you can come to understand a great deal about babies without uh, the having to talk or to communicate one with the other. And you can pick up uh, many verifiable facts about um, the developmental characteristics of babies as early as one and two years uh, 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 days old. Infants like to look at new patterns more than at familiar ones. If they can tell the newborn, if they can tell the new from the old, they are demonstrating a visual recognition memory. In other words, we look at the baby's visual focus. What does the baby, what is the baby looking at? And we use its visual focusing uh, orientations to determine something about its memory capacities, you see. And its capacities to process information and take information in. Its capacities to compare and contrast information, you see. Because of the fact that a baby will look longer at a stimulus that is new to it than it will at one that is familiar. So consequently, if you project on that baby's retina or in that baby's sight a particular stimulus uh, repetitively, after a while the baby, like we all, will get tired of looking at it. It's what we call habituation. We'll say, well, I've seen this before. You know, same old thing, nothing interesting in it. It's not going to threaten me, it's no problem to me, so I can forget about that. And that's really the function of the human senses, by the way. The function of the human senses uh, is to detect change. You see, once the environment becomes unchanging and unthreatening, the senses, in a sense, uh, just sort of leave it alone. It's only those new things those unfamiliar things that pose a possible threat to survival. So consequently, uh, when you've gotten used to an environment uh, and, and the environment is constant, the senses and the senses just sort of shut down. But as soon as something changes over, they come right into action because there's a possible threat, there's a possible threat to survival. So you see this in the infant, in the earliest days and hours of life. Infants born five months ahead of time they have this capacity. So they bond with this thing and say, hey, new thing in town, let me check it out, see what's happening here, if this is a threat to me or not. This its ability then to, to uh, habituate and, and what we call dishabituate, that is when it sees a new uh, stimulus to react again and to win two stimuli, one which is familiar, one new is, is shown to it, to focus more on the new as against the old indicates then that it remembers the old, you see, and that it is performing comparative processes, you see, and things like that. So there are things going on that it has a memory capacity and it is using that memory capacity to orient its attention and orient its behavior. So then you see intelligence and the, the central issue of intelligence, adaptability, and the, the protection of, of oneself against threat operating at the very earliest stages of life. So in a sense, people often do not have the sense that they're born with. <laughs> yeah. In order for us to be in the condition we are in, we don't have the sense that we were born with. You literally have to be robbed of what we call common sense. You see, those senses have to be what? Perverted and converted. That's what happens. In theories, babies will look at uh, a new stimulus for a longer time than the one they remember having seen before. Babies that are likely to be below average in intelligence will remember fewer of the stimuli they have seen before. Isn't it interesting how you can use very simple paradigms to get it? Thing. It also indicates the immense value of the visual sense to what we call intelligence and how, how intricately and inextricably it is related to what we call intellectual functioning, you see, such that we can look at this infant's visual behavior and relate it to its vocabulary power later, later on in this year as well. But of course, isn't that what reading is about? Visual discrimination? 
the capacity to tell the difference between one letter and another, one word and another, and to process those differences into information and knowledge and to use that knowledge to solve problems. So should it come as a surprise that we can literally just flash a little spot of light on an infant's retina and get some sense of how that infant is going to behave later on in life? It's there, you see. We complicate matters, but it's there. Researchers at Albert Einstein College of Medicine found that a baby's performance at age four months and six months on a test of visual memory correlate with IQ at four and six years of age. The predictions are independent of the parent's education and income group, which are also correlated with IQ. The infant's test seemed to indicate that visual memory, which is already linked to IQ in later years, may be fundamentally tied to the workings of the mind. Visual memory may be a central aspect of intelligence from infancy onward. A very interesting situation sets up here, doesn't it? It is uh, indicated here. Because I have before me a book, not, not before me a book, but a piece of, uh, of an article taken from a book written by uh, Ising, those of you me with I think as a psychologist know that he is sort of in the Shockley school of psychologists relative to the intelligence of black children. And he has as a portion of this book uh, a schematic diagram that shows brainwave patterns. The idea that we can look at brainwave patterns and relate those brainwave patterns to what is called in this culture IQ. Okay? And we can look then at those patterns and use them to measure the, a person's intelligence as measured by the IQ test. It states here, brain waves resulting from a sudden stimulus. That is that flash of light and how, and what, of course what is happening here, you flash a dot of light onto the baby's retina. And of course that light, uh, that information is registered in the brain. And of course that registration of information and processing is picked up by an EEG system. So you can see how the brain reacts. We call this the evoked potential. In a sense, a reaction has been evoked in the brain, and we pick up that evoked reaction. And, and, and of course, the evoked reaction is presented as a type of wave form, you see, and with pipes and speak, uh, peaks. Brain waves resulting from a sudden stimulus, the waves are evoked potentials recorded on an electroencephalograph. And the score used is the wavelength of the first four waves to occur. Note that the wavelengths are shortest for the brightest and longest for the dullest subject. In other words, transmission of information is quick for bright and slow for dull subjects. Dangerous information now, ladies and gentlemen. And yeah. <laughs> he does a whole series of charts you have, sorry, you can't see them from here, where he correlates uh, the length of brainwave patterns with IQ. And, and he showed you the differences of various IQ levels and different brainwave patterns correlated with those IQ levels. That's very interesting. Let us quote from Jensen for a minute. It has been noted that the brainwave pattern in African newborn infants show greater maturity than is usually found in the European newborn child. This finding especially merits further study since there is evidence that the brain waves have some relationship to IQ and since at least one aspect of the brain waves, the visually evoked potential has a very significant genetic component showing a heritability of about 0.8. Do you understand what I'm getting at here? Yeah. What are we saying? When you check the EEG reaction of the black newborn child, that EEG reaction indicates that the black newborn child is born at a more advanced stage of intellectual development than is the European child. Do you understand what we're saying here? If you are going to measure the wavelength 
as a correlate of intelligence, then you would have to say that the black child is genetically more intelligent than the European. I'm using their information, yeah. not my own. And that's why you hear Jensen says it requires what? Further study. You notice the qualification here? There's a problem here. There's a problem here. Because when you look at this black child and study the EEG pattern, and since we have already noted that there's a correlation, and a strong correlation between the evoked, the, the visually evoked potential and IQ, and this black child's evoked potential is more advanced than the European ones, if you... ...books, military science books on how to fight battles. Had I had my own country, I would have wanted to be a general. But since we have no country, no need of me being a, a coal and power. But I've always been fascinated with the subject, and I've always studied the subject. And that subject is very important in your daily life. If you've never studied military science, tomorrow morning you should go to bookstores and pick up some books. I've given you before names of some books. One of them is The Art of War. All right? That's one of the great books, The Art of War. It should be studied by everybody. There shouldn't be a black man in here who has not read that book from cover to cover. Twice. That's right. The Art of War. Books on guerrilla warfare. That's right. Serious books, serious discipline. So this is why I like this particular speaker because a lot of people talk about a lot of other things and don't talk about military science. We need military scientists. Yo, I, kn I know they're after me. Good, good, good. But in the meantime, while they're planning on my demise, let us hear from our speaker for the night, Dr. Amos Wilson. Let's give him a big hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, 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 uh. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you kindly. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate your warm welcome. It's always a pleasure to be back here with you and to share this time and space with you. And certainly your emphasis there on uh, military science is quite appropriate. Uh, I found an interesting instance of, you know, in last week's I believe it's the, maybe the New York Times, to see that Sears Roebuck hired a general uh, to, to head its logistics right. department. In fact, I believe he was the general that was responsible for the logistics in the Middle East and Somalia. Uh, we often forget that there's a very definite relationship between business and military strategy. In fact, business and military strategy are one and the same. And that's one of the reasons why the Japanese and the Orientals are very good at their uh, economic strategy, because military science is a built-in part of their culture. And to a great extent, unlike Africans, whose warriorhood should have been transferred into business. The Japanese transferred Bushido and, and their warriors into the art of doing business. And they are still then at war with the Western nations. They never stopped. They just changed their tactics and hid their strategies under other guises. Ultimately, they will win the war against the West. 
the World War II wasn't nearly the end, ladies and gentlemen. It was only a battle. If you read the Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago, you would recognize that uh, that paper is already indicating that they expect, should nothing divert this course, that the Chinese economy, which is the fastest growing economy in the world today, the third largest economy in the world today, by the year 2020, 25, will be larger than the United States economy and the economy of Western Europe combined. And of course, you know, I've spoken to you on a number of occasions to try to get you to understand that our struggle is not just against European men, but our struggle is against any ethnic group that threatens to oppress us. European man is basically on his way out anyway, and we talked about that in the last session. And I've asked the question, are we to gain liberation from the Europeans, only to fall under another thousand years of oppressions from the Orientals? And the Orientals are going to be much more vicious than the Europeans. They don't have a liberal philosophy that you can use against them <laughs> and a constitution that you can throw at them. They don't have that liberal image that they try to protect like the white folk that you use to tie them up with. They owe you nothing. And I've warned before about us getting too carried away talking about people of color as if anyone who is non-white is our friend. That is a terrible, 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 terrible error. The Hispanics will be the largest minority in the United States in about 20 years. And you're going to learn what people of color are about. You're going to learn what we have been trying to teach you all the time. You're going to learn to stop trying to judge people based on your personal feelings. You see, we had this guy, Mother Bonnie, wrote some book here based on he and his wife living together. He's married to this white woman. Yeah. And I guess the idea was, <laughs> <laughs> I guess the idea was, I think the, the idea was if, if, if she and I can live together, you know, we can all live together. What a joke. This is nonsense. This is pure nonsense. It's pure nonsense. The relationship between peoples is not the relationship between a man and a woman, a man and his wife. No, not at all. And groups have no permanent friendships and permanent relations, as you've heard too often. They only have permanent interest. You are getting into a situation here as African Americans that Africans are in the world over. We are being isolated by other groups, by what I call the mercantile minorities. Those minorities who will be owners of business and property who, all of whom then will look at us who are propertyless as criminals and thieves, and who then will look at us as ones to be protected against, and will possibly all gang up against us in protecting their own mercantile and business interests. So you got to wake up talking about people of color. You must talk about only one people of color, and that's African people. I want to thank you for your generous response to our publication, The Falsification of African Consciousness. It's moving quite well, and your response has been quite, quite good. 
And here, of course, and uh, we appreciate your patronizing the publication because as I've indicated in other arenas, we do not make uh, personal gain from this. We, these books are used to pay the rent, to maintain our place, to lay a basis for future uh, pub uh, publication and development, and for the further training in terms of our community. So when you buy, you're supporting a program that we hope to expand in terms of community education, development, and otherwise. When I say we, of course, I've talked about Brother Sababu Plata, my partner, Sister Dorothy Lewis, works with us as well, Joe Gillians, who does the, the book covers for us, and uh, Robert Dobson, who's contributed to our publications in terms of, uh, in terms of finance and so forth, because we, we dig these things up from our pockets. We don't get grants and these other kind of things to help us forward. And it's this team, along with other friends, who have helped us to pump out these publications. Of course, the falsification of African consciousness deals with Eurocentric history, psychiatry, and the politics of white supremacy. Too many people look at history as some kind of uh, discipline dealing with dates and events. And they look at history as a way of celebrating heroes and so forth. And this society has turned us off to history. And many of us have made the statements, well, you know, I don't want to talk about black history or black power. I want to talk about green power. In the falsification of African consciousness, we try to demonstrate that money and power and economics are intimately related to history. You cannot take uh, away your history and separate yourself from your history and be involved in the earning of wealth and power and the development of power. If history were that unimportant, why is it that the other people have worked so hard to take it from you? Why is it that they work so hard to distort it and change it? They must be very apparent then that history is a key part of a people's culture and behavioral orientation. We demonstrate in that book how a loss of a, our sense of history has robbed us of a capacity to finance our own economic development as a people. Because the history of your people is not only a memorial to the great people in your past and so forth, but the history of your people is a history of techniques, methods of coping with problems and solving problems. The history of your people passes on to you the learned methods and techniques of dealing with various issues. So when you get to know your history and you get to know the anthropology of your people, you can use that history and anthropology to confront various problems you see, and you won't have to learn all over again and lose a lot of time. To a good extent, our loss of history in this, particularly as African Americans, has crippled us tremendously in many, many, many ways in terms of our family and in terms of economic development. These people that we call Koreans are using techniques for the financing of their businesses that Africans have been using for hundreds and thousands of years. Right. Hundreds and thousands of years. All right. The Koreans could not outfinance us as African Americans in the establishment of businesses in this country, except that we forgot how to finance businesses because we forgot what our forefathers taught us. It's not that we didn't have any money. We have plenty of money. But we don't know how to use it because we didn't look back into that history and say, how did our forefathers organize economic development? And of course, that's one of the reasons why the people robbed us of the history, so that they could 
take advantage of, of us economically and socially. Because I've said before, every, every characteristic that we may call uh, maladjustive in our personalities as a people, in our society as a people, has an economic function. If you would look at any characteristic that we, with which we describe ourselves in, a, in maladjustive terms, you can trace that trait back to economic advantage. You see? The fact that we, may, we have not been able to recall the means by which we save money as a people and finance business means that other people who remembered their historical techniques could establish businesses in our communities and take advantage of us. So then our amnesia, which is, from, is, is what we suffer from most of all, historical amnesia, works to the political, economic, and social advantage of all of those who exploit us. We talk about, of course, the technology of European Eurocentric psychology. We talk about the fact that if you are a so-called normal, law-abiding African person, in terms of the way those concepts are defined in this society, then you're out of your mind. What we call pathological normalcy. We talk about the fact that personality is not just a, it's not really a psychological concept. People think the concept of personality is psychological. Personality essentially is a political and economic concept, you see. Because when you look at personality as an organized system of desires and wishes, values and hopes and needs and motives, which when the person seeks to satisfy them, they consume things. You will note then that the things we consume to satisfy our personal needs are those things sold to us by the people who created the needs in us to begin with. You see, you have to understand that. And so by creating a so-called normal personality in black folk, we have had a personality infused in us such that when we behave normally, we work against our very best interest as a people. And that's why Eurocentric psychiatry has to be re-examined and completely restructured and destroyed and replaced by an African-centered psychology. Yes. Identity is a political economic concept. If you had the correct African-centered identity, the Koreans wouldn't be in the midst of your neighborhoods today. That's right. Because people consume, we buy, mainly as a way to affirm who we are and who we think we are. So when you let another people impose an image on you and you accept the image that they impose on you, then you go out to consume to maintain that image. Then in consumption, you are going to maintain their power over you. So you must understand then when we talk about an identity, it is not merely a matter of race pride. It involves at its depths economics and political behavior and everything else. So when you say you're black or when you say you're African, that means that we expect a certain system of behaviors from you such that they are supportive of African peoples and African ends. We're going to come back to that shortly. 
So we want you to continue to buy the falsification of African consciousness. This is a body of works that I'm trying to get out of here before we do some other things. We, uh, before we move together with Brother Maddox into the stage of organization. But we're trying to get a body of work so we can base our organization around a set of literature. We got a large volume coming out here at the back end of November, the first part of December, Blueprint for Black Power. We finally finished it, <laughs> four or 500 pages. We might give it to you in two volumes so you won't uh, have to take it all at once. But in that book, we are going to lay out chapter and verse, the means by which we can gain real power in America and in the world. We're going to discuss the forms of power, the bases of power. We're going to talk about culture and power, family and power, religious institutions and power, and that whole bit. And then we're going to go line by line in terms of the various means by which we can develop cultural institutions, economic institutions that empower us as a people. So that after this, the black nationalists at least will not be accused of just doing analysis only. Because the recipe will be there. And from this point on, then, if you don't do anything, it won't be because you didn't know and you don't have the means, but you just don't want to, which is what I think is the problem anyway. But we like to hide behind, you know, you're just giving us analysis, you see. But frankly, the answer is in the analysis, if you listen well enough. And I try to advise people who are doing work Try to frame your analysis in such a way that it has a program in it. That when you get through, there's a program built right into the results and right into the approach, you see. And that's the reason why you have to form meaningful questions from the very beginning. And you have to, you have to, you have to go into your analysis with the idea that you are looking toward a solution. While there are many true approaches uh, to a problem and, and, and many pro approaches that may explain a problem, not all approaches are equally practical for solving the problem. While you can say that racism exists in America because white folk don't love us, what kind of program is there? That means now you're going to preach forever trying to get them to love you an impractical problem, an impractical analysis. While you might say that whites dominate us because they have recessive genes, or because they have a penis envy, a color envy, you know, whatever you want to call it, that's true. There's no problem with that. There's no problem with that, except what kind of program does that imply that you recess your genes? That you cut off an inch or two? <laughs> that you bleach yourself? It's a perfect and it's a great answer, but you got to get a what? A programmable answer. One that can be translated into real programs. But in the way, we hope you'll be able to pick that up later on, Blueprint for Black Power, and of course followed by the uh, main book also on educating African children for the 21st century, which has already been written, but we just got to edit it, where we will go into the whole African Senate approach to education. Tonight I want to talk a bit about the crisis of leadership and look at this crisis. Some of you, no doubt, saw uh, last week's gathering of black leaders, Farrakhan, Jesse Jackson, I believe it was, 
uh, the Black Caucus, and some others, and I'm sure it brought tears to your eyes. But you have to understand, you know, it takes more than unity to win. Again, you've got to unify around a workable strategy, around a workable program. Unity is important, but, and, and it is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Who is being co-opted? Farrakhan or Jesse Jackson? Is Jesse moving closer to the nationalist position or is Farrakhan moving closer to the assimilationist position? Can these two types of leaderships really be merged? Or are they fundamentally and in many ways mutually exclusive in terms of their approach to the problems of black people? We have to think about that, you see. It's not enough to uh, hug and embrace on, on the stage. When Chavis says that he is now concerned with the economic problems of black folk, does he mean the same thing that Farrakhan means or someone else means when they say they're concerned about the economic problems of black folk? And why is the thrust of the NAACP on economics at this late day in history? Do we have a group trying to take over a nationalist theme and use it to maintain itself and bring itself back to relevance and life? We have to look at this, ladies and gentlemen. When I look at this kind of meeting, I'm sort of reminded of a phrase that Frederick Douglass used when he was brought in to head the uh, Freedmen's Bureau after it had been corrupted and basically destroyed. And I think the phrase was something like, it was like marrying a corpse. The embracing of moribund and dying organizations is pretty much a similar situation. And some organizations deserve to die a peaceful death. It's an interesting game. Some of you heard this New York Times editorial, right? How many managed to read that editorial concerning that caucus meeting? Let me just take up a little time here to sort of read this little piece to you. It was very interesting. It came out last Saturday. The Black Caucus Gets Mugged, it's just psycholinguistics. <laughs> black, black and mugged, you know. Yeah, you know, the Black Caucus Gets Mugged. Shows you again, it's very subtle use of terms. Why mugged, you see? A game being played here with words by the venerable New York Times. In the days ahead, the Congressional Black Caucus may find itself in an advantageous position what, it, what do you call that? Bill you up to tear you down? Right. In a Congress riven with discord over NAFTA, the economy, and other issues, the Black Caucus counts 39 votes in the House and one in a Senate often, uh, that often produces squeaker votes. And we know many of the bills that uh, Clinton uh, gets through the Senate often are uh, passed by just one vote. Right. So this one black person has a quote unquote power there. So they're admitting this. You got 39 blacks in the Congress, one in the Senate, and in a situation where votes now tend to be very narrow, they have an additional influence on legislative outcomes, which means that we as the New York Times are concerned about how they play ball. But the Black Caucus's chairman, Kwesi Mifumi, Democrat of Maryland, seems not to understand the uses of power. So now we take them to the, to the woodshed here. <laughs> we don't understand the uses of power. When Mr. Mifumi embraced Louis Farrakhan last week in Washington, he temporarily lost the savvy he has shown while legislating and behaved like a novice. His arrogance never ends. Mr. Mifumi was had. 
So was the Black Caucus. The occasion for this mugging was the caucus's annual legislative meeting, specifically a panel on race and politics at the Washington Convention Center. The participants included Mr. Mafumi, Mr. Farrakhan, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, and Benjamin Chavis of the NAACP. Mr. Farrakhan's presence was an invitation to trouble. So get the signal. Given his previous anti-Semitic railings, and especially his description of Judaism as a gutter religion, and never let it go. But this is the nature of power. When you got a stick in your hand that you can use against someone, you don't turn it loose. Mr. Mufumi declared a detente between the caucus and the black Muslim, among others. I wonder who the others are here. <laughs> no longer will we allow people to divide us, he said, adding that such a union was needed to bring about change. Let me put this in quotes. Some say Mr. Mufumi, who only recently abandoned radical for mainstream politics, was caught up in the moment and broached the issue without consulting the caucus. So you know what's going on here, right? Some Negroes have run back to the white folk. And said, so, hey, look, 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 he was just getting, he got carried away. He, they, we didn't give him permission to say this. <laughs> so you can see the old game goes on right at the, the so-called high level of power. He got carried away. And he didn't have our permission. <laughs> so don't look at us. And of course, the Times, in its magisterial and fraternal way, says, perhaps. But his conduct suggests a misconception about what con constitutes genuine leadership and whence its power flows. <laughs> you know, don't forget where your power comes from. The members of the Black Caucus were given mandates and missions by the voters who sent them to Washington. They have a real political foundation of voters who expect change, in quotes, all right, but expect it in legislation that will benefit them. It's reasonable for the caucus to reach out, but Mr. Mufumi and his duly elected colleagues needn't be threatened or guilt-tripped into sharing platforms with people without portfolio who would soon drop from sight if the press ceased to cover them. So the old thing, the old game, we make leaders. And so if we stop covering him, he will cease to exist. Isn't this an arrogance here? As if Farrakhan and other people came into existence as a result of coverage by the New York Times. Or if the Black Caucus ceased to invite them to conferences, Mr. Mufume diluted his hard-won authority of office by extending it to a freelance rhetorician well known as a hater. The caucus gets only bad karma. They must know our people. <laughs> they know we respond to spiritual words, right? Bad karma and negative publicity in return. That's a political mugging, pure and simple. The chairman of the Black Caucus ought to know better. Perhaps his membership can teach him. Okay, that's the woodshed there. Telling these other caucus members what? Yes, you better go and teach him something. This points to a crisis of black leadership. When these people some look up to as leaders are being chastised by paternalistic white newspapers. And when the white press still thinks that it has the capacity to determine who will be called a black leader and recognized as a black leader. It speaks to an issue of long standing, this issue of a leadership crisis. And we solved this crisis in the politics of Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, and Marcus Garvey. Washington and his de-emphasis of political power and insistence on civil rights and higher education 
in pursuit of industrial education, accumulation of wealth, and the conciliation with the South. And of course, Du Bois, with his emphasis on rights to vote, civic equality, and education of youth according to ability. Douglas, with his extreme assimilationism, married to his white wife, believing that the ultimate goal of African people was to amalgamate and assimilate biologically with whites, who, after his marriage, attacked race pride and attacked racial solidarity and attacked what he called economic chauvinism. And of course, Marcus Garvey, with his pursuit of economic chauvinism, race, history, and culture, and African liberation. We often get carried away sometimes in trying to an analyze the conflicts between Washington and Du Bois, and, so, and particularly do we get carried away when we talk about Du Bois's talented tenth. But I think before we start name calling and categorizing, because both these men, men, Washington and Du Bois, are quite complex men. They do not easily fit into categories. You do have to face the question, is Washington such an Uncle Tom, or is he really being diplomatic? Is he playing a game? And there's some evidence that a game was being played. While he was in an apparent struggle with Du Bois over the issue of uh, civil rights and the issues, let us say, of voting publicly, he often, using his own personal finances, contributed to those struggling to maintain voting rights for blacks in the South. This is not necessarily to resuscitate his image and his accommodationism, but it is just merely to caution us sometimes not to too rapidly judge the character of uh, these people based on simplistic categories. Du Bois, of course, was exceedingly complex as a person and changed a great deal over his long lifetime. Du Bois came to repudiate to a good degree, uh, to a significant degree, the concept of the talented tenth. We rarely hear about that, though. But if you read his uh, dusk, The Dusk of Dawn, you will see it right there. And he admits the error in that thought. He admits that this black middle class that he hoped would be committed to the race and would be put race first was, was non-nationalistic. Du Bois was very committed also to African pride and race pride and consistently did research in terms of, of African history and uh, in terms of what we would call today Afrocentricity. But this is often looked over by those who are too quick to put him in the Boulay class and other kinds of simplistic categories. When you look at Du Bois, you will see often his changes reflecting the changes in America. Du Bois is first and foremost a thinker and an observer and an analyst. And he's constantly looking at the realities of, of Africans in America and he shifts his visions and is not afraid to change his mind and go against his prior opinions when that reality suggests that those opinions were wrong. As he moved through his life then, you see him coming much closer to the Book of Washington economic program. Again, you can verify this by reading Dusk of Dunn, where he suggests a separate economy for African American people, where he suggests a voluntary economy, where he deals with the fact that blacks are segregated and will stay segregated for decades. And therefore, they should take advantage of that fact and use it to their political and economic advantage. This is very clear and stated. He talks about an, uh, 
a commonwealth, what he calls a, an economic cooperative commonwealth that blacks would have to use a corporate approach, cooperative approach, to economic development. He even sees that as a result of our economic struggle to gain control over our internal markets as African people, that we will receive resistance from other groups. And he talks about it very clearly. Many forget that Du Bois resigned, and, 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 and really the word was, was kicked out of the NAACP in 1934. And he was kicked out essentially over the very issue of economics. When he charged that organization with not having an economic and a full social program for African people. In fact, he states in one of his statements here very clearly that when he critiques the NAACP, when he talks about them as being a protest organization and insistently demanding equality and equal right to work and so forth, and dealing in moral suasion and propaganda and possibly even physical resistance, and he says, this is good. There are, however, manifest difficulties about such a program. First of all, it is not a program that envisages any direct action of Negroes for the uplift of their socially depressed masses. In the very conception of the program, such work is to be attended by the nation, and Negroes are to be the subjects of uplift forces and agencies to the extent of their numbers and need. Another difficulty is that the effective organization of this plan of protests and agitation involves a large degree of inner union and agreement among Negroes. What is he saying here is, what you're doing as an organization in NAACP is that you're leaving black folks to be the subject of government agencies and to be the subject of other people. And this is not a correct program. You do not have a program by means of which black people uplift themselves through their own strength and power and resources. And therefore, this is a program doomed for failure. He asked them to confront the issues of the fact that blacks were in segregated schools. And what are we going to do about that? How are we going to improve these schools and work with these schools as they are and change them in our best interest? Instead of, as I will talk about later, living these dreams of the NAACP about some future integrated society. In his letter of resignation, he states, today this organization, referring to the NAACP, which has been great and effective for nearly a quarter of a century, finds itself in a time of crisis and change without a program, without effective organization, without executive officers who have either the ability or disposition to guide the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in the right direction. We can literally say the same thing about the NAACP when? Today. So more than classifying Du Bois or classifying Washington, I think it would be far more productive for us to look at the issues that Du Bois and Washington and the others were dealing with, and that was the issue of the crisis of leadership in the black community. Instead of looking at the talented tit merely as some elitist approach to the solution of black problems, we must look at it within the context of people who were struggling to find some leadership uh, structure that would resolve the issues which confront black people, one of which might have been the use of a talented group, another which may have been the use uh, of uh, the emphasis on economic development, you see. So I think before we get lost in classifying and categorizing, we should deal with the real issue and that issue is that there is a crisis of leadership in the African-American community, and this crisis of leadership has been going on now for well over 80 years. So as early as 
the 1900s and the late 1800s, blacks were wrestling over the issue of the appropriateness of leadership. Du Bois in, in resigning and, in, and getting kicked out of the NAACP, he's dealing with the fact that it is during the Depression and that he is looking at this organization and the crisis that the NAACP is experiencing is the fact that it has no economic program to meet the needs of the starving black people during that depression. It was without program. It had permitted Jews and other white liberals to infiltrate its organization and impose what Harold Cruz calls non-economic liberalism on them as the central part of their program. A program that did not in any way deal directly with the economic issues facing the black community. And so, yes, still here, still the problem. We are faced exactly with the same situation today. As the American system was undergoing restructuring during the Great Depression, as capitalism, American capitalism, was basically on its deathbed, black people and the leadership of black people faced a major crisis. And just as Roosevelt saved capitalism through the socialistic programs of the New Deal, the NAACP was saved for for a change. But today we are still faced with the same issue. Now we are undergoing another major restructuring of the American economic system, a major restructuring of the global economic system. And now we are faced again with an organization which is supposed to be our premier leadership organization that has no economic plan, no program, has not even yet written one or talked about one except to throw out a word or two that we are going to be concerned about the economics of black folk. Mm -hmm. That now is raising $100 million to try to wake up its corpse. If you read the other day, Reginald Lewis willed them $2 million. And they are in the process of raising $100 million so that they can continue to impose their destructive leadership on black people in America. We have to watch this kind of thing. We have to come back to this. So what does he mean? And we got a bunch of people running to Africa, sponsored by corporations, having an economic summit in Africa when they have yet to have one in the United States. For the key to economic development on that continent is right here on this one. But we have a leadership that finds it easier to lead and deal with, with far away problems and issues rather than to deal with the ones right here at home. This is a major issue. Why are we faced with these same problems again and again? Why do they never end? Because, ladies and gentlemen, ultimately the problem is not an economic problem so much as it is the problem of white domination of African people. That's the issue. This is the reason why I tell people you must study the psychology of domination even before you study the psychology of racism. Because racism is just a species, a subclass of domination. It is merely a rational, a rationalizing of the domination of one race by another. You must recognize then that domination is a problem, particularly for the dominated, and that the, dominate, the dominant dominate because it is to their what? Benefit to do so, because they benefit from it. 
which means then that they benefit from the problems of the dominated. It's the problems of African people that are productive and beneficial for those who dominate us. Consequently, they must never release us from our problems because our problems are so profitable for them. This is what you got to keep in mind. No, the essence of domination is that the dominated must be made to do what? Work against their best interest. Or otherwise, what is the point? You're not brought under domination to work for what? Your own best interest. You're dominated to work in the best interest of those that dominate you. So to be dominated means, if you're not aware and awake and alive and conscious, that you're going to work against your own best interest as a people. And that means then as long as domination continues, the problems generated by domination will continue. And even when one problem uh, invented or created by domination appears to have been solved, what is going to happen? Another will arise. Or the same problem will take what? A different form. So if it was the Great Depression in the late 20s and in the 30s, it's called global uh, restructuring in the 1990s. But all in all, it means the same thing, being out of job, out of work, homeless, and in the street, no matter how you describe it. Because the other people who dominate the system are going to shed you first before they shed themselves or anyone else. And the game continues. Which ultimately means then, ladies and gentlemen, any solid black leadership must see the overthrow of the domination of whites as the ultimate solution. It must see the destruction of white supremacy and the disempowering of the white man as one of its major goals. Otherwise, you'll never get out of it. And one day, if he sees that the ultimate benefit to himself lies in the total death and destruction of African people, then he's going to kill you dead. And if you look at the history of the European, he does not feed useless people for long. The Indian, the Native American, was wiped out on this continent because to a great extent he was of little or no economic use to the European. No amount of love, no amount of constitutional rules and laws will prevent this from happening to African people. We have to come alive to that fact. And African people are becoming economically useless the world over. When they finally stabilize this old shaky Soviet Union, who has mineral wealth that rivals that of the African continent, that's already now dumping metals and minerals and so forth on the world markets and depressing those prices at this point. When they bring that country online, will the African continent even be able to survive by selling its raw materials? That's a major problem. The sellout of Nelson Mandela. Oh. Yes, it's a bourgeois leadership. You may as well face the reality of it. The day in Nelson Mandela is a condition of leaving prison. Promised those whites that their properties would not be nationalized and would not be taken back and redistributed among the natives of South Africa. The game was up then. 
Yes, you may as well face the reality. And we have this kind of situation all over the continent of Africa. Where the original, yes, and it's a joke to talk about Namibia being liberated with 75% of its most arable land still owned by whites, with this wealth being owned by whites. What kind of liberation are you talking about? When you look at Zimbabwe that negotiated a so-called treaty or, or independence, and the white has promised them that after 10 years, they would turn the land loose. And when the 10 years were up, the other white nations said, hey, forget about it. And now the African farmers and other people are still without land. Ladies and gentlemen, you gotta learn that you gotta fight a war to the death. You gotta fight a war until your enemy surrenders so that you can dictate the terms. If you fight a war and then you've got to sit at the table and really go through negotiations, you have not won. Now, if you can't dictate the terms of peace, you have not won the war. You see? And we got a lot of that kind of stuff going on in the African situation today. Yes, all over. Because the African situation is, is worldwide. It doesn't matter where you are. The same politics that in here is in America, in here is in Africa, Central South America, everywhere, it's, it's the same game. Because you have the same what? Domination. Yeah, the domination is global. So you have the same kind of problems. You see, and you have to face that as a reality. If this nation, this South African so-called nation, leaves intact the white ownership of property and so forth, it's going to change the whole of that continent because that nation will become the economic engine of the continent. And the African nations on the rest of the continent will trade with it and in many ways become economically associated and dependent on it, which will pre pre uh, permit then an even deeper penetration by whites and others into the continent as a whole under the bogus title of a multiracial society. You have to wake up. You cannot let any leader become a sacred cow to the point where you forget how to perform a realistic analysis on the situation. Because ultimately, it is your individual lives and the life of our people that is a question here, not the glory and power of an individual person or leader, but of the people themselves. And so we see this crisis of leadership all over the place. And it is time now for us to move toward its resolution. I think we are in a better position at this point because unlike Du Bois and, and Washington and the others who were in a sense at the front end of these issues, we have had now 80, 90 years to see what happened. We can measure results. Therefore, we can take an empirical approach, an empirical analysis, an analysis based on experiment, an analysis based on actual experience, an analysis that looks at the NAAC program, WACP's program, and look at the results, that looks at the programs of other leaders and look at the results that they brought. So we don't have to guess, and we don't have to be quite as theoretical as we used to be. We can say, let's see what the results bear out. And let's see if this form of leadership can be justified any longer based on its results. And this is what we have to measure. An interesting case, we'll be back to him shortly. To a great extent then, we're going to have to look at the issue of power a word that we've been taught as people to avoid right. and to think is immoral. That's right. And it is a pity That's that right. we've been led in this direction. Right. Because, ladies and gentlemen, power is the crucial measure right. of the effectiveness of leadership right. as to whether that leadership empowers the people. That's right. 
because we have to recognize that the primary source of the host of problems that confront African people the world over and in America is powerlessness. Yes. Yes. We are suffering from not using our potential as a people. Yes. Powerlessness. If we were able to create jobs, but able is the essence of what? Power. To be able what? To. The ability to. You see, power is created in terms of resistance. The ability to move against resistance. To expend energy and to focus energy in changing circumstances in terms of one's own benefit. This is what power is about. Power is necessary to all living things. It is the essence of life. If you do not have any power, you are not alive. That's right. It takes power for you to chew your food. It takes power for you to digest it, to convert it into to nutrients so that you may continue to survive. It takes power for you to stand up against the resistance of gravitation. It takes power for you to earn the living from the earth and everything else. You have to have what? Ability. You have to be able to do things, those things necessary to maintain life. You've seen people, sometimes unfortunate people, like some of the children in Somalia and people in Somalia who do not even have the power to chew and who must die unless they're intravenously fed because they no longer have the power to even masticate the food in their mouths or to, to, just, to, to uh, digest it. There is no life without power. And therefore, the pursuit of power is necessary for the pursuit of life and for maintaining the viability of life. So don't let anyone deceive you into thinking that there's virtue in powerlessness. And just as power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, powerlessness corrupts and also corrupts absolutely. A lot of the corruption that you see out on these streets the shooting and the killing and the selling of drugs and so forth, the muggings, the stealings, the robberies and all of this is a result of powerlessness right. and powerlessness corrupting a people and corrupting a culture. Yes, creating terror and horror in our communities because we are not able we have not empowered ourselves to provide our young people with what? Jobs and alternatives to mugging, to robbing, to stealing, to terrorizing. Look at the difference between those, in terms of crime, between those groups who own property, who have a control over economic resources and so forth, who, who exercise political power and economic power, in this society and those of us who do not. And you can see immediately then that the power itself, the powerlessness itself becomes a source, therefore, of corruption. And therefore, if we are to change the nature of our system, we must change from powerlessness to power. And ultimately, though, social power comes out of the relationship among people and persons. Social power is, in essence, collective. We have to keep that in mind, because we, we normally think of individuals as powerful. But individuals gain their power from being backed up by a powerful group. That's right. Yes. Individual whites are not powerful. That's right. What power they possess or seem to possess is because they represent the power of their group. The individual cannot be separated from his or her group. In fact, the individual is a social creation to begin with. The individual cannot exist in a vacuum. 
You have a language that you share with millions of other people. You have attitudes, appetites, and all of these other things that are the result of your doing what? Living socially among another group of people. You have desires and so forth that have not only been generated from your social interaction with other people and living in a social system, but desires and wishes that can only be satisfied by that social system. You cannot satisfy them all by yourself at all. And yet we are deceived in this country talking about what? Individualism, as if all people can be an island unto themselves and yet meet their every need, other people. So ultimately, social power is in essence collective and it involves two essentials. Intentionality, which we, by which we mean purpose and motive, and resources. When people have intentions, motives, and purpose, and they bring resources to bear in their situation to solve a particular problem. One of the things that we are dealing with then in this community that we're dealing with in our volume on Blueprint for Black Power is the fact that black people in America have tremendous resources. I talk about in this book the fact that we are a nation of people who are from 10 to 80 percent of the population of 117 of America's largest cities. We have 50 to 60 cities of which we are essentially about 50 percent of the population of those cities, above 100,000. We are the majority population in about 17 of those cities. And those cities are scattered across this country. They are connected by highways, roads of all type, railways, riverways, air, air routes, all types of things, all of the things necessary for a nation to function, we have available to us. Fax machines, telephones, all of this we have as African people. And we have what? Money. W.E. Du Bois stated very clearly in the dusk of dawn that if black people could get only a fraction of their internal market, their influence on the economic and political life of themselves and America would be decisive. Now, when I first looked at that statement, I thought it was an exaggeration until I started analyzing the figures. And we started working with the figures. We're talking about a people who earn over $300 billion. Yes. But recognize, as I've told you before, the issue is not so much what you earn, but what? What you produce. Because you get paid only a fraction of what you produce. So if we're getting paid $300 billion, we must be producing well over a trillion or more dollars as a people. Yes. And yet we have a business section that only collects about $20 billion as African people. That means African people in America are spending over $300 billion, and the total receipt of black businesses amount only to $20 billion. But you see, I'm an optimist. I don't ask, is the glass half empty? I say it's what? It's half full. And I recognize that oaks from acorns grow. And I recognize then that that means that African people are spending less than five cents with black businesses. And that says then if we are spending less than five cents with black businesses and yet we are providing them with $20 billion, what if we spent 10 cents out of every consumer dollar? An additional five cents of spending out of each dollar as black people would amount to a total receipt and earnings by black businesses of, a, of approximately $60 billion. I didn't say $40 billion, I said $60 billion because when you buy into a business, it uses the income also for what? Investment. Therefore, it multiplies what it takes in. So if we got you up to 15 cents out of a dollar, then we're headed well towards 75 billion. We've only asked you for 15 cents. You can give your 85 cents to the white boy. 
If we get you up to 20 cent and 25 cent, we got now black business pass what? 100 billion and headed toward 150 billion. What would happen if we got you up to 30 cent? You can still give white folks what? 70 cent. You can feel happy. You can say I'm multicultural. We don't even ask you to be black and African, you know. We, we, we're not asking you for your whole dollar. I'm telling nationalists now we have to change our language. Maybe we just say, look, just spend a dime. That's all. All we want to ask you to do is this. If you make $30,000 a year, pledge $3,000 to a black business. Okay? And if you do that, you're going to see black business transform itself overnight. Just with that. And we look at these other figures, ladies and gentlemen. You won't believe what possibilities we have as people. We have the talent, we have the skills, we have the whole thing, but we are missing the program. We're missing the leadership. We're missing the sense of purpose. And without the sense of purpose and with the resources, we are not going to be empowered. And the sense of mission is of key importance to bringing about power. And that sense of mission, though, has not been established by our leadership. And since it has not, it has placed us in danger. Let's look at this cry for leadership among our people because our people see something here. Forty years at the United States Supreme Court outlawed segregation of the races in America's schools, supposedly in the interest of providing equal education through racial integration, the majority of black students find themselves in hyper-segregated urban ghetto schools, entrapped in an educational system that is in severe crisis and imminent danger of total collapse. We've had an experiment, ladies and gentlemen. The Supreme Court decision has been made. The busing has taken place. The surrounding of schools and shipping our students out has taken place. What is the condition of our people today? Hypersegregated in the midst of the, in, in, in the midst of our urban ghettos. So the issue Du Bois raised early in the in this whole organizational career was what? What are you going to do about the people who are not in white schools? What are you going to do about the fact that the people are not integrated? Are they then to be made to sit around and wait for this great millennial era when all people shall be living together, black boys and white girls and all that other kind of stuff? Or must we see about the needs of our people right now? Forty years that the blacks in Montgomery, Alabama won the, ride, the right to ride in the front of the bus, blacks in urban America are virtually the only ones, along with other forlorn minorities, riding the buses. I tell you, the white man gives you what you want with the vengeance. He tells you, you say you want to ride in the front? Good, I'll give you the whole bus. And so now you're the only one riding it. You got the front, the back, and the sides all to yourself. He's got his own express buses and other means of getting into the city. This is 40 years of, what is this now, 55? It's now not near 95. So the issue of riding in front of the bus has not been solved in the way you thought it would be, did it? 30 years after gaining the right to vote, having benefited from the passage of the Civil Rights Bill, the Voting Rights Act of 1964-65, blacks in urban America, you see, can vote for black politicians who cannot improve their plight and can vote for the President of the United States. The only problem being that the big cities where blacks predominate are no longer important as the suburbs in electing the President. In other words, so you see, before we became, became majorities in the United States, it was the big cities and the big city mayors and so forth that determined the presidential candidates and determined who would be President. As soon as you got the vote, The strength of the vote now is in the suburbs. And presidents now can be elected on suburban white votes. And therefore, the presidential candidates need no longer pay much attention to urban black votes. 
which is one of the reasons why then both Democrats and Republicans run hard during their campaigns against black people and the interests of black people. The only way they can maintain office and gain office is by running against black images, against Willie Hortons, against so-called crime and the other things because that's the way they're going to get white suburban votes, people who are not even really being threatened by black crime because it is black people in black cities who are the major victims of black on black violence. However, that violence is used to frighten white folk in electing presidents and other national and state officers. 20 years after passing the fair housing legislation, blacks are hyper-segregated in urban ghettos and in suburban uh, neighborhoods. Worse still, many blacks are homeless, sleeping on the sidewalks, on the bridges, and in abandoned buildings. If you would read this month's Emerge magazine based uh, on an article based on a very interesting book called Apartheid USA, you would read a startling statement that says a black family that earns $50,000 has less choices of where it will live and how it will live than a Hispanic who earns $2,500. So where's your fair housing? What it has it gained you? Blacks are more segregated today than we were in 1920 and in 1940. The whole movement of the demographics of America is to isolate black people totally in the urban ghettos and in the, in the suburbs as well. And yet you brag about your fair housing laws. Yes, look at the reality of the situation. Look at the organizations that led these kind of campaigns. Look at the leadership that told us that this kinds of, these kinds of legislation would rescue us and make us hold hands with little black boys and little black girls. Where are we today? And what are our circumstances? 20 years after passing this law, we are in more trouble than ever. After 25 years of affirmative action, Blacks find themselves kicked out of corporate America, find themselves with the highest unemployment rates drifting into poverty ever more rapidly, while other ethnic groups gain employment ever more swiftly. And we find ourselves begging for handouts on the streets of America. If you read a detailed analysis in the Wall Street Journal last week, two full pages and a full column saying what? Losing ground. Blacks, the only group That's right. that suffered a total loss of employment right. during the recession. This is your affirmative action for you. Blacks who were 10, 15% of the working staffs of many corporations suffered 20, 30, 40, almost 50% of the cuts in jobs. During 90 and 91, when 60,000 blacks lost their jobs in American corporations, 60,000 Asians moved into jobs in American corporations. 55,000 Hispanics moved into jobs in American corporations. Where is your people of color? Where are these people every time they stand up? They say, black and Latino. And yet we don't hear a word coming the other way. Yes, the white man does gives you what you want with the vengeance. He says, you want it, I'll give it to you. You want affirmative action, we'll make everybody a minority. We'll bring the white women in on it. We'll bring all the other ethnics in on it. We'll lay a game on you called diversity in the workplace, and you'll fall for it. And then they will say, well, since we've got to hire all these other groups, we have to cut back on the number of people that we hire from you. Now, you can't object to us hiring Hispanics and Asians, can you? <laughs> the most interesting thing about this situation, ladies and gentlemen, 
is that while we are flowing out of American corporations and black blue-collar workers are suffering great losses with other ethnic groups gaining, this is at the very point where some 60 black people, distinguished Negro leaders, sit on nearly 170 corporate boards. Yes. People such as Vernon Jordan sits on 10 and earns $500,000 a year from just having his name on the boards. Okay? Did you read the piece last week? He's uh, Clinton's favorite guy. Yeah. When Clinton wants to have fun, he calls Vernon. They play golf and go on the yacht together and... You know, and, and he, he runs interference for Clinton, and you know, they're just good old buddies. Even his law firm says, we didn't hire uh, Jordan for his legal talents. <laughs> they just said it out front. His, his, his role is to play golf and play around. Yes, he wouldn't take an offer to be attorney general because he could have more clout sitting in the position that he's in. And the other civil rights organizations are wondering, say, Vernon, when are you going to give us a break? When are you going to act in the interests of black folk? He said, but I'm out of the civil rights game now. So we have, so isn't it a paradox then that at the very point where we are being kicked out of America's corporations, we have blacks sitting on America's corporate boards, some sitting on five and six and as many as ten. Is that the reason perhaps we don't hear about the losses that we are suffering? Uh -oh. Is the situation one that by appointing these token Negroes to these boards, we will no longer complain? Or they have had their mouths shut so that they no longer complain right. about our not being there, ladies and gentlemen? Right. This is the result of affirmative action, the result of assimilationist program. Mm. 25 years. After the initiation of black capitalism, blacks find their communities' markets dominated by aliens. Black business persons find they can't do business in America, nor with America. After 40 years of being America's moral conscience, as a lot of Negroes like to brag about, blacks find their communities being devastated by immorality. After preaching brotherly love and race transcending love, they find themselves to be the most hated of races. For blacks in America, 30 years after having the ringing words, free at last, free at last, thank God almighty I'm free at last, America has become even more of a prison, sealing their bodies, hopes, and aspirations in the dungeons of despair. For African Americans all over, for African Americans, all the promises of the civil rights era have been betrayed. Everything has been reversed. The more black elected officials have been elected, the worse off the black electorate has become. Yes. Black homelessness became a national scandal when a black man was appointed Secretary of Housing. The black community was overrun with AIDS, drugs, addiction, TB, and all sorts of diseases and maladies when a black man was appointed Secretary of Health. Black nations were overrun by the imperial armies of the United States when a black man was head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The more black judges appointed to the bench, the more black men became police commissioners and police officers, the more black men filled America's prisons. And black on black violence ravaged America's black ghettos. Let's look at it. The Honorable Supreme Court Justice, late Justice Thurgood Marshall, achieved greater victories in the United States Supreme Court as a lawyer than he did as a judge sitting on his bench. In fact, he sat on the bench and sadly witness his life's work being ravaged and savaged by a mean-spirited bench. As a black man assumed to, to become Secretary of Commerce, blacks as an ethnic group are the least ones engaged in what? Commerce at home and abroad. 
1993 at the appointment of a black woman as, as Surgeon General and an ardent advocate of sex education and the dispensing of condoms, black teenage pregnancy and female-headed families threaten the very foundations of the black family and culture and the viability of the black community. This is the legacy of the leadership that we have confronted, ladies and gentlemen. And we must look at this situation and under whose leadership and what leadership did this occur? It occurred under the leadership of what I call the assimilationist, moralist leadership establishment. Those people who told us that our salvation lay in assimilating with other folk. We look at this shame as we see more black mayors elected, the deterioration of the black community hastened. Let's look quickly at the federal contributions to certain large cities in America. In 1977, let's look at the amount that the federal government contributed to city budgets. And let's compare that with what they received from the federal government in 1985, periods during which black mayors were presiding over some of America's cities. In 1977, New York City's budget, 19% of it was gotten from the federal government. By 85, it was only 9%. Los Angeles started with 18%, by 85 it was 2%. Chicago, 27% in 77, 15% in 85. Philadelphia, 20% in 77, 8% in 85. Detroit, 23%, now in 85, 12%. Baltimore, 20%, 85, 6%. Pittsburgh, 24%, 85, 13%. Boston, 13% in 85, 7%. Cleveland, 33% in 85, 19%. Minneapolis, 21% in 85, 9%. So are the black mayors bringing in the money? Are the elected officials bringing in the money? As a matter of fact, what you have going on here, ladies and gentlemen, is a war against black cities. You have the federal government itself engaging in the provocation of black populations to riot. That's right. So that under the cover of bringing law and order, they may impose martial law on those populations and destroy those populations. Right. This is the kind of game that hides itself behind a bourgeois leadership. That's right. I wanted to tell you the other evening when I was over at Brother Roy's about bourgeois radio, we didn't have time. You have to recognize one thing, you see. When we talk about the media in America, we look at who owns the media. You see, and we know that this media is owned by about 10 corporations that own about 80% of the media. Few companies owning over 200 cable companies and so forth. And you see the struggle now over who's going to own the cable operations. Who's going to control communications in America? And we recognize then that those who own the media, because what? A free press only belongs to the person who what? Owns one. Okay? That obviously if the bourgeois element in America and the root and elite in America owns the media, then the media will be used by that class to, to, to carry out its programs and its ideologies. And it will use the media to try to brainwash and falsify the consciousness of African people. But while we look at that, we must look at the ownership of our own media. Yes and see what class of people own that media. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Then, you want, then you can solve the puzzle as to why that media is always preaching to you about voting. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. As if voting was the only source of power uh -oh. in America. Uh -oh. Because those people that own those stations uh -oh. achieve their social position and power through America's electoral system. That's why it's important to them. Because the class of people that own those stations and control those stations got their position through what? 
electioneering and by being attached to the Democratic Party. And one thing that a bourgeois leadership and a leadership elite tries to do is to convince the masses that the masses can have their interests satisfied by satisfying the bourgeois' interests. And therefore, when they get elected to office, or they get high appointed office, they tell you, ain't we progressing? Doesn't that mean an advancement for black folk? When they are the only one who have advanced and you don't have a new nickel in your pocket as a result of their being in this position. And so they want to make you think that their elections and their ability to wheedle out of the Democratic parties and the Republican parties money that advance their economic interests represents an advancement for you. And therefore they fail to give you a true education as to what politics is really about in America. And power in America is not in voting. You have to understand that. Why? If you would even review your own history, you would recognize that what you call your most significant victories were gained before you gained the right to vote in 1964 and 1965. Did you vote? To get the vote? All right. Absolutely not. All right. Huh? Recognize what you're going on here. But someone will tell you that there's no other way. But what did we say? Power in America is based in America's corporations. Is determined by those who own the means of production and who own property. Power and property ownership go together in America. All right. All right. No propertyless people, no people who own no productive businesses right. are in power in America. I don't care what kind of votes they have. All right. All right. And recognize this, that where the power is, you cannot vote them out of power. Because those who run America's multinational corporations and run America's institutions don't run for office. They tell the people in office what to do. And therefore, if you are to wield real power in America, you must own the sources of power. And those sources mean the ownership of productive facilities and the ownership of property. All right. All right. And the control of major institutions and the ability to weld yourself together as a people and to control your consumption and to control your behavior in ways that you can exert your influence upon this system. All right. All right. But yet we get a medium that tells people, vote, vote, go out and vote. And you're going to suffer all the more as a result thereof. Yes, you got to face the reality. You got to know where it's going. Power lies in strategy. It lies in technique. It lies in alignment. You see. Why were blacks before they got to vote able to change the South? Through voting? Through alignments, That's right. through alliances, That's right. through control of their, their consumer rights. That's right. As you've said time and time again, that to a great extent the civil rights movement was a consumer movement. That's right. That's right. It was a situation where blacks refused to spend their money in particular ways and in particular places. That's right. And by withdrawing their consumption, they were able to change the South That's before right. a single law was passed That's in their right. favor. That's right. That's right. The just the ability of black people to line up side by side and shoulder to shoulder and to march in one straight line right. changed the face of the South. That's right. So what does it say? Just the ability to sit in front of a door and not permit other people to pass his power. The ability to chain yourself down is power, ladies and gentlemen. 
Ultimately, it means that power arrives out of cooperation, out of alignment, out of strategy, and out of technique, and out of a sense of purpose and mission, and out of the ability to withdraw support. That's right. By voting in this system of domination in a way you legitimate your own domination as a people. And you have to watch it. Let's learn where power is. And that's what we're going to be talking about right. in Blueprint for Black Power. Right. Where is it? That's right. We have this NAACP, this assimilationist, moralist leadership mm. that sees the solution of black problems as involving the assimilating with people. But I've just got to telling you that blacks are now more segregated than ever. That's so if our power depends on assimilation, we are in deep trouble. Right. Yes. We have some group of preachers who try to tell you that the major problem in America is moral. Yes, that's why I call them moralists. That these people are stereotyped or some kind of way. And if we, if we get them understanding, you see these little silly ads on TV, you know, stop the hate. <laughs> As if this was going to change something. As if the problem is hate. If the problem is they have a wrong knowledge of who you are, come on. Yes. That the problem is one of morals. And therefore, what we got to do is convert these white people to their own religion. And we got to make them true believers in their own constitution. And that way we will be free. You're out of your mind. Every revolution has had to deal with the issue of whether you should struggle for abstract rights or struggle for a right to meet the basic needs of the people. This was the issue that Booker was working with, too. He was weighing that issue. Is the voting the really primary thing, getting black people to vote? Getting civil rights the primary thing? Or should we see about feeding the people first, building an economic base, and then moving into the civil rights and voting thing. When we look at the history of other immigrant groups and ethnic groups, we've seen them almost be silent on the issue of voting and civil rights and so forth as they moved into the black communities and other communities and established an economic base. And then after getting an economic base, using that base as a political tool, you see now the vendors are being swept from the streets of Brooklyn and they're being swept from the streets of Harlem right. on black folks' money. That's right. You sat up here and you supported these Koreans. That's right. You didn't see color when you spent your money. That's right. You wouldn't let somebody else tell you how to spend my money. Right. And they paid you back. Right. You talked about multiculturalism, and yet not a one of you is in partnership with the Korean. Not one of you is in partnership with an Arab. Not one of you is in partnership with white folk. Where are the multicultural businesses? Where are the multicultural economic situations? What are you talking about multiculturalism? Where is it? They laid it on you. And yet in, in, in Blueprint for Black Power, I talk very straightforwardly about the Korean organizations. I named the presidents. We are calling names there, ladies and gentlemen. All right. And they are called the Korean Producers Association, the Korean Grocers Association, the Koreans uh, of Greater New York Association. Not Multicultural Association. Not Multicultural Grocers Association. No, Korean Grocers, Korean Producers. You understand? But we are for people of color. They're even buying your politicians. A month or two ago, they took a group of these Negroes from the Black Caucus to Korea. Wine them and dine them. Presented seminars about race harmony to them. So your own legislative people will become their cogs and will be used by them to operate against your very interests because you are colorblind 
and you wanted to assimilate. In the New York Times, they told you up front, and we quote the dates and the places in Blueprint for Black Power. They stated very clearly, now we got the money. We want to now deal with, our, our, with, with our politics. And they say that we are going to present each mayoral candidate with three demands. Did you read it? And what are those three demands, they said? We want now to have a terminal market, a, a cooperative market that belongs to us as Koreans so that they, they can control both the what? Wholesale and what? Retail end of the deal. We're not going to even buy from the white as at the end of Bronx term in the market. That's what we want. And, that's, and, we, and we're going to vote for mayors and we're going to fund their campaign based on whether they can meet this demand. The second demand, we want these mayors to keep out these big vendors like Pathmark and the others because they compete against our small businesses. And therefore, we want the zoning laws maintained so that they will not be admitted, so that they can compete against us. This is what people do. They gain power and they use power, you understand? And they gain the important base first, you see? Then their third demand was what? We want the mayor to crack down on what? Vendors and to sweep the vendors off of the sidewalks, okay? And you'll be getting to see the effects of it. In fact, within about 13 days after they made this demand, Dinkins expanded the vendor squad, bringing in new vans and new personnel and so forth, and stated very clearly that it's not such a great problem to remove the vendors because they have no political constituency. So what are we saying? What are we saying here? So now we got the right to vote and our vendors are being swept off the street. We got the right to vote and we are hungry and homeless in the street. We got the right to vote and now we are jobless and underemployed and unemployed. We got the right to vote and we're sitting in schools with asbestos and lead and poor teaching facilities. So now you got the abstract rights and the civil rights, but in what way has it really given you a right to be a real human being in America? Cruz summarized this in his critique of this assimilationist leadership. No one knows better than the political ruling class that the political, economic, and cultural policies that monitor the internal affairs of American society are not inspired by moral considerations but are based on the imperatives of power, especially economic power. The conceptual linking of integration with civil rights effectively obscures that by eliminating discrimination in public accommodations, in voting rights and employment opportunities, neither ethnicity nor cultural diversity is therefore divested of any social meaning or function. The cultural pluralism remains operative. What is he saying here? He's saying that, okay, you, uh, getting voting rights, getting, uh, you know, getting rid of discrimination in public and private places does not remove people's sense of ethnic identity. In other words, they can still vote, or you can gain the vote, but they will still identify themselves, what? Ethnically. They will still act, what? Ethnically, there was somebody that tried to tell us that once we got the vote and once we uh, integrated schools and so forth, that these people would lose their ethnic uh, sense. But he's telling you that is not true. As a consequence of civil rights legislation, the dominant culture is still left free to thwart or otherwise limit the social range of integration of the minority group. But on the other hand, the elimination of legally enforced exclusion by reasons of race or ethnicity does in fact enhance the minority group's free, uh, freedom and flexibility to develop the internal resources of its own political, economic, and cultural plurality. Uh, plurality. But what is he, the, the key is this. The Civil Rights Acts of 1964, 65, 
outlawed the use of race as a basis for making decisions affecting individuals, not groups. It was an ill-conceived conclusion on the part of the civil rights leaders to expect that desegregation in, private, in the private and public sectors of an institutionalized economy would transform American society into a, a nation of desegregated hearts and minds. Let me put it this way. There are a lot of us who like to talk about this individualism. You know, people do what they want individually, and we are talking about individual freedom. And I ask you this question. If you believe so much in individuals, and that individuals are so different, and that individuals have different tastes, and that individuals then will do their things in different ways, why is it that 180 million white individuals don't do business with you? Why is it that 8 million, 7 million Asian individuals free to act on their own individual impulses don't do business with you? You would think if they were so individually different, if they had such individually different tastes, they would interact with you and there would be true integration. But somehow these individuals seem to think pretty much alike when it comes to us as people. Every other group of individual people somehow seem to think alike in dealing with black folk. So it says then, you can have individual freedoms, but you can still act like an ethnic group and still use your ethnic identity as a basis for power. And therefore, gaining abstract individual rights in no way means that other people will con not continue to act as groups and to use their group as a means of dominating other groups and moving other groups forward. But we forgot that lesson. And so now, as a result of the assimilationist leadership, we find ourselves with all of these abstract rights, and yet it is ashes in our mouths. And we have some other group here called neoconservatives, which I cannot discuss tonight. It really doesn't deserve the, the term leadership group at all, but it's getting great exposure because it is in line with the crypto-racist white conservatives. They are funded by the white conservatives. They are funded by the white foundations. We discuss in Blueprint for Black Power the power of foundations and of think tanks. You see, we have a dim view as black people of intellectuals. And I must tell you, nothing is more practical than an intellectual theory, ladies and gentlemen. Concepts are the most concrete means of power that you can find. And somehow somebody has convinced us that thinking conceptually is a non-African mode of thought. Somebody comes telling us that we are a non-linear people, that we are spiritual and intuitive, and that uh, thinking logically and thinking analytically and thinking conceptually is somehow the property of white folk. God gave you two sides to your doggone brain. And one brain in one side is for intuition. One side is for holistic thinking. One side is for spiritual thinking. Yes, but you got another side. That's that left side that is the side of logic that is the side that uses symbols, that is the side that uses analysis. God gave you two sides. He gave you a logical side and an intuitive side. Don't let any joker tell you that your only role is to be intuitive and to be people who can only estimate and approximate. How can you look at the great pyramids of Egypt and the great mathematics and then turn around and say that you are only a spiritual and intuitive people. You've got to be crazy. Let me tell you, and this is one of the problems I want to talk about when I talk about nationalists. Be careful that in your effort to separate yourself from white folk, you don't wrap white stereotypes in Kenty cloth. Okay? 
And this is happening to a lot of us. The same stereotypes that these people have laid on us, that we can't think straight, we can't think logically, we are emotionally oriented, we are overrun by spiritism and spiritism, that we like to guess, that we don't know, know the real and true answer. This is the same game that whites been laying on us. Then we get some guys who want to come in and says, this is naturally African, and now we feel all right about it. Right. Get out of here. We got some people telling us, you know, that we are an oral people, and we are an oral people. But they want to make us think that oral communications is the only means by which we as African people should communicate with one another. You got to be out of your mind in a day and age of electronic communications and computers and so forth to lean on an antiquated method of oral presentation. It is no way I can deliver here in this oral presentation the kind of information that can be delivered in a book. And therefore you must become a book reading people. You must become a people who can analyze words. You must become a people with a vast vocabulary. You must become a people who can process the highest words and the most difficult words rapidly because these are the people who are opposing you and who intend to bring your life to an end. Be careful. Let me tell you quickly what these institutions will do for you. You think they're just collections of intellectual thinking, right? Forget it. Let's look at what the Ford Foundation did here when they decided to transform the nature right. of social science right. and the way social science research right. was done. And they decided they would recreate the whole nature of, of scientific research, right. social science research in the universities. Right. They created what they call a foreign area fellowship program. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they financed it. They granted over $23 million mm. to researchers. Uh -oh. You see, the elite doesn't play around. When they want to change the nature of things, they fund those natures, those things. They build institutions and think tanks and the whole bit. And we lay all of this out in Blueprints for Black Power. That's why you got to have think tanks. That's why you got to have a whole set of institutions. You see, that's why your goal must be, as our goal is at African World uh, Info Systems, to write all of the books that are being read in the Black Studies programs. That's what you got to do as this next generation of black students move through the universities. Right. This got to be your nationalistic books and your nationalistic perspectives and your African-centered perspectives that they study from. Right. They must crowd out any other point of view in the university. It must be African-centered professors uh -huh. educated in African-centered institutions right. that sit as the chairpersons of the department. That's why I tell people I'm not writing for the current generation, I'm writing for the next one. Right. So when those students move through the black studies programs and the other studies program and they read Black on Black Violence, Awakening the Natural Genius of Black Children, The Falsification of African Consciousness, Understanding Black Adolescent Male Power, Violence, Blueprint for Black Power, Educating Black Children for the 21st Century, they will have a conceptual orientation toward the world such that they will now move in the interest of African people and not against that interest. But if you are not publishing, if you are not putting the textbooks out, if you are not educating the professors, if you are not putting your people in the departments, if you are not making your teachers, if you are not placing them in the schools, then you cannot transform the opinions and orientations of your upcoming generations. And a people who have real power do these things, ladies and gentlemen. You must understand that. Now, these people decided then, now let's look at the statistics uh, uh, as a result of their funding this foreign area fellowship program. Statistics will demonstrate just how successful this program has been in strengthening America higher education. Strengthening. Of the 984 former fellows, you know, they call them fellows, you know, after you in postgraduate training, or you're a fellow at the Brookings Institute, or you're a fellow at the American uh, uh, Enterprise Institute, you know, something like that. And you sit there and you do research and you do postdoctoral work. And we, we talk about how this is done, how ultimately these, let me show you how these people end up. Okay? So they graduated 984. 550 whole faculty positions. 
in 181 colleges and universities in 38 states. This is how you do it. Some 29 universities employed five or more fellows. Ten universities have employed ten or more. In addition to academic and teaching careers, 82 former fellows are now in government service. You put your people in policy position. 38 are now in philanthropic, philanthropic or nonprofit organizations so they can tell the NAACP and the black conservatives what to do. 45 are in business or professions. Many former fellows have added to our knowledge of the non-Western world through the publications of the results of research. African-centered education is much larger than the teaching of African history and culture. Much larger. You must have a world knowledge and a knowledge of the world. You must have European experts as a part of your African-centered institutions. You must get to know intimately the cultures of other people and know their psychologies. You must get to know the real history of the world, for history is the best psychology text of all because it demonstrates the nature of human behavior, not the psychology books. Must understand that. I had one young man who's so happy he's at NYU. He said, oh, I'm learning so much, and I'm so happy. I'm in this class in economics. You know, I said, well, now, why are you in that class? And they're doing all these circles and curves and, you know, cost and all these kind of figures, which Negroes think are, 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 are magic signs for making money. You see, so they think if they learn all this voodoo that they're going to come out and be like the white folk. But remind that professor that the American economy is not ultimately based on the management skills of American management. It's not based on the organization of American corporations. What ultimately is it based on? Upon the murdering of Indians and the stealing of their lands. So that the economic course essentially is a course in how the booty is going to be divided among American people. When you look at the real world, you know that people establish themselves economically first by taking over economic resources and viable resources. That's it. You study your own history. How did the empire of Mali come into being? How did Ghana come into being? How did Sungai come into being? Struggles over what? Gold and salt and who won and, and over trade routes and other things and people went to war and took those things from one and another and those who gained control over them then built empires and nations and so forth as a basis of that. Not just studying economics 101 and business administration. But you got to learn real history. You got to learn a history that goes beyond just the celebration of African heroes and the celebration of African culture. You got to learn how it's really done in the world. So these people now, many former, many former fellows have added to our knowledge of the non-Western world through the publications of the results of research. Altogether, they have published some 373 books, over 3,000 articles and short monographs. Moreover, they have edited or contributed to another 516 volumes. This is how you change minds. What is going on with Henry Louis Gates? What is going on with Cornel West? Who shall, who says that black leaders, serious black leaders, must be race transcending? <laughs> you know, hmm. How the hell are you going to be a serious black leader and be race transcending? <laughs> you know? But that's the dilemma of the assimilationists. They want race and not race at the same time. They want to organize black people based on blackness so that they can get rid of blackness. They want to use your black interests, your black feelings, and your black identity to advance their program so they can tell you later that blackness does not matter, that color has nothing to do with it. We are better off when we don't even refer to ourselves as black.
Dr. Amos Wilson. Thank you very much. It is indeed a pleasure to return to the church. Again, it's been quite a while, and uh, certainly to greet some f familiar faces I haven't seen in a while, and of course, to be invited to share this evening with you. I'm going to uh, talk a bit about a number of topics. There are so many things that uh, relative to uh, concerns but I'll sort of focus it around what I see as a challenge to, to Afrocentric education, the kind of thing that you're attempting here, what kind of challenges we face. I'd like to start off by quoting from an article in the New York Times, Monday, August 31st, which I'm sure many of you being well-informed read but I'll just sort of repeat some of the areas. It was entitled, Black Child's Self-View is Still Low, Study Finds. The repeating of a landmark study shows that feelings of racial inferiority among young black children are as strong now as they were 40 years ago, researchers reported yesterday. But they said black children can be helped to develop greater self-esteem through efforts by teachers, parents, and changes in the way blacks are portrayed in films and, and television. And it goes on to indicate about two-thirds, uh, the new studies involved asking children which doll they prefer, a black one preferred, a black one or a white one. About two-thirds of the black children preferred a white doll. Many of you, of course, would recall this is a recapitulation of the famous Kenneth Clark study. And you'll probably recall, either through your reading or in terms of your um, past experience, that that study was very instrumental uh, influence, in influencing the United States Supreme Court to rule against uh, segregation, the famous 1954 decision. And it's interesting now, of course, and I believe that study was done in around 1948 or somewhere in the late 40s, actually. So it's interesting to see this study being replicated some 40 years later with essentially the same results. And I think uh, when we think about it very deeply, it has some very serious implications. Of course, essentially, the results are stated in the headline, Black Child Self-View is Still Low. Dr. Kenneth Clark, Professor Emeritus of Psychology at, City, at the City University of New York, who along with his wife, Mamie, conducted the original study called The Findings Disturbing. I find that a very interesting statement. Uh, what the children are telling us, this is Dr. Uh, Clark speaking, is that they see their color as the basis of self-rejection, he said. We try to hide the damage racism does to black children, but the damage is there and will continue as long as racism continues. I find it very interesting that uh, Dr. Clark, whose study formed the basis to a good extent of the Supreme Court ruling, still not, did not bring into question perhaps the ideology that was also a part of that ruling and the ideology of assimilationism that was also uh, energizing this, the, uh, this kind of activity in the court and has energized the black community for the last 40 years. There is still no effort, I, from what I can see in here, on this part to perhaps question the philosophy that saw that, that thought that black children's self-esteem and black children's love of themselves could be augmented or increased or enhanced by having white people love them. I have always contended that the effort of organizations like the NAACP and others in integrating black children with white children was not principally educational in nature. It was essentially an effort to 
get over an inferiority complex. I run into too many black parents when, if you would tell them that uh, you know of a black school that was academically more advanced than any white school they could send their children to, we'll still refuse to send them there. Uh, I've known some black uh, families who, will, who would send their children to uh, very uh, top-notch black schools in the first grades, and so two or three or four grades, because the, the schools had a reputation for producing uh, very advanced students. And then after uh, two or three years or so, take them out of the school and transfer them over to a white school, saying, of course, they, their children had to learn to get along with everybody. And uh, so what was more important than their continuing to learn in an advanced state was that they learned to uh, relate to uh, white folk and that they learned somehow to relate to other folk. And a, a great myth, by the way, that is uh, prevalent in the black community. I have yet to see the Japanese busing or plane loading their children to the United States in order for them to learn how to overrun the United States in every aspect of technology and, and, and politics and otherwise. I have yet to see the Japanese having to busload or plane load their children to the United States so that their children can outscore American white children on IQ tests and have those IQs grow generation after generation, and that's exactly what has happened, to outthink white children scientifically and technologically and to outthink them economically and otherwise. I didn't see them uh, exporting their children to American white schools to get that done. Yet we had a group of blacks in this country who felt that two plus two is, is not four in the black community. Two plus two is only four in, in the suburbs somewhere. Two plus two is four in Harlem and anywhere else. The idea that you have to export your child out to learn basic knowledge and information and to enhance itself intellectually is a fallacy. It is a veneer for people who are really trying to solve other problems in their personality. A veneer for people who are really wrestling with that sense of inferiority and self-hatred. Who will sell then the, the idea of trying to get rid of that sense of inferiority, powerlessness, and, and dependency. Sell it in the name of better education. When really the game was trying to be accepted by their former slave masters and the people who currently dominate them. The situation went on. The, uh, the report went on to say, in the United States, two thirds of the black children preferred white dolls, a response that researchers interpreted as indicating low racial self-esteem. In the Trinidadian study, that is, they went to Trinidad and replicated the study there as well, 85% of light-skinned black children preferred the white doll, and 64% of dark-skinned black children. Further, it states, the new studies also assess whether an intervention might improve the child's racial pride. After testing the children, the psychologist spent half an hour with the children trying to alter their attitudes. For example, they praised the children who, cho who had chosen black dolls and ignored those who chose white dolls. And the children who chose the black dolls were asked to say their dolls had traits such as being pretty, nice, and smart. When the children were then asked the same question in a second test, two-thirds of the black children and two-thirds of the white children as well expressed a preference for the black doll. The idea here, it, it, this indicates then that this sense of inferiority can, of course, be educated out of children, and that a correct cultural education will remove to a good extent this inferiority complex that has been inculcated in black children. It would indicate then if our children and if we as a people have an inferiority complex, it is one that has been deliberately induced. The article further states the study of children in Trinidad 
found that the black children there showed an even stronger preference for white dogs than was found in the United States. In the study of 257 children in preschools in Trinidad, Sharon McNichol, a clinical and school psychology at Creedmoor State Hospital in Queens, found that three quarters of black children there preferred the black dogs. St. Elmo Gopal, Secretary General, General of the Trinidad and Tobago Teachers Union, said at a news conference at the annual meeting, even in Trinidad, where 85% of the people are black, we have a, and we have a black government, we have not recovered from 400 years in which blacks knew the white man as boss. A very interesting statement. Of course, it points out uh, in implication the fact that uh, racism is a global phenomenon. And of course, it speaks to the Eurocentric dominance of the globe itself. And I'll be back to the statement in a moment. Here we see then, after 47 years from the Kenneth Clark study, about 33 years after the 1954 Supreme Court decision, that our children, and I would also state, our people are still suffering from an inferiority complex. At the time that Justice Jackson is running for president and Judge Marshall is sitting on the Supreme Court and Bluford is flying to the moon uh, somewhere and McNair and now a black woman is preparing to go and explore space. At the time that there's been an election of black mayors and other officers across the country, at the time perhaps when there's been an increased number of black faces on our TV sets and various black achievements, we still find as much black inferiority as it was some 40 years ago. This, I think, has serious implications. I think it makes us question whether segregation itself was really the cause of the feeling of inferiority in black children and in black people, as we, as we thought. It'll make us question also what I think was a naive belief that if we integrated with the whites, somehow they would stop seeing us as people of color or as black people. If we integrated with the whites, somehow the world would stop dividing itself up in terms of race. That somehow the world's division of itself in terms of African people and European people, black people and white people and so forth would somehow end. I think this study clearly implies then that this is not the case. I think it implies on a deeper level that inferiority in black people is a political and social necessity. I often, in speaking to my colleagues and others who are interested in psychology, and of course in the current book that I'm trying to develop now, get across the idea of how black psychology differs, particularly black psychology at this time, differs from Eurocentric psychology. And I think one of the major ways that it differs from Eurocentric psychology is that when we talk about abnormality in the black personality, when we talk about feelings of inferiority in black people, feelings of self-hatred and self-alienation, feelings of incompetence, feelings of powerlessness and so forth that we hear a lot about, we must recognize that these feelings are a political and economic necessity. And we should start from that premise if we are to understand the psychology of black people. I often put it this way. In, often, in, in order for us to be in the state that we are in today as people, we have to be out of our minds. We literally have to be crazy. It is necessary for us to be crazy. It is necessary for us to be backwards. It is necessary for us to be maladjusted. 
It is necessary for us to be disunited. It is necessary for us to be self-hating. It is necessary for us to be uh, filled with an inferiority complex. In a world where the European is essentially about 10% of the world's population, if that 10% is to continue to rule over the other 90%, it must keep that 90% out of its mind. It must keep that 90% in a state of deception. It must keep that 90% uh, filled with a feeling of powerlessness and incompetence. If this 10% is to continue to consume more than 60% of the world's resources, if this 10% is to continue to rob African, Asian, and other nations of their material wealth, then it must keep those people in a state of maladjustment. And this implies then that no matter how much integration you may bring about, the feeling of inferiority must be a constant in the black personality. No matter how many people you run for president, no matter how many mayors you get elected, no matter how many people you get on the board of IBM and the others, the basic sense of inferiority, the basic sense of dependency must remain a constant in the black mind. And I will indicate this, and I think this study, which occurred now some 40 years later, shows this to be the case. Dr. Clark shows surprise that after all of this time, this feeling is still there. I would not, and I don't think any student who's basically looked at the necessity of black people being out of their minds as being the foundation of European dominance would not be surprised. I think it was quite predictable. Remember, these children have this feeling of inferiority basically from the end of their second years. You can pick up this sense of inferiority as early as three, three and a half years old. So it starts very early. And I'm still working through my mind the implications of, of that kind of that finding. We are talking about preschool children, not only children that are in school, but children who, who are having this feeling prior to school. This would of course indicate that to a degree that our environment is saturated with racism through TV, through the various media, through the pictures our parents hang on the walls, through the unconscious and conscious state has, can influence the child's behavior and attitude starting in the womb itself. And I often start my developmental classes not with the prenatal period and how egg meets sperm, but with why do you have children in the first place? Because the reason you have children will influence their development. It will influence them from the time they're in your womb until, of course, the day they die upon this earth. It would indicate then that to a degree and in some way the black community itself has been induced in, in helping to bring about a feeling of inferiority in its children. To a good extent, it is not so much the actions of racism that destroy us. The discrimination by white folk and Europeans, the kind of hatred that they express toward us as people that destroys us and gives us an inferiority complex. It is to a good degree how we as people react to these actions whether we believe the propaganda or not, whether we believe what the European actually has said. We cannot often control the behavior of other people, but we do have a greater control over how we react to that behavior. And to a good extent, the challenge of an Afrocentric education is to educate us in our tendencies to react. To a good extent, it would mean that the actions of racism apparently have induced some of us to accept racist propaganda and to really believe it. 
to internalize it. Once we internalize the propaganda, then we become social agents for the racists themselves. And to a good extent, then, the black family, once it internalizes the propaganda of Eurocentric racist, becomes a social agent for the racist and begins to produce the kinds of children that the racists want from the time of conception onward. It becomes instructive, you see, to look at a family not as something that just raises children, but a family, to a good extent, is the social agent of the society. It produces the kinds of children that the society says it needs and wants. The family looks out at the opportunity structure, at its own social position. It looks out at what it uh, views as the future for its, its children, for its group, for its nation and it inculcates those views into its children and rears its children in terms of those views, sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously. And in that way, it begins to create the children for the society. In a heavily segregated society, for instance, if your black boy or girl would have said some years ago that they wanted to be president of the United States or that they were going to be president of the United States, how many of us, by being realistic, would have discouraged that view? You know, ain't no black man going to be this, or no black woman going to be that. Be real. And in the service of being real, by saying, well, I don't want him to be disappointed. I want to save him from racism and save him from the recognition one day that there are limitations to his aspirations, we quietly steer them toward a trade or a skill. Get this and get a job. So you, what, what's happening there? While it may have a realistic basis in a certain sort of way, you are also at the same time, though, creating the child's aspirations. You're also creating the child's motivations. You're creating the child's view of itself in line with the way the society is structured. A true Afrocentric family not only relates to his children in terms of reality, but it relates to his children in terms of idealism. It relates in the sense that it, there, it, there is a world that it is an African family and we as an African people want to bring about. While the black man may not be president of the United States, it does not mean that he cannot rule the world. The true Afrocentric family then not only raises its children in terms of the so-called social realities, because it recognizes that social realities are things that men create themselves. And therefore, it raises children to create a reality suitable to the advancement and development of black people. But an unconscious black family, an unconscious people, a people who've fallen victim to racism, a people who've fallen victim to a sense of inferiority, then will produce the kind of inferior children that the white society needs to continue its dominance in the world. And in this way, then, the black family and the black community and black leadership becomes allied with the dominant group and with the Eurocentric group. It is this kind of thing that we must come to, uh, to become conscious of and to defeat consciously. I'm going to give you a little taste of what I'm writing about in my current book. I want to indicate that black maladjustment is not, is not just a suffering in the soul of black people. It's not just a feeling of inferiority in which the... the uh, over which the individual has to get. It's not just a feeling of alienation that you get over by going to a therapist, that you get over by attending various um, therapeutic sessions. Black maladjustment is functionally necessary for the world as it is currently constituted. Black maladjustment is a political factor, and I often try to get across to people the understanding 
that when we go to these universities and these schools, one of the greatest deceptions that's run upon us is the idea that the things that we are taught in these schools are non-political, that they are neutral, that they are somehow universal. And of course, the whites run a beautiful game on us when they, for instance, name their courses without putting their ethnicity in front of them. They don't say white psychology, white education, white economics, white physics, white chemistry, you know. And we often naively then assume because they're called economics, psychology, anthropology, that that means we are in a course that has general and universal meanings. And we are made to think that we are odd when we uh, call a course black studies, that there's something wrong with it. But every college in the, every course in the American college and university and in the American educational establishment is a course in white studies, ladies and gentlemen. And every course in every discipline is designed for essentially the same thing, to maintain white dominance. We must be very conscious of that. And we must recognize that a major part of the education of our children and of ourselves is the fact that we have to politicize the courses that we're taking, even science, even physics and chemistry. So a lot of people think, well, you know, we're talking about atoms and molecules and this and that, and they have no ethnicity and, and they have no politics. On a fundamental, in a fundamental way, you may be right, but on another level, there's, some, there's a problem with that. Science, scientific thinking, and technological development does not just develop in the head of some genius. It's not the result of some scientific uh, genius who happened to strike upon some major discovery. Scientific discovery and technological development take place within a political social structure. You have to have a political system, a system of social relations, an economic system in order that science and technology develop and flourish. They do not, de they do not flourish in a vacuum. Therefore, it is not enough just to teach your children physics and chemistry. You must teach them the politics of physics and chemistry. You must teach them the economics of physics and chemistry. You must teach them how a system must organize itself politically and socially such that physical and chemical research take place. It is not enough for us to educate African boys and girls in science and technology uh, so that African can catch up with the Europeans. You will never catch up with the European just by knowing science and technology. Because, ladies and gentlemen, you have to finance technological research. You have to pay scientists to do research. People just don't do research for nothing. If you run the latest physics experiment, you would have to produce a cyclotron uh, in the, with a circumference of some 20 or 30 miles around that costs billions of dollars. And if you're then talking about catching up with the European scientifically, then you must catch up with the European and surpass him, what? Economically. If your children are to work for you and give your, their scientific genius to the advancement of black people, then we as black people must give them an economic, social, and political foundation in which their gifts can be, uh, be realized and handed over to us as a people. And therefore, merely to teach chemistry and physics as some neutral subject, as some body of knowledge unrelated to everything else going on into the world is to be miseducated. That is one of the reasons why we have a country filled as black people with chemists, with engineers, machinists, and yet we don't seem to be able to export one gun to South Africa. We don't seem to be able to make one bomb. We have generals and, and sergeants and green berets and rangers and all of the rest, and yet we are unable to train one guerrilla or anything else to fight for their liberation in this world because there's a lack of social organization. It is not enough just to have knowledge. It is not enough just to have money. Money and knowledge must be organized in order to be effective. 
and knowledge in order to flourish and be actualized in some concrete advancement for people must be based ultimately on social relations between those people. So there must be a social structure. And while your children are in mathematics, they must learn to love themselves and to love one another and to cooperate one with the other. Or else they'll have an Afrocentric mind, but they will still have to go down to IBM and Xerox and do their work. And ultimately then, they will still be racked by a sense of inferiority and dependency. So we must keep that in mind. Let me quickly state here then that the, the sense of inferiority in black people and the other problems we talk about will not be removed by assimilation. They will not be removed by integration. They will not be removed by Jesse Jackson being elected president of the United States. They will not be removed by the election of other black politicians. And that doesn't say that Jesse Jackson shouldn't be elected. And it doesn't say that other politicians should not be elected. I'm saying, though, we cannot look at those things as being the sole basis for removing and solving the kinds of problems that we have. Because maladjustment is not merely a malady of the individual personality. Maladjustment is functional for a system. That system sometimes can be a family. Do you know sometimes a family is held together by a sick person? It is the, uh, a scapegoat, a quote unquote black sheep around which the family defines itself. Sometimes a husband and wife keep the relationship because one of them is sick. And when one goes to the psychiatrist somewhere and try to get better, decide that they're going to change their life, the relationship breaks up. And often families will subtly pull a member back into alcoholism and other kinds of problems as a way of maintaining itself, even though it may be claim, uh, claiming aloud that it's really concerned with getting the person well because often the sickness of one individual works to the advantage of another one. And I will say then, when you see a society producing a lot of illness, the illness must be functional for that society. The sick people must be playing a very valuable role in that system. In other words, people don't drive you crazy for nothing. There's some benefit involved. Let me read this section then. The question that often goes unasked or unanswered from a general theoretical point of view is one that's asked, what familial societal role is played by the maladjusted personality? Why are we sick and why do we have the inferiority complex that we have as people? If the maladjusted personality is created and maintained by a social system, whether that system be dyadic, that is a system where there's a relationship between two people, familial or society, then it is reasonable to assume that such a personality, that is the maladjusted personality, is created and maintained because it is needed, because it is essential to the functioning of that system or some segment of that system. The maladjusted personality is created and maintained in service to another. I've often said, of course, one of the problems we have as people is that we are a created people. We are a creation of the Eurocentric Dr. Frankenstein. And we have been created to serve the purpose of Europeans. One of the major goals of an Afrocentric education and of Afrocentric development is that we become self-developing as a people. That we determine what our personality traits will be that we determine our destiny and our direction and not be determined by our reactionary relationship to some other people. Often a maladjusted personality is created and maintained in service to parental uh, and familial self-image, to societal, economic, political values and goals. If the maladjusted personality is a defensive and avoidant and avoided one, and such defensive and avoidant tendencies are deemed neurotic, then they are created to defend the individual against neurotic demands and to uh, protect it, to help him avoid a reality that is painful. However, that, does, that doesn't mean that the individual is not engaged also 
in serving the society. Often, we look at a neurotic person as a defensive personality, as a personality that is avoided, that seeks to avoid certain responsibilities and certain reactions and certain realities. We must also see, though, that personality in defending itself, in avoiding certain realities, actually serves another group or another person. I was doing a lecture here on self-hatred. And in the very first lecture, I dealt with the image of the blonde, blue-eyed Jesus. And I made the statement that you had to beware of a church such that when you walk into it, the first thing you see is a blonde, blue-eyed Jesus back behind the, behind the altar. That church is lying to you. And that church is going to help send you to hell. How did I say that? Because first of all, there's nowhere in the Bible that a description of that Jesus has ever been given. And secondly, that Bible strictly states that graven images should not be made. And it's done. And one minister jumped up offended because of that statement and took the statement personally. And I'm a minister in the such and such a church and I took a course under Dr. Cohn at Columbia University and you know, just laid it all out for me you know, <laughs> and objected to it as if I were attacking the minister directly when I was dealing with the concept and I was dealing with the psychology of having gods painted in alien forms and how that induces self-hatred and maintains self-hatred in the people. How praying to a white man is damaging to black people. And how thinking of God as a white man is damaging to black people. I'm dealing with the concept here. Yet she felt a need to defend what she thought of as herself and uh, her profession. But in defending herself, she actually defended the system. She actually defended the status quo. And many of us then, as neurotics, you see, as we engage in our neurotic and maladjusted behavior and defend our egos and defend our vanities and defend our prides, actually support and hold up the system. Compare it or justify the abusing family and how we, in many instances, end up justifying a system that abuses us. Integration itself indicates that, wanting to live and be loved and lay around with people who destroyed us and enslaved us and, and given us the greatest pain in the world. Sometimes what we call in psychology the love of the aggressor. To the people you want to love most of the people who've done the most damage to you. Unhealthy personalities cannot be created by healthy environments. Since the unhealth of an individual or group can result in the relative health, wealth, security, and uh, power and sense of identity of another individual or group, then it serves the interests of the latter group. In other words, the unhealth of the black community serves the health and wealth of the white community. Just as the sickness of the drug addict serves the health and wealth of the pusher. So in a sense, then, it becomes in the interest of the pusher to keep the addict, of course, addicted, even though he claims he's doing him a service and a favor. The latter group becomes dependent, that is, the unhealthy group, comes to need the unhealthiness, and, and that is, the, the, the dominant group really becomes dependent and comes to need the unhealthiness of the former. If the health of the former means a reduction in the dominance of the latter, then the latter will resist the health of the former despite its pretensions to the contrary. In other words, when we even see assimilationism, we don't have time to talk about it here tonight, but in many ways assimilationism and integrationism is really another prompt for the maintenance of white power. And while we thought that we bought it in to a great extent, 
I would argue that to a good extent the white ruling class helped to push it as well because it also helps to maintain the white ruling class in power. When you have a minority of people, uh, such as the European, often in order to stay in power, they must recruit from the very people they oppress. And therefore, they will call up from those people, certain talented people or, or other types, who then will identify with their masters and help them to maintain the, the control over the masses. This often will be called integration and will often be, be called desegregation. But ultimately, if you look very closely, you'll notice one thing, that the real power relationship between those two groups has not changed. I talk about a number of things we call constants, that if we look closely in the relationship, uh, at the relationship between Europeans and Africans, we will note that there are certain basic things that have not changed despite all of the other things we look at. Despite integrationism, despite uh, political and social change, there are things that are still basically the same and have been the same for the last 400 years. The real power of black people, particularly if you talk about military power, has not changed fundamentally since the very time we met the European. You may find African countries now with jet planes and tanks that they've bought from Europeans, by the way, and still have yet to make. And you may think then that the Africans have entered into a modern era in warfare and so forth, but I would dare say that it's not a single African country that can really protect the interests of black people against European power, particularly as that power moves out into space and can, ring and, and can rain down on the African continent bombs and laser weapons and other weapons of various types. And African countries having no anti-ballistic system, no Star Wars system, no system to fight war in space is literally defenseless. And yet they may fly the latest American jets, and in the face of American and European uh, war power, we are still ultimately defenseless. That has not changed fundamentally in 400 years, ladies and gentlemen. The European economic control of this globe fundamentally has not changed either. The European control of information has not changed fundamentally either. The European control of definition, the definition of reality, the definition of, of what is and is not, has not changed fundamentally either, and that has been the case for a long time. The European tendency to degrade things African has not changed as well. You may, you may now have a degree in computer technology. You may now have a job that pays you forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars 60000 a year. But your fundamental relationship to the European has not changed one whit from the fundamental relationship between our African forefathers and his European slave master. For as you work your computers, you still work to the profits of Europeans. And so the fact that we've moved into the executive offices does not mean we've moved into power does not mean that the fundamental power relationship between Europeans and Africans have changed one bit. As a matter of fact, the moving of blacks into the executive offices is an effort to maintain that power and to obscure that power behind a form of neocolonialism. I don't think it is an accident that the desegregation movement and the assimilationist movement in America parallel the neocolonial movement in Africa. As I often tell my classes, you as black students are now being educated to put a black face on white power and to help deceive your people into thinking because you got a job, we have moved forward as a people. <laughs> Let's then just take a quick look at the functions of maladjustment and why you cannot get blacks why it is important that blacks never get out of their sickness. You ever wondered why the more social workers you produce, the crazier people get? The more psychologists you produce, the crazier people get? Have you, have you ever wondered about that? <laughs> I lost a job challenging whites about that. Why you, as a white man, whom these crazy people have permitted to be chairman of the department of predominantly Hispanic at Black College, 
Why do you as a black man, a white man, continue to try to bring these psychologists in here when you know that this psychology is not doing the black and Hispanic community one whit of good? He could not disagree with that. How do you pretend to judge the qualifications of black people for teaching other black people and Hispanic teachers uh, uh, and, and Hispanic students when you admit every day in the, in the New York educational system that you don't know how to educate black children. We have a group of people who lament about their inability to educate black children, how black children are so-called uncontrollable and ineducable and all of that, and yet they want to sit on a board and determine who is qualified and not qualified. We have this insult downtown where these white dogs are going to try to determine who should be the chancellor of New York City schools, and yet have admitted that they cannot educate black children. And we'll sit there and let them uh, uh, try to lay the foundation to tell us what the credentials of, a per, uh, of an educator is supposed to be. How do you qualify to tell us what the credentials of an educator is supposed to do? You have not demonstrated that you are capable of educating black people, but yet there are a lot of us who want to sit back and talk about standards and degrees and all this other nonsense that the people who clearly admitted that they failed have laid upon us. And yet we have a lot of this going on in the system. But this kind of stuff must happen if black people are, continue, are to continue to be subordinated. How is it functional? The captive African maladjustment justifies European dominance and exploitation. Because we are crazy, because we are criminal, because we are addicts, because we are that, the Europeans have a right to put their police in our community. They have a right to run the welfare agencies that keep us crazy, by the way. They have a right to intrude into our cultural families and personal lives. Why? Because, you see, they are maladjusted. They have learning deficiencies. They have this and that. Therefore, we're coming in to help and treat them in some sort of way. We are bringing in foreign aid. We are uh, calling on the IMF to uh, study and regulate their national economies and so forth. So you will see the so-called sickness and dependency and lagging in development and all of these other kinds of things every day are justifications for the Europeans to intrude upon African life and seek to control that life. And when we accept their definitions, we accept their dominance. We ask for their dominance, and we see their dominance as some kind of aid to us. Yet when we look some 40 years later, we are in the same position or in a worse position than before. How do we solve it? Asking more of it. Well, let's get more degrees. Let's see that the teachers get more degrees. Even though the more degrees they get, the worse the education has become. But what's the solution? Send them back to school for some more. The more money that's been pumped into school, what happens? It's the worse the education has got. What's the solution? Let's put more money into school. Idiotic, idiotic solutions all over the place. But that's but you see, you cannot expect a neurotic to think normally. That's the essence of being what? Neurotic. If you thought normally, behave normally, you wouldn't be a neurotic, would you? So being, being maladjusted justifies European dominance, rationalizes Eurocentric treatment, as I just said, of African people, and thereby reduces their guilt and self-condemnatory feelings for behaving toward the African in ways contrary to their stated political and constitutional, ethical, moral, religious principles. You know, these great Christians and these great people who believe in equality. How do you believe in equality? You know, the greatest problem in this country was, how do you believe in the equality of man and yet enslave a group of men? How do you believe in this and, and mistreat and discriminate? In order to get out of that dilemma then, you must make those people what? Less than men less than human. 
you see? So then in that way, you can justify what you're doing. They are not fully human. They are not fully men. They are not fully intelligent. They are not fully capable of self-government. They are not fully capable of, of guiding themselves. Therefore, it's only incumbent on us, those of us who are lucky enough to be more intelligent and divinely sent to rule over men to uh, take care of them. It is incumbent up upon us to take up what? The white man's burden, which happens to be the black man. But actually, the other way around is we have to carry them as a burden. The maladjustment of black people maintains Eurocentric self-esteem, self-definition and identity, self-concept, sense of security, wealth and power and control since the captive African's debilitated state, debased and degraded nature will not permit him to successfully overcome such dominance. The lowest European on the lowest street skid row in this country can always say one thing, at least I'm not black. He defines himself and his self-esteem still rests upon the ultimate degradation of black people. So no matter how low and evil he sinks, he still has a superiority uh, attitude toward black people. And therefore, the degradation of black people and maintaining black people in that state is important to the European sense of self-esteem and self-identity. The European more or less defines himself in contrast to the African person. Many of you have run into Europeans and when you came to be what they did not expect to be, you've seen them unravel before your very eyes. When they could not play their custom role of dominance and mastery, you've seen them become unglued and unable to function, become confused. It means then that our submission and subordination and degradation keeps them together. And therefore, it is necessary for them to maintain this degraded state in black people in order to maintain their sense of self as a people. And by maintaining us in this, deba this debased state and degraded state, they therefore maintain their security because as long as we think neurotically and maladjustedly, then we will not be able to think in a way that will ultimately defeat them as a people and ultimately destroy them as a people. And remember, we had talked about people who are a minority in the world and yet who must protect their interests. Black maladjustment induces, in the, uh, the, induces the captive African to engage in self-defeating behavior, which relieves the Eurocentric establishment of having to impose direct militaristic oppression and, and, and to blame the victim for his own predicament. We get plenty of that, of course. In other words, when you get the black maladjusted to a certain degree, he will defeat him himself. Well, look, I put libraries in your community. You just don't like to read. We have schools here. You just like to drop out for some reason. The knowledge is available to you. You just uh, don't like it for some reason or, or, or other. It's a very slick system because it permits then the European to pretend that they are liberal and open and so forth and yet at the same time maintain themselves. And, and, and of course, I often talk about this, the European talks about freedom of speech. But we are only free to speak when our audience does not hear us. We are only free to speak when our audience is not interested. We are only free to speak when the audience really does not listen. Oh, I can sit here and call Reagan all kind of name and talk about white folk. That illustrates what a great system we have here. But how is this possible? To a good extent, it's possible because, you see, at first you induce the audience not to be what? Interested, not to care or to be apathetic, and then you just let the person speak as long as they want to. You induce the audience not to be active and therefore knowing that after the speech is over, no real activity will take place, so you let them talk as much as they want to. So the system of slavery, you see, and Jim Crowism that occurred shortly thereafter structured the black personality in such a way that despite the Marcus Garveys and the Malcolm X's and other people 
there's been relative little change because the reception often of the audiences was such that uh, they would not threaten the United States after they heard the speech. We are only free in this country to do the wrong thing. Recognize what happened to Farrakhan. Farrakhan has been saying the same thing for 20 years. But to a good extent, when the whites actually thought that black people might really be listening to Farrakhan, might really act upon what Farrakhan was saying, he can't now get into Javits Center. Now he's having a hard time finding a place to speak and a platform to speak to black people. Is this the country of free speech, ladies and gentlemen? You better not believe it. There's no way. We say we are free. What is freedom, we say? Freedom to do what we want to do. But stop a minute and think, what makes you want to do what you want to do? And you might come to realize then that our very wants and our very desires have been what? Induced. So that the things we really want and the things we really desire are those things that maintain the system and are those things that destroy us as a people. But yet we object to anyone speaking about it because we see our indulging in them as some expression of our what? Freedom. Yet in this system, when you so-called let a people free, and yet you must maintain them in subordination, they must then, with their freedom of choice, always choose what? The wrong thing. But you give them a foolish pride into thinking that since they have choice, they are therefore free. A very slick system. It induces the, the African the captive African to behave in such a way such that he will economically and otherwise and apparently of his own accord support the European establishment to the detriment of his own without being conscious of his doing so. Why should a black person be made to feel ugly? What is the function of associating blackness and ugliness? Blackness and uncleanliness? blackness and unlovable, uh, of being unlovable. Is it just purely a racist attitude of some evil people? What do you do when you feel ugly or unkempt? But you do something else beside that. You go out and you buy yourself a new, you go out and, and spend a lot of money But what is, what's happening here? Who do you spend it with? Who gets the buck of the money that's spent? In other words, the African feeling ugly and unclean in, it, in his attempt to compensate for that feeling of ugliness and uncleanliness goes to the very person who made him feel that way in the beginning and purchases and buys from that person and therefore maintains the very individual to destroy the self-image to start with. Do you think then an economic system that depends upon a bunch of people trying to compensate for feelings of inferiority by buying brand names, I don't know where brands, you know, by buying names of other people on their clothing, do you think that system is ever really going to let you out of that feeling of ugliness? It can't. It's economically dependent upon that feeling, ladies and gentlemen. If we were made to feel naturally beautiful, don't you know we would destroy the cosmetics and, and the industry? So we must feel naturally that nature itself has not made us beautiful so that we must compensate for it. And therefore, we can see then that the inducement of inferiority in black people, the inducement of a feeling of ugliness, the inducement of these various negative feelings must stay in black people so that in trying to compensate for these feelings, black people will economic, politically, economically, politically, and otherwise support the very people that induced them. 
You see, the alienation of black people is economically functional. It's just not a feeling you have in your mind. The fact that you may wrestle with your own self-estrangement, separation from yourself, is not just a feeling you're having within yourself. It is a politically functional feeling. It is induced for political purposes. What does it mean to be alienated? To be alienated does not only mean that one suffers a split within the personality, that one feels estranged from himself, that one does not know himself. Certainly that's an aspect of alienation, and this is the way it's talked about in the psychology books, you see. And when you read all of this psychology, you think you're really getting heavy, you see, and the Eurocentrics teach it to you very directly, and you feel very profound when you talk about the great dynamics all oh, struggling with one another. Why do you alienate a person? We are alienated so that we can serve aliens. That is the function of alienation. Alienation means to be determined by forces outside oneself, other than oneself, to the, to the enhancement of those aliens. When Marx talks about alienation then, do not just cue in on the alienation that the worker feels. Recognize that the worker has to be alienated in order to serve the, the owner of the means of production. That's its ultimate function. You will recognize then, and alienated people can only spend money with aliens. They can only support aliens. They can sit here and support these Koreans and these Arabs and these Indians and everybody else but a black person. They can support everybody's families but their own. They can give jobs to these people's uncles and aunts and sisters and brothers and children, but they cannot give jobs to their own children. They can feel good when they give all of their money to Bloomingdale's and these other places, but they feel cheated every time they trade with a black person. You have to be alienated for that reason. That's why we alienate. And do you think the white man intends to turn that feeling of alienation loose in your heart? You are dead wrong. No matter how often you go into a boardroom, no matter how high you move up into the white hierarchy, because alienation is functional for white power and functional for white economic, social, and political uh, dominance. And yet I see somebody expressing surprise after 40 years that black children still have a sense of inferiority because you don't know your black psychology and because you studied them from a Eurocentric psychological point of view and because you saw your goal as not removing the white man from power but of sleeping with them in these beds and not questioning and not questioning the evilness of his system but of wanting to share in it we never had a national debate. Who gave the NAACP the permission to go out to court and, and, and talk for black people in terms of equality? Equality with whom? We should have debated that. That's a moral issue. Equality with a slave master? Equality with exploiters? Equality with people who, every time they stepped on a continent, destroyed and degraded the people that they dealt with? Is this what we want, a sharing of the spoils, or is it that we want a whole different world than what these people have bought on this earth today? But we were diverted from asking that fundamental question. We were made to think simply because we were getting paid less than white folk, our problem would be solved merely by getting equal pay. But the problem is much deeper than that, ladies and gentlemen. But that too is a part of the illness, you see. So then the maladjustment is, is used and, and is induced into Africa to engage in self-destructive behavior so that he may annihilate himself or that his demise can be permitted or enacted without triggering Eurocentric guilt and without uh, uh, costly resistance. It, is, it was induced to permit the European to perceive himself as naturally superior, to protect the European from genetic annihilation. While I'm on that subject, let me just mention one quick thing here about genetic annihilation. Some of you saw this, I'm sure. U.S. News and World Report, June 22nd, 
1987. What does it say here? Are we having enough babies? <laughs> you know whose question that could be. <laughs> by, of course, this is a piece done by Ben Wattenberg. Some of you might have seen uh, him at various places. And he, he's doing a very interesting thing now. He wrote a book called The Birth Dearth, indicating, of course, that uh, not, not enough white people are being produced in the world. And uh, so he goes, he starts here, what's happening today has never happened before. It will dramatically change the US and the world in which we live. Over the years, I've heard businessmen, diplomats, government planners, and parents all begging for the same thing. No surprises, please. This book, a speculation about the future based on current trends, is an attempt to deal with that plank. Forewarned is forearmed. What is happening is this. For about a decade and a half, the peoples of the free, modern, industrial world that includes the US have not borne enough children to reproduce themselves over an extended period of time. We had a baby boom. Now there is a birth dearth. I believe that the birth dearth will, in the near future, begin to cause turbulence at every level of our economy. I believe, too, that the, the birth dearth will leave in its wake tens of millions of unhappy adults who will end up with no children at all, or fewer children than they really wanted, or no grandchildren, or fewer grandchildren than they had hoped for. I believe the demographic and immigration patterns inherent in the birth dearth will yield an even smaller proportion of Americans of white European stock. And this will likely cause more ethnic and racial tension and turmoil than otherwise would occur. That's, that's what you see. People concerned with what? Their genes. Maintaining their ethnicity. Seeing it as an important fact and not trying to obliterate it the way we and our assimilationist people have tried to do. Not trying to forget who they are, but trying to hold on to their identity. This is one of the challenges of Afrocentric education, by the way. And one of the things that we have to look at, what would happen if, this Europeans, if these Europeans began to disappear from the face of the earth? What would happen if they decide that they are not going to disappear and want to make some other people disappear? How are they going to deal with their, their uh, low birth rate? What are the political implications about that situation? It has very serious implications for African people. And these people are now getting ready to deal with it. I believe, I believe further, he says, that the birth dirt may well turn out to be of great harm to the broadest value we treasure. It will make it difficult to promote and defend liberty in Western nations and the rest of the modernized world. Talking about white folk, certainly couldn't be talking about us in terms of liberty. Primacy and prosperity. And he's talking about here, we live in a community of free and modern nations banded together in a loose but real alliance. These nations, like, uh, these nations like to argue. They argue about strategic defense, about who will buy cars from whom, and about whose wine shall be subject to what kind of ailing duties. But beneath the bickering, something remarkable has happened during the last four, uh, four decades. This community of free modern nations ha uh, has shaped and molded the nature of the entire world, a direct admission of their role in the world, you see. We've shaped and what created the world. Now that is being what? Threatened. And what are we going to do about maintaining it? You think that these people are going to let you free? You've got another thought coming. Economically, technologically, culturally, geopolitically, and in, any ways, and in many ways militarily as well. In other words, we've shaped it militarily as well. It's interesting sometimes when I see the Europeans talk about their boys being killed, and of course I was being killed along with them. They talk about gets being robbed and their others being robbed. But remember one thing, if you're being held up out there in the streets by knife or gun, it's a gun you've sold to them. And if black boys and white boys are being killed in Southeast Asia, Nine times out of 10, they are killed by weapons sold to the very people that are killing them. Ye that what lives by the sword shall what die by it. You think you can go around the world selling billions and millions of dollars of jet planes and weapons and not yourself ultimately be victimized by the very things you sell? These sellers of death will ultimately be the main victims of their own tools of death. 
By 1950, when this Western moment was in its early days, the population of the free modern world comprised about 22% of the global population. That's amazing even at that, isn't it? That 22% of the, the population could have control over another, what, 88%. Today, we are 15%. By the year 2030, we will be 9%. A reasonable extrapolation through the end of the next century brings the Western proportion down to about, what, 5%. But we still want to be in control. A question arises, will our values continue to dominate in a world where our population shrinks, shrinks to 9%, shrinks to 5%, even, even lower? And he goes on to talk about population and power. Can you see again, uh, let, let's look up, I hope I'm not holding you up too long. I'll be through shortly. I just want to make a few other quotes from this. What happens when the West is less than 10% of the world, less than 5%? Do mere numbers of people equate with power and influence? Consider first the military situation. There are populous nations that are not big powers, China and India, but only populous nations can become big powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. The advantage of a large labor force and economies of scale are of vast importance. Brute economic production is one critical aspect of national strength and security. Larger populations can build more easily the infrastructure that supports national defense. And attaining, and attaining technological leadership requires a large critical mass of scientists. Can we begin to see now why you cannot produce a large number of black engineers and technological people? Why the African world must remain ununited and disunited? because these people recognize quite clearly that the uniting of African people, the social organization of African people, the social and economic networking of African people spells the end of European power and dominance. It's stated right here that, do you ever think, and I know it must amaze you at times, of the influence that Jewish people have in the world. I read with great dismay here about two weeks ago the demands that they were laying on the Pope, you know, and, and how they had the Pope going. It's an interesting situation. And yet you think about it, there are only about, what, 15 million of them in the world? Maybe even less? And yet, you know, there's a major Jewish political uh, organization in Washington that literally vetoes everything that the United States government does that the United States budget itself is submitted to this organization, that this organization literally determines who and what nations and what groups will get what from this United States, even though this group is less than 3% of the United States population, ladies and gentlemen. It's an amazing situation there. Here are a people population-wise are smaller than a gnat. When you compare them with something like, what, 400 million or more African people, or more than a half billion Indian people, more than about a billion Chinese, and you can name one major population after another, and yet these billions somehow are unable to control their circumstances, and a tiny little group is able to literally manipulate this country and influence what goes on in the world. Reminds me of something some of you read today in, in today's New York Times. You heard about Mr. Le Pen over there in, in France, running for office, very famous, because he wants to run the Africans and the Asians out of France. Wasn't doing too bad either. Jean-Marie Le Pen, France's leading far-right politician and candidate for the French presidency, has caused an uproar with the statement that the Nazi gas chambers were a minor point of history. No problem until he mentioned that. Several political figures said that they would even vote to lift Mr. Le Pen's parliamentary immunity so that a defamation lawsuit could be brought against him. Political analysts and politicians said this was the first major slip, note that this first major slip now, <laughs> by Mr. Le Pen, whose political campaign focuses on reducing the number of Africans, African Asians, and Arab immigrants to keep France French. So that wasn't his first major slip. It was only when he related to the Jews that he really made it, and that really cooked his goose. As long as he invaded against Africans and others, as long as he talked about keeping them out and denying them, 
no problem. As a matter of fact, he was ascending in French politics. As long as he wanted to keep French, French, all of France, French, and all of that, no problem, no major issue. I mean, no, no, no major slip. But as soon as he said, this business about the gas chambers and how Jews were executed might be a minor point in history, he was in serious trouble. This is the first major mistake Mr. Lepin has, com uh, Lepin has committed because these ideas that everyone thought, these are the ideas that everyone thought were dead. Political analysts also said Mr. Le Pen's remarks would probably make it harder for Mr. Chirac's coalition to agree to cooperate with Mr. Le Pen to help defeat the Socialist Party in next year's election. In other words, you see, you can help uh, determine the shape of our government as long as you stay off the large majorities in the world. And you, I mean, just stay off of the what? The minority, the true minority in the world. As long as you can defame black people and African people, you can help determine the shape of the European government, of the French government. But as soon as you then talk about a very small minority in the world, you have made a major, major misstep, and you will pay for it. A very interesting kind of situation there. However, despite all of this, they ultimately recognize that if large populations were truly to unite and were truly to develop a national consciousness, were truly to, be, to approach the world in terms of cultural and nationalistic interests, they recognize ultimately then the power would have to shift. And of course, we know then that is one of the major reasons why the European must minoritize large groups of people and must make people who are ethnically the same think of themselves as being ethnically different. On a larger consumer market, only a larger consumer market can, can support, a, su, uh, support much broad-based industrial scientific innovation, which, e which often spins off into, mili into uh, the military field. And he goes on and talks about, and he, later on he talks about, and culture counts. Values count. If the peoples of the world admire Western values and seek to adopt them, we are what? Stronger and safer. So you think then, with this kind of attitude, that African values will be permitted to flourish among African people if we leave it up to them to determine what values are there? There is another to be poor. Blacks and Hispanics have higher fertility rates than whites. Although middle class blacks have lower fertility rates than middle class whites. Very interesting situation there as well. Have we as black people been so concerned with living in the European lifestyle that we've given up reproduction? Yet many of us who are in the so-called middle class have done exactly that. This situation also illustrates the very deadly nature of European society and the very, its very opposition to African values. You must recognize when you read Freudian psychology, at the bottom of that psychology is a critique of European society. A society that comes to hate sex, a society that sees sexuality as its enemy, as in opposition to civilization, a society that denies its gods sex and sexuality is a society ultimately that's going to be a deadly one. How can you have fear and hatred and antipathy toward the very source of life and not ultimately side with death itself? And I think one of the major reasons this society has become deadly and a threat to the life of the very world itself is that it has problems with its own sexuality. And it has problems with the very basic nature of man. It has such a problem then that those who have the most to give to children, you would think, in terms of wealth, knowledge, and so forth, are the very ones that what? Do not have them. There's a problem there, ladies and gentlemen. And it's interesting to note then that this is diametrically opposed to the African sense and to African values that look at life and growth and development as a, as a great value. But yet we note as Africa adopts these European values, they will also adopt the deadly nature of Europeans to the point often 
of killing their own children or denying them birth or denying them conception in the first place. And now the European is beginning to see the result of the philosophy that they have put forth. What happens in America? He goes, and it's interesting to note that this is one of the challenges. Further, recent immigrants have higher fertility rates than other Americans. By the way, some of you might have read two or three years ago about the browning of America. The idea that the Hispanics are moving in so rapidly that at the rate they're going, uh, they assume the America's uh, largest minority. There will be more Hispanics in this country than blacks. And that at the rate they're going, we'll literally have a brown America. That's a major question we have to deal with too, ladies and gentlemen, by the way. What will happen to the black population in this country as it is outnumbered by the Hispanic population? Or as it is balanced off by Euro uh, uh, Asian immigration? That's a challenge that our children must be educated to meet. I know it's a question we hate to deal with. And often we want to lump a lot of problems on the white and non-white. Forgetting, though, that we as people have to compete against all people in, on this earth. Africa has to compete against Latin America as well for markets in this United States and other places. And we have to compete with other non-white people. And the idea that when we just cannot let then other non-white people just function the way they want to without also looking at it in terms of what it means in terms of our own self-development, growth, and survival as a people. The influx then of Hispanics in this family, in this country, will have a major impact upon the quality of black life in this country. And I think those of you who, of course, go in the black community can already see that. Those of you who may go to Miami can already see it in very clear terms. And in, in uh, certain parts of New Jersey can see it. And yet it's an issue that we don't want to face. The rate is less than that if illegal immigrants are counted. That, uh, it's, uh, let me go back. Today, fewer than 20% of legal immigrants to America are of white European stock. The rate is even less than that if illegal immigrants are counted in. This is, there is little reason to think this will change. Birth rates in Western Europe are so low these days, there's hardly anyone left to leave. <laughs> hardly any whites to come over anymore. Today, about 80% of the current total United States population is of white European stock. At roughly current rates of fertility and immigration, demographers Leon Bouvier and Robert Gardner have projected that by the year 2080, the white European share of the U.S. population will be down to 60% and will be shrinking. With a higher rate of immigration, it could be only, it will only be 50%. Very interesting. Reminds me of that movie, War of the Worlds, you know? when uh, it looked like the aliens were taken over and then they died because of disease. Will the European die out? Will our problem be solved by their mere, uh, by their mere death? While we may take some pride in that if they don't increase the rate of babies they're having, we may be faced with another problem though. Are we to get the European off of our backs only to have the Asian and others on our backs? So the idea that the European is going to, may die away or fade away it should not uh, give us too much relief because we are still faced with the challenge of other groups uh, exploiting us as well. What happens in America with birth dirt conditions under these scenarios? I think it will yield some unnecessary social turbulence. But uh, it's interesting. I can't read you all of it because it's a long piece. I would hope you get a chance to uh, read some of the pieces. I just want to indicate uh, uh, one or two other things when he talks about the time to pay attention and so forth. As I reflect on our situation, it seems that the real and lasting solution to our problem is not finally to be found in the realm of politics, the tax code, or the immigration code. Our central problem is in the realm of the spirit. An interesting statement, I think. For in the last analysis, it is our spirit that shapes our politics, our tax codes, and our immigration codes. So what are we saying? The spirit that indwells in people ultimately determine all of the other things. He goes on to say, but suppose we could re-inspirit this generation, he's talking about the his generation of whites, to understand and take pride in the fact that they are a part of a remarkable, potent, productive, humane, benef beneficent culture. Well, what happens when we tell ourselves that as African people? We are engaging in what, self-segregation? 
superiority complexes of some kind. But yet this man recognizes that the survival of European people depends on what? Inculcating in their current generation a sense of what? Culture, a sense of themselves as a people. Not getting rid of their culture, not getting rid of their identity, not trying to emerge with another people, but building up a greater sense of identity relating to each other socially, economically, politically, and sexually to maintain their, their dominance in the world. For in the last analysis, it is our spirit that shapes our politics, as he goes on to say. So suppose our young people came to know in the marrow of the bones that the West is, as Lincoln said, the last best hope of mankind. These deadly people, these people who threaten the very, every bit of life on Earth, these enslavers, these exploiters, still dare to see themselves as what? The last best hope of mankind. Very interesting statement. It shows, though, that whites must not only indulge in the deception of African people, but they must indulge what? In their own self-deception. The last hope of mankind the last best hope of mankind. Suppose it was explained that only they can preserve it. They who threaten to destroy it can preserve it, and that there is something real to fear if they don't. If such a spiritual rekindling actually takes place among our young people, it might rejuvenate, even save, a civilization that has been a long time in building, one of the shortest lived civilizations that ever existed on this earth. And yet, in that shortest period of time, has done more to destroy man than any other civilization that has ever existed. He talked about an Egyptian civilization that lasts thousands of years. And yet, this civilization, within a space of two or three hundred years, has killed and destroyed and raped and robbed more than all of the previous uh, civilizations put together. And yet, it dares to see itself. As, as the last great hope of mankind. After all, it's not such a big deal. All it involves is having another baby. Is that right? I must, I must wrap it up here. I like the concept of spirit. One of the things I talk about in my current book is the concept of spirit possession. And I'm bringing back some concepts. You know, when you get in after century psychology, you begin to see where some concepts that have been put down, and I'll be through in a minute, by Europeans very functional in African psychology. One of the things that they like to talk about, of course, is this kind of idea of spirit possession. And we think as a modern civilization that we've gotten over that, that belief in spirit possession that people can actually be possessed by devils. But ladies and gentlemen, that is not true at all. People of every age are possessed in one form or another. What spirit possesses you depends upon the ideas that are accepted at the time. When the devil as a, as a real entity was accepted by uh, the culture and by the bulk of the population, the devil actually possessed people. You could actually talk to the devil and people. You could call them out, you know? And you, some of you saw the movie uh, The Exorcist, and you, you, the devil is talking and carrying on. This actually occurs. And it's an interesting phenomenon in uh, human life. How do you feel Jesus? How do you feel any God? To a good extent, you have to have an idea of that God, don't you? Somebody has to kind of tell you about it, don't they? You kind of have to know about it a bit. Once you get an idea in your mind, once somebody describes Dambala to you or describes this one to you, what can happen? You, the, the description can actually manifest itself in your body. You actually experience it as a physical presence. You know, during certain uh, rituals, you can tell what spirit possesses an individual by the very physiognomy of their face and body, by the very way they behave, by the very way they dance, the way they talk. Each spirit has an identity such that when it possesses the individual, that identity expresses itself through the body and the behavior of that, of that individual. So then, what are we saying here then? When you give a person a complex of ideas, and they accept that complex of ideas, 
that complex of ideas can express itself concretely in the body and the behavior of that individual and, and, and affect the way that individual relates to another people. And it's interesting then when the devil possesses a person, the devil exploits that person's body, uses that person's body, abuses that person's body, relates to other people in a devilish sort of way. Now then, we've gotten over the devil, but the devil has not really disappeared. Now we believe in unconscious forces. But if you study them very deeply, you recognize what has really happened is the devil has gone underground. And the devil has become what? Unconscious. So now you got the devil and you don't what? Know it. In fact, you've become identified with the devil and see the devil as one and the same as yourself. In the old days, we had an advantage, you see. You could see the devil as being, what, separate from the self. But now since Freud came along and said there's no more devil, there's unconscious forces, now we cannot tell the difference between what is us and what is of the devil. And it's interesting then that race, it does not only express itself as an action of other people, it expresses itself as a spirit. And that spirit comes to possess a people and act through that people. And it destroys that people in terms of their behavior. When you are possessed by a spirit, you serve that spirit. You come to want to resemble that spirit. When a Michael Jackson or someone is possessed by the spirit of a white man, he wants to look like a white man. He wants to lighten up the skin like a white man. He wants to turn the hair like a white man. He wants to talk like a white man. He wants to walk like a white man. He wants to relate to other people the way a, a white man relates to black people. That's why you call other black people niggers. And that's why you treat them the way your master treats you. Because the spirit of the master is now in possession of the personality. They will even go so far as to get their nose trimmed and their chin narrowed and their cheeks raised and their total body mutilated so that the spirit that is in them expresses itself in the very face and features of the individual in and of itself. This is why this man talks about spirit because he recognized the implanting of a spirit in a certain people means the movement forward of that people or it influences the behavior of that people. And that is why it is necessary for you here tonight to implant an African spirit in the breast of black people the world over. And once we are filled with that spirit, there is no room to be possessed by another spirit. And it means then that we advance the interests of our civilization. The European spirit can only possess an empty African personality. Nature abhors a vacuum. And as the African personality is swept out of us and sucked out of us, the European spirit is sucked in. And we serve then the spirit of the European. So that the ultimate challenge of Afrocentric education is to instill the spirit of African, African people. And once that spirit is instilled, we will arise triumphant and bring forth a whole new world order and a new way of being. Thank you very much. to hear Dr. Amos Wilson speak before, and it is truly a, a pleasure and, uh, as I said, a great educational experience. Um, as we all know, unfortunately, our children, our African children, are in crisis, and I think um, Dr. Wilson is going to be able to help us to understand this and maybe offer some suggestions as to some things that we can do as parents and educators to change this. So um, let's please welcome Dr. Amos Wilson. Welcome. For the introduction and for the invitation to be here before you today. I'm going to talk a bit about <clears throat> what I perceive as the post-civil rights era 
officially uh, titled my talk today, Beyond White Racism, Beyond Civil Rights and Human Rights, and Into African Revolution. I'm going to center on the concept of revolution today. And I will tell you why, because I'm sure some of you will uh, think that that's somewhat passe to be talking about revolution. That was something people talked about in the 60s and the 70s, and why I talk about it now. But I think uh, and I hope that as a result of what I have to say here today, you might uh, change your opinion about that particular topic. I'd like to, of course, commend you for your celebration of African history, of African American history. Uh, and of course, we recognize the importance of studying such uh, history. However, I think we still underestimate the value of the study of African history. I think we celebrate it without analyzing it. We uh, search it and look for heroes without understanding that one of its major purposes is to teach us lessons on how to cope with the present and with the future. Not only are those people who do not know their history doomed to repeat it, but those who often misread it were often doomed to repeat it as well. And those who misread and perhaps fail to read it at all may not have a chance to repeat it at all. And I think we have reached this point where our failure to understand history is going to put us in a position where we won't have a chance to learn it again. The survival of our, of our people is at the crossroads today. And our study of history then should be about more than celebrating our heroes, about more than celebrating the struggles, than just keeping eyes on the prize. That, those are valuable things, obviously. <laughs> But we must look at history in terms of coming to understand our current and our future obligations and what must be accomplished by those things. If we will, if we are not careful, we will be beguiled by our study of history. Many of us who have not studied, for instance, Reconstruction history, the history of the United States, particularly of African Americans during the 1860s and 70s may think that we are entering a new era in American history. We may think that the things that we're witnessing today, the elections of blacks to political office, and the appointment to various positions, their activities in various corporations, and so forth, is something new in American history. And yet, study of reconstruction history will uh, quickly convince us that we are currently undergoing deja vu. Many of us see history as a continuing progress upward and onward. We have bought the American concept of progress, the idea that things must over time necessarily get better. There is no law in the universe that tells you that your future survival is assured, that you will continue to exist now and into the future. There have been races and ethnic groups who have been virtually wiped out on this planet. And there is no guarantee that your own group will not be wiped out as well. The idea then that you must necessarily uh, arrive at a point greater than those of your ancestors could possibly be an illusion. The idea that somehow through some great automation you are going to be in a better condition than your people 
is an illusion often of not studying history and recognizing that progressions and regressions occur in history. That integrations and disintegrations occur in history. History is not a fairy tale where certain things are accomplished and then people live happily ever after. And many of us think then that the accomplishments that we've made up to this point means that we are only going to expand them in the future. I think you had better think about that again. And I'll point out today why we, we must not be so optimistic as to be foolish. In fact, let us go back for a moment to an article written in the Ebony Magazine, October 1981, wherein Lerone Bennett, who wrote the book Black Power USA, I think wrote his conclusion to the book. When I read that book, Black Power USA, and I, I guess it was published back in what, the 60s, maybe, or 70s, at least, early 70s. And I finished reading it, I said, the last chapter of this book is missing. You know, and it went on to laud uh, Black Power during the, the uh, Reconstruction era and so forth. And yet, somehow, the, the logical conclusions were not drawn at the end of that book. The lessons that that book implied were not uh, expressed openly and completely. And consequently then, I think some people would have been left with the wrong impression. But lo and behold, he did write the final chapter, but not in the book itself, but in the magazine. The second reconstruction is history repeating itself. This is October 1981. And he titled it, as you can see here, the second time around. Will history repeat itself and rob blacks of the gains of the 1960s? So he's dealing with the issue again. <laughs> we gained it once and we lost it. Is there any law in the universe that says we will not lose it again? And I like the introduction here. He, he, he starts out by saying, over. It was at last, at long last, over and done with. How could anyone doubt it? How could anyone fail to see that the race problem had been solved forever? One man who had no doubt said, all distinctions founded upon race or color have been forever abolished in the United States. Another saw things this way, another who saw things this way said the category of race had been abolished by law and that there were no more colored people in this country. Thus spoke the dreamers and the prophets and victims in the first reconstruction of the, 19, of the 1860s and the 1870s. I don't think I have to elaborate on this kind of attitude. We run into too many youngsters today who say, oh, that was in slavery time. Oh, those were the things that you talk about in the 60s, that's the 60s and the 70s. We're in a new day now. You're not in a new day, ladies and gentlemen. The same words that we were seeing today, the same words that we're seeing today, the same words that people said over 100 years ago. Why are we in a new day when we're saying the same thing that someone said 100 years ago? He goes on to say, and it is worth emphasizing here at the very beginning that these flights into fantasy were based on the same hard facts that gripped the imagination of blacks in the second reconstruction of the 1960s and 70s. There was, for example, a black man in the U.S. Senate in the 1870s. And there was a black governor in Louisiana in the 1860s and the 1870s, as in the 1960s and 1970s, there were black sheriffs and mayors in the South. And there was open speculation about a black vice presidential candidate. So the Jesse Ryan is not new in, in black American history, ladies and gentlemen. There was moreover a network of civil rights laws that seemed to settle the issue beyond all possibility of dispute or recall. Same kind of situation we talked about here today when you try to tell our people 
the laws don't protect anyone. There are so many of us who believe that fair housing laws and uh, anti-discrimination laws, civil rights laws, and voting laws, and so forth, guarantee our freedom. What an illusion. What a flight into fantasy. Laws are no stronger than their enforcers. And the same people who pass those laws are the same people who are responsible for enforcing the law. And if the people then who enforce the law no longer decide to do so, the laws then are of no value and have no power. Ultimately, then, fairness rests, and the fairness of treatment rests, not in laws, but in the activity of people and in the attitude and consciousness of people. And if people who are responsible for enforcing those laws change their attitudes, then the treatment of those people whose freedom is protected by those so-called laws is now changed as well. You cannot put your faith in a white man's law and in laws enforced by whites. I have warned people many times that if it comes one day where the society has to make a choice between feeding white children and feeding black children, no amounts of civil rights laws or any other laws on the books will, not, will prevent those people from feeding their children first. It is a silly faith that we have then in laws. And for people in the 1970s and 80s and 90s to still rest their freedom on the basis of laws, when the very history itself shows us that this cannot be done, we must question their sanity and what they have learned from the study of that history. There was longer a network of civil rights laws that said that seemed to settle the issue beyond all possibility of dispute or recall. Back there, 100 years ago, there was a federal law protecting voting, voting rights in the South. Does this all sound vaguely familiar? And there was a national public accommodations law. So the public accommodations law then began with the Freedom Rides, ladies and gentlemen, in the 1960s. We had those back there in the 1860s and 70s as well. So such in broad outline was the racial situation 100 years ago in the 1860s and 1870s when racism was forever abolished in America for the first time, it was a short forever. And of course, I'm not going to read the whole piece, but there are just segments in here I want to sort of quote, such as, almost, as almost every schoolboy knows, the first Reconstruction ended in a major historical catastrophe that wiped out the gains of the 1860s. As a consequence, it required 100 years and oceans of blood for black people to climb back into the political plateau they have occupied in the 1860s and 70s. So, as I stated earlier, history contains both progress and regress. However, I think regress at this point of history will not be a situation where we uh, will be able to fight a battle all over again. I think regress at this point of history essentially spells annihilation for Africans, not only in America, but for Africans the world over. For as I said, even on to say in Black Power USA, and as Du Bois said before me in Black Reconstruction, Reconstruction in all of its various facets was a supreme lesson for America, the right reading of which might still mark a turning point in our history. So consequently then, as I stated earlier, we must read the history correctly. The mere approaching of history in terms of the celebrating of personalities to a good degree while important is also a misreading of history as well. We must not only celebrate Martin Luther King and the others, we must look at the lessons that history teaches us. He mentions here war on poverty that went on in the 1860s and 70s, the Freedmen Bureau, and, uh, and putting on the books, civil rights laws, which were in some instances stronger 
than the civil rights laws passed in the 1960s and 70s. In the wake of these events, there was an explosive growth in black consciousness, and the blacks made and blacks made political games games which surpassed, in many instances, the political games black made in the 1960s and 70s. A lesson that says what, ladies and gentlemen, that the election of black men and women does not secure the salvation of African people, and that the election of black mayors and governors and you're getting job for white cooperation in no way assures the survival of black people. And we cannot make then the progress of black people synonymous with your qualifying for degrees and you're getting jobs downtown. And we, must, we must wake up to these possibilities because we've had this game played on us before. At one time, in fact, black legislators were in the majority in the South Carolina legislature. In the same period as in the comparable period in the 1960s and 70s, poor whites received social and economic benefits rich whites had denied them. Once we got in, we were good to the poor folks. We, we set up public school systems and all that other thing. The key element, in, and, and he, he goes on then to talk about various other things, that, but I think we should keep in mind here yeah, another of the things, if you have a chance, read this particular article because I think it's very, very uh, important. And this, I'll conclude by reading this. Long discussions about the morals and educational qualifications of blacks obscure the main point. Power or the lack of power. I want to repeat this. Power or the lack of power. The worst thing that can be said about some leaders of the Reconstruction period is that they did not seem to understand that the only issue was power. We don't talk about that issue very much today. Either. It seems to frighten many of us. One final point is relevant to an understanding of the power pop reality of the social movements of both the first and second reconstructions. In both cases, social and political leaders failed to provide the economic balance that made political balance viable. No one understood this better than the black masses of the 1860s who said in marches and demonstrations that their freedom was not secure without a firm economic foundation. So I think again then, when we look at, and celebrate Frederick Douglass and, and um, Harriet Tubman and others, we should again look at a, the essential issues. If, as I will emphasize a bit later on here, your education in this institution is not about gaining real power, not jobs, because your, your jobs do not represent power. Not getting elected as a not represent power either. You are buying your houses and fine clothes does not represent power. If it is not about real power, you are being miseducated and misled, and you will die educated and misled. <laughs> in feeling good about yourself, then you will die feeling good. The study of history then must be more than the pumping up of your self-esteem and the pumping up of your pride. Those things are important, but ultimately those things are not the means by which we will save ourselves as people in this world. We must understand the tremendous value of the study of history for the gaining of power. That's why we study history. History has very practical outcomes and very practical meanings. Why is it, do you think, that the other people object to your putting in an African curriculum in the York City schools? Huh? Do you think it's merely because they hate you? Merely because they don't know, know your history? Merely 
because they're prejudiced. If you think so, you're, you're sadly mistaken. Because these people know, I think better than we do, that a sound approach to history represents an empowerment of a people. Not merely the uh, making them feel good or not. And I read a long piece this summer in the New York Times about the efforts of many blacks to push uh, the African curriculum on college campuses, particularly in California. And of course, one of the white instructors there indicated very clearly that this is about power. They recognize it right away. This is about power. Not just about including black people in the curriculum. This is the way this history will be taught and projected represents who will be in power and who will rule whom in this world today. So consequently, as we raise the issue in New York State about the inclusionary situation, you will see then the, the aspects of uh, white supremacy raising its ugly head. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the current so-called controversy. In the City Sun this week, there is an article called Regents Face Controversial Report on Minorities. And uh, the, the writer here, David Bowder, is uh, writing, uh, makes some quotations from letters received by the uh, Regents and others objecting to the inclusion of, of African history and other people's history into the uh, educational curricula of uh, the state of New York. One woman worried about the destruction of our Western culture. She recognized the destruction of our Western culture. Another woman criticized the regions for a disgraceful anti-white proposal. The inclusion of the truth about African people in history represents an anti-white proposal. On a certain level, though, she's not wrong. And on a certain level, it, uh, the statement about the destruction of Western culture is not wrong. Because Western culture, the enslaver of African people, the destroyer of African people, the degrader of African people should be destroyed. should be removed from power. I will talk to you later. A lot of you want to play games with your minds and hide behind words like racism, as if racism can exist by itself in some kind of vacuum. Thank you. And as if it is not something that must be acted out by real flesh and blood people. You know, it's like when people talk about the economy. Those that think it's the economy, there are people involved in economic activities, real people. White racism is not a concept. It is active people engaged in a certain type of interaction with other people. And if you are to remove racism, you must remove that capacity to engage in these activities. You got to face it up front. But they have you now fighting abstractions with the reality is still destroying you. We're going to come back to this in a minute. One wrote, maybe we need the Klan back. <laughs> of course, they have a dog, really. <laughs> And he described himself as a veteran, a voter, and a taxpayer. <laughs> Tony Brown, of course, mentioned, Tony Brown did a show, a, a series of shows uh, here locally some weeks back. And as a result of that, he wrote that many white Chris think that white people don't pay taxes. You know, they don't think black people have been to war. And the whole so this guy writes as a veteran, a voter, and a taxpayer. <laughs> Somehow, you know, we don't do these things. Raising the specter of racism in education, the task force, that, that is the task force that wrote the report, said New York's history courses overemphasized the contributions of white Europeans and minimized the accomplishment of minorities and largely ignores wrongs committed by whites against others. Critics accused the task force of trying to drive a wedge between the races. <laughs> what a game. Oh, we've been together all this time, I guess. They say the state's education leaders should be more
more concerned with crumbling schools, high dropout rates, and drug addiction, as if these things are not related to the other thing. <laughs> Columnist George Will ended the report, called the report Affirmative Action Run Amok. He said the perverse attempts to purge American culture of Eurocentrism ignore the fundamental truth that the central ideas behind American institutions come from Europe. Hmm. Says that's exactly the point. They come from Europe. I think the report should be thrown away. Diane Ravitch, a history professor at Columbia University, Teacher's College, the premier teacher's college, right? The one that you're so proud to get your degrees from? <laughs> the American Federation of Teachers President Albert Shanker condemning the report's finding labeled it the SOBOL report, that is the commissioner, state commissioner. A recent profile of Governor Mario Cuomo in New York Magazine cited the report in dismissing the SOBOL as one of Cuomo's less than brilliant commissioners, and so forth. So what, why are these people objecting then to history and the history of African people? We must recognize then, ladies and gentlemen, that history is more than merely remembering one's past. That history is a very practical thing. Those of you in psychology, no doubt, have studied the abnormality referred to as amnesia. And if you haven't, look it up and see the effects amnesia has on different on various patients. You think often that not knowing your history will in no way harms you, but certainly it does. As a matter of fact, you are more a victim of history by not knowing it than in knowing it. What happened to African people during the slavery period is pressingly present in the youngest black child today. We must recognize that in the human mind, there is no such thing as the past. In the human mind, the past is always present. And everything you do Every way you look at the world and relate to other people in the world, every way you interpret the world, your very, the very way you move your body, the very way you talk is the result of your historical experience. When we talk about the so-called black dialect, the way black people talk, it's just not merely a way we communicate with each other. The very way we speak, the very words we use, the very tonality that we speak, reflect a history. The, the just talking to our children passes on a history to them. No matter what you were saying, your very voice represents the historical experience. I will talk a bit later on then to have you understand that the psychology of our children is different from that of the psychology of white children. The psychology you are studying in this college are incorrect and are going to, to make you dumber. And in many ways, with all your good intention, send you out to cripple these children and to cripple black people as a whole. Because the psychology of a people, just as the psychology of an individual, develops from the experience of that people. As they, experience, as they develop the experience of the individual. To understand your own individual psychology, a person must understand your own history and experience. They cannot take the psychology of another person based on their history and experience and explain yours. Neither can you take the psychology of another people with a different history and experience and destiny and use that psychology to understand yourselves and to understand your children. And now can you take that psychology and appropriately educate your children and direct your own destiny? It is impossible. And yet you, are, you have classrooms filled with general and, and introductory psychologists written by white men and women. 
and think you're learning something non, some neutral, non-political psychology. No such thing as a neutral and non-political psychology. There is no neutral and non-political course in this institution. And I'm talking even about physics, mathematics, and computer science. I heard some joke the other night, there is no black chemistry. There is no black physics. Lies. Lies. Because you must understand that chemistry and physics and mathematics and all flows from the consciousness and mind of man. They do not exist apart from that. That science flows from the political and social and economic organization of a people. Science just does not pop up in the minds of geniuses. People must exist in a particular political, social, historical context in order for science to develop and to flourish. And unless you know the historical, political context in which science is created and motivated, you will not create science. You will then educate some people who can think in science, and then those same people will be used by your enemies to destroy you and your children. If you saw the program the other evening, about blacks in space. How many of you saw that, Monday? Those Negroes down there making great contributions to whom? To the enemy. <laughs> so that enemy taking advantage of those advanced cameras that they invented, taking advantage of, of the moon uh, vehicles and so forth they invented, can from 500 to 600 miles out in space rain death and destruction on black people on this earth. And therefore, if you do not prepare the appropriate economic and political circumstances in which your children are to operate, they will be hired and be used to destroy you as an individual and to destroy you as people. And I will talk to you later on when you look at a Colin Powell who sits at the, at the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff so-called leading the American armed forces, and the very first time he leads the forces, he leads them against black people. Right. How many of you saw 60 Minutes last week? Yeah. How many saw this colored lady sit there and defend racial discrimination? As a result of of, of investigation in New York State. Two black people uh, exposed activities by major employment agencies, I mean tons of them in the state, who were through code discriminating against black people. And, and, the, and, and two black employees left those agencies because they were sick and tired of the discrimination that was going on. And of course you saw old uh, Abrams there trying to take all the credit. <laughs> what was it, Cosmopolitan Employment Agency? Yeah. Owned by Norell. And of course the CBS crew ran a standard experimental deal where they made a resume, sent a black woman and then sent the white woman. And of course you know the tale. No job for the black woman. And this is the white woman walked in 10 minutes later. Jobs all over the place. Even offered a cab fare to the interview. Wow. Offered to walk into the subway. The whole bit. <laughs> the woman vastly more qualified than the white woman. Was the white woman uh, typing what, 50 words a minute with 15 mistakes? Black woman, 72 words a minute, three mistakes. You know, that kind of stuff. And now, they decided they would go to the spokesperson or whoever it was for the company, and lo and behold, who's sitting there to defend the company? <laughs> and it was a chilling experience to watch her whole body language, her whole expressionless face, and how far and abstracted she was from reality. As the announcer presented her with the memo where the limbo was talking about the practice, and she says, this is not on, uh, uh, she says, our letterhead is not on this memo. We are proud of our letterhead. How far is that from NASA as we sit? <laughs> Coming from anywhere. You know, we are proud of our letterhead. And 
get this kind of game goes on and on. And this is what you're headed for. And this, students, is what you are being prepared to do. You are being prepared to put a black face on white power and to defend white interest. And you must be ignorant of history or misread it in order to play this kind of game. That's one of the reasons why they don't want to put it there correctly and have it correctly understood. Just read one part of something here for a second. And I use this illustration, some of you who may want to see a more extensive uh, discussion of this uh, particular article in the Omni Magazine, February 1984, titled Timeless Mind. You might want to get the lecture I delivered from Brother Brown here at the uh, House of the Lord Church. What well, was it, two Wednesdays ago, I believe where I talk about it, and then I, talk, I discussed it more extensively at African Echoes over a year ago, and Brother Yusuf probably can uh, cue you in on that. I'm just going to read only a fraction of this because it's so filled with meaning. It, uh, it, it reads, when I wake you, the past will be gone. Dr. Bernard Aronson of the New Jersey Neuropsychiatric Institute told a deeply hypnotized student we discussed in the lecture I just mentioned in the House of the Lord about the, uh, the fact that we as a people are in a chronic state of hypnosis. You're in hypnosis right at this moment. These classes that you're going to are hypnotizing you. And I talked about what hypnosis meant and I impressed upon the people the fact that the essential ingredients of hypnosis was a social relationship that is a hypnotist relating to the client in a particular way, you see, and the acceptance of that relationship by both parties and the use of words. That was all. That was all. This thing. That's all that ever goes on in a hypnotic session, isn't it? Two people relating to each other in a social arrangement and words passing back and forth. Doesn't that adequately describe the classroom situation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you think you're really sitting here and there getting information and knowledge? The very fact that you think that that is what's happening means you're at the time. When the post-hypnotic suggestion took hold, the student became drowsy and infantile, losing both memory and the powers of speech. Later he reported a vague sense of meaninglessness. What are we saying here? The hypnotist, by manipulating this man's attitude toward his past, manipulated his consciousness and real capacities and abilities. Just, just not, he just wasn't in a state of illusion. He, he had memory problems. He had problems getting meaning out of life. He, had, he lost his sense of purpose in life. He became lethargic and drowsy and sleepy, you know, fall asleep at night reading the books. Confused. In other words, then, the manipulation of history creates real effects in the individual's personality. So it is not an absence of knowledge that's occurring when you and I talk your history. You are put into a state of consciousness and many of your abilities are wiped out and destroyed as a result thereof. That is why your history is not being taught to you correctly, so that your potential will be forever undeveloped as a people, and you will not challenge those people who rule over you. And even though this world is only ruled over by 10% of its population in Europe, the other 90% it ought to be ruled over must literally be out of their mind. You, as a people, have to be crazy to be in the position that you're in. Your state, your, your, your state of consciousness has to be one that is deceptive, has to be one that is filled with lies and misinformation and misorientation. How can you inhabit the richest continents on this earth and be the poorest people living on it? Exactly. 
How can Japan, with no resources at all, be seen as the richest and most powerful nation on this earth, except that those people who have the earth's natural wealth see themselves as poverty stricken and are poverty stricken in their consciousness? You will see later on then that if the education doesn't wake you up from this, you are still going to be servants. You think, perhaps, that your ability to choose various courses at this school and other schools, your capacity now to choose whether you will be a computer scientist or this or that, means that you have advanced beyond your great-great-grandparents who were slaves. You have not advanced one bit. We don't have time to talk today about what I call the European customs. Those things that remain the same despite all the apparent changes that occur in the world. As a matter of fact, the changes that occur in the world are meant to maintain the very basic constants. Integration is not just a, a, an idea of black people. It is an idea pushed by the white ruling class. You have to understand that. It is to their advantage to run this game on black people's minds. You must understand that the slaves were not mere field hands and house servants. You had slaves with many skills, all types of skills. Carpenters and iron workers and, and millwrights and shipbuilders and you name it, they had it. Many did not just work on the plantations or in the house. They actually went out and followed professional jobs and bought the monies back to their slave master. So the idea that you're picking up a skill does not advance you any farther than they were. Because in the end, the basic constant remains the same. And what is that constant? Working for someone else's profit. It does not matter that you're going to get degrees and whatever you get them in, you'll still end up as your great grandparents were, working for a white man and working for the benefits of other people without working for yourself. So then an education that does not liberate you from this. And in many times in history, ladies and gentlemen, slaves and servants educated their masters, but they were still slaves and servants. So knowledge alone will not free you. The development of skills alone will not free you. You must understand that you have to overthrow the situation that you're in. I demonstrated in the African Echo lecture that it is the forgetting of our history that has robbed us of very practical skills. If you really forgot everything you learned in the past, do you know you wouldn't know how to talk? You wouldn't know how to walk? Do you know that everything you operate on is something you've learned in the past? And forgetting that past means that you learn, you, you forget very practical abilities. This is the case with the people. The Koreans and other uh, Asians and other groups are defeating African Americans in their own communities economically by using the oldest African economic techniques. It's never been around. But because we forgot our history, we forgot the techniques for raising money to get control of our economic circumstances. You understand? So the forgetting of history was not merely a forgetting of heroes and how great we were. It was forgetting economic and other techniques. When you read the history of Shaka Zulu and others, you will learn political science. You will learn how to control nations and empires. You will learn what destroys nations and what maintains nations and groups. You learn then statecraft, administration. You learn all of those things because those things are embedded in history by people. When you look at the black family today, I see many people talking about the black family without first of all defining what the family is and what it's about. Starting a discussion assuming that a, a family is what Europeans say it is, without having any knowledge of the relationship between family and social and political circumstances and historical circumstances, without going back and studying the history of African families. Because if you study the history, you will recognize that Africa presents a whole host of family styles and orientations from which we now, as a people, can choose so that we can create a strong black family today and tomorrow. This is real. 
This means children being loved. This means children being cared for. This means children being appropriately educated. Children being fed and so forth. So the knowing of that history, the understanding of that history, is not merely then a celebration of lost heroes. It is essential to our very functioning and our very survival as a people. And it is essential ultimately to the overthrow of those who rule us. And they are more aware of it than are we. So we must understand the lessons of history and we must study our past. What is the past? Where is the past? It is, not, is it nothing which was something? Is it something left behind, discarded, detached, forgotten, without influence and thereby of no account? Does it or can it exist outside the mind and memory? Or is it not present in our genes? What I, I'm saying here in a minute, when I talk about black children, black children are not children who happen to be black. The very color of your skin is a historical statement, just not a correlation. It represents hundreds and thousands of years of evolution. The very genes that you carry in your body are not merely the mechanism and biochemical means by which your body is maintained and shaped, by which you took on shape and form. Your genes contain the capsulized history of black people since the very beginning of time. The whole evolutionary, political, social, biological, geographical, climatological history of black people is contained right in your genetic structure. And therefore, our children carry the total history of black people right in their bodies today. And therefore, their blackness and their bodies then are not merely bodies that have been colored. Those bodies carry the history and existence of black people, the past, and they must carry the future. Where we, where we carry, or is it not present in our genes, where we carry the evolutionary existence of our kind, and are we not then its present unfolding evolvement and manifestation? Or is it not congealed in concrete and mortar, stone and steel structures and pathways? Is it not still present in its negation, in its reconstitution, when it is transformed into something new? Isn't the new then something old? History, consciousness, unconsciousness, comprehended, uncomprehended, never ceases to be. It is only transformed, as transformation history is always here and now. Here today, there tomorrow, history is past, present, and future. It is destiny. If we will to transform destiny, we must will to transform history. I want to move rapidly into another segment here today where I'm talking, where I wish to talk about revolution. And I am about revolution, and I am about preparing this race for a racial confrontation with those who now rule this earth. Because in this situation, it's either going to be those who rule or us, one way or the other. You want to hold on to your little dreams about little black boys holding hands with little black girls and white girls and so forth. You hold on to them. And you're welcome to them and you can try, you can die dreaming them if you wish. But let's try to wake up to a greater reality. To bring about I indicate when I talk about black children and why I talk about a psychology of the black child. I mentioned the fact, as I mentioned earlier, that the history of black people are different, therefore the psychology of black people is different. Consequently, if you must, if you're going to understand the psychology of black children, you have to understand the history of black people. And therefore, as I stated to you earlier, you cannot go to European psychology to deal with the psychology of black children. That's one reason why I wrote the developmental psychology of the black child. The other reason, of course, was the fact that the black child's body is not a duplicate 
of the European child's body. We are not colored people who are merely different according to, uh, to the color of our skin. It's more to it than that, ladies and gentlemen. Your children represent the oldest race on this earth, the mother and father and all other of the races. They represent, as I told you earlier, that total history, their bodies, as such. So they are not duplicates of white children. Another circumstance that I pointed out how they are born intellectually more advanced than is a white child. They do things on their first day of life, the second day of life, that it takes a white child six or more months to do. They come out with the brain that if you test it through EEG and other methods, demonstrates very clearly that they're more intellectually advanced than those of white children. You must understand history is not merely something that happens to people, it becomes a total part of their body and their existence. And you must understand that history to understand your children. And it's to fail you to understand that. I also demonstrate that history is not something that just occurs. We must study psychohistory. That is the psychological results of undergoing historical experiences. And to a very great extent, the problem with the education of black children, the crack epidemic, and all of these other things we complain about day in and day out are the result of a psychology that, it, that flowed from a particular type of historical experience. You have a school system that is based upon the psychology of white children and white people. And you are trying then to educate your children on the basis of that, that system. They are bound to fail. The very structure of this college itself is based upon a white model. And therefore, it has a built-in failure mechanism for Thank you. you, one way or the other. Because you don't understand that your historical experience has changed the very way you think. Your very style of thinking, your very style of learning, your very style of relating one to the other has been transformed by your historical experience. You must understand. When you go into your psychology classes, you must understand that in order for the European to maintain his rulership over the world, even though he's 10 percent of the world's population, he must keep black people in a particular state of mind. It is necessary that you be backward. It is necessary that this room be sparsely attended today, as it is with the college of the South. I don't believe in them. I hate their guts. I intend for them to stay on the bottom barrel 
and you just make all kinds of sacrifices to push them in there. Then you might, they can't read, they can't write, they're so misbehaving. <laughs> Don't you know you, you have to be in that position if you're to be ruled over? You think it's going to be the other way around? But somehow we try again and again to accomplish the same thing by the same failing means. Don't you know that is the premier sign of neurotic behavior? Doing the same thing over and over again, despite the fact that it fails time and time again, and the only solution is to try it harder and harder and harder. That's just the essence of neurotic behavior. And yet we fall for it. Every maladjustive characteristic that you find in the black personality, the inability to get along one with the other, the inability to be reliable in our relationships one to the other, the inability to trust each other, you see, the inability to really love each other well and deeply, the lack of self-confidence, the lack of self-acceptance, the rush we get from buying from other people other than ourselves and so forth, all of those things have been implanted in the personality and they serve economic functions. And they maintain a, a power situation, ladies and gentlemen. They are not things that just happen to be in your personality. They have been instilled through a historical brainwashing into the personality. So that people can say, well, you're free to develop businesses, and you're free to do this, but the problem is you don't trust each other enough, you get to go to it so you can't pull it together. And you have to understand then that a black psychology, an African-American psychology, must begin at the political necessity for African Americans to be crazy. Not with Pavlov's dogs. You must understand that even the demonstration of psychology in terms of dogs is a political game. Right? You think when Skinner writes about rats and cats and, and rats and things like that, he's being non-political. Got another thought coming. You have to recognize that you are the rat. You understand? That your ghettos are the Skinner boxes. That the relationship between the experimenter and the rat is a power relationship. And the rat is conditioned because of the differences in power between the rat and the man. And that the rat becomes conditioned and changed as a result of the fact that the man has control of vital things in his life. And if you think you can let another people feed you and water you and clothe you and, and hire you and so forth, and they not transform you like that rat, you got another thought coming. And if you don't learn that in your psychology class, you are being made dumb.
He's being mighty. Let's give him a big hand, Dr. Amos Wilson. It's a pleasure to be back here with you again this evening and to invite to be invited to share this time with you. I'm uh, very pleased to hear about the thank the think tank, the uh, efforts that you're making there, Brother Maddox, in terms of uh, developing a very important and needed institution in our community. It's interesting that uh, much of, I found that uh, many of us who are nationalists and nationalistic in orientation, of course, think along parallel lines and we have a certain kind of rhythm because, let's see, since I left you the last time, I've been fully engaged in developing uh, my manual for power. You remember when I said the last time I said that I would do about 10 weeks, 10 weeks of seminars on power and how power is to be achieved and developed. I'm on the last lecture now, so we'll be pretty, pretty soon we'll be ready to uh, produce the seminars. A major part of those seminars, I decided I'd write out the lectures first, so that's why I have postponed them until I finished the, the lectures because I looked at power and a number of its bases, the, its economic bases, cultural bases, uh, how it's based and related to the family, uh, and in, in a number of other ways so that we can be very clear as to how we can develop power and use that power in our interests as a people. One of the longer sections that I worked on had to do with the think tanks and the role of think tanks in the organization of power. In fact, I reviewed quite a few of the think tanks used by the ruling class in this country. And as a part of the seminars, we will go over those think, uh, think tanks, look at how they operate, what role they play in the society, how they form a major part, in fact, the central part, of the ruling class policy formation network and the ideology formation network. How you move from the think tank into the universities, into the seminars, float the ideas into the media, use the think tanks to create expertise, and get the experts located in the government so that they actually begin to turn ideology into policy. I deal then with power, of course, I deal with it not from the point of view of how we are victimized by it, but how we ourselves are going to use it in our interest and use it in a positive manner. So a good deal of the lecture deals with how we ourselves will organize our think tanks and how those tanks are related to the network of structures in the African American community. We are looking at um, Chancellor Williams' master plan and using that to bounce off of in terms of ultimately creating a nation within a nation. And based on the concept of nation within a nation, we want to create the kind of organizations that would permit us to overthrow the European nations and the European systems. You must keep that in mind. If that's not your goal, you're not about power. If that is not your goal, you're really not about education. You see, what do I say? The function of education, first and foremost, 
is to maintain the biological survival of a people yes, sir. and to advance their interests, yes, to defend their interests and their very lives, and to enhance their quality of life. If your education does not function in those terms, then it is miseducation. It does not matter how much knowledge you have accumulated, how competent you are in terms of your skills and so forth, if you are not able to defend your very biological life, to defend the life of your people and advance their interests, then you have been miseducated. See, and we have to, we have to recognize one thing you see here, as I spoke earlier today, about the uh, ideology of individualism, where, uh, and a part of that ideology has the, the thinking of education as individual salvation, and has us thinking that education basically is primarily functional for the individual, for the individual to get a job, for the individual to qualify. So each of us is going to make his or her own individual contract with the system that dominates us. Each one of us then thinks that we can engage in individual salvation. This is destructive and will lead to the destruction of African American people and African people. We will die with tremendous amounts of knowledge and skills in our heads. If those skills and if the knowledge is not coordinated and combined in the sense of nation and in the sense of peoplehood. No amount of individual accumulation and knowledge and skills will save us as a people. It is only when that accumulated knowledge and the accumulated skills that we have are coordinated under the banner of nationhood and peoplehood will we then save ourselves as a people and we will be saved individually as persons. We must keep this in mind. So, uh, it's a good thing that uh, we're doing the think tank here. It's a good thing that shortly thereafter, I think my own work and the work of those who support me will be out supportive of that idea. Uh, we just want to announce quickly here that Brother Mark is back there with a few of the books. If you care for any of them, those of you uh, who are not familiar with what we're doing here, you have to recognize we now have four books out, The Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, Awakening the Natural Genius of Black Children, Understanding Black Adolescent Male Violence, which is a companion book to Black on Black Violence. We are trying to put together here then a set of books that are connected one with the other. These books are not being uh, published individually, they're really being published as a unit. So that we'll be able to move from childhood, as in the developmental psychology of the black child, right to the book that will be published later on in the fall, Educating Black Children for the 21st Century. Thank you. This evening we're going to talk a brief bit about education and a little bit about so-called special ed, even though I'm not going to go into detail about that uh, at all. I'm going to sort of use learning disabilities as sort of a paradigm in terms of education. I try to urge people when we talk about the problems that confront us that we must talk about them within the context in which they occur. It's very important that we begin at the beginning. Too often people begin to discuss problems and issues too late in the sequential chain of events, you see. Instead of starting at the beginning, they will start on the third or fourth link. And despite their good intentions and so forth, they will often arrive at the wrong conclusion uh, because they have not started at the right beginning here. As I have pointed out in other, kind, in other facilities, we must start with the 
fact that we are a dominated people. That's very important that we keep this in mind. I am beginning to urge now that we start to discuss domination and the psychology of domination. And we focus on that because it will permit us to see many problems and issues and to predict many events in the future. I, I suggest that we engage in that before we engage in the discussion of racism. Because racism is a secondary quality of domination. It is an instrument of domination. The first thing is the desire to dominate. The second thing is then to choose the instruments of domination, of which racism is but one. There are a number of instruments of domination, and we, we're going to go through those in our seminars in terms of the various forms of domination and the various means by which domination is attained and maintained. Look at domination. Recognize, they have said in other assemblies, that domination is a social problem. When you say that you have dominated, or that we have dominated as a people, we are saying that we have a problem. You cannot be dominated without having a problem. You cannot be, as we are, dependent on another people the way we are at this point without having problems. We cannot be vulnerable to annihilation and genocidal destruction without saying that we have problems. And when I talk about then our people being dominated, I'm talking about not only are we under a system which seeks to control our behavior and its interest, but we are also in a system where we are greatly exposed to genocidal destruction because we do not have a countervailing power to defend ourselves as a people. At this point, our lives hang on a thread. If the United States and Russia and other nations were to combine their military and other forces against us, we must ask ourselves what African nations and people could arise in our defense. That's why I told you earlier that a part of the education of our children must be an education into military strategy and must be an education that ultimately leads to our capacity to defend ourselves militarily. What did we say about the major essence of domination? That this society, though it rewards us, this establishment, though it rewards us, to maintain its control, if necessary, will kill us. And you must keep in mind that the European never, 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 never intends to give up control of African American people. <laughs> never intends to, to uh, not be in a position to dominate us as a people. Never. And if it is necessary, and we've seen it already, we see it every day, for those people to kill us, to maintain control, they are going to engage in that. You keep that in mind, because see, there are some of those who are being rewarded by the system, you see, and they, they see themselves being elevated in it, and they think, therefore, it is changing, and its nature is changing, and its program is changed. You manipulate both through reward and punishment. So people who want to manipulate and control others may at times reward those they want to control, and if necessary, destroy them on the other end. So you cannot assume because you're being rewarded by the system or promoted in it or given some so-called new liberties and so forth that this means that the system is becoming soft and is changing its own uh, drive, focus, and purpose. Not at all. The purpose and focus of this system remains the same. And that is to maintain white global supremacy. And we have to keep that in mind. How many people have seen, have seen a series of programs with Derrick Bell? Derrick Bell, the uh, Harvard professor, used to be? Yes, constitutional lawyer, taught constitutional law at Harvard University. Yes, Donahue, he's been on Donahue. Uh, 
the gentleman on channel 13, Charlie Rose, uh, on this, the gentleman that comes on Saturday during the day from Rutgers University, I forget his name at the moment. And you see this thing again and again. He has a current book out called Faces in the Well, of, of something of that nature. And of course, we are supposedly the ones in the well. <laughs> uh, and it's interesting because he, his subtitle is something like The Permanence of Racism. that these white liberals start agonizing over when they talk about it, talk to him, and it's interesting to watch them. Isn't this a statement of despair? Aren't you now just giving up, they tell him? When you say racism is permanent, you know, how can then you encourage black people, and of course he struggles with it as best he can, I need to be congratulated to have moved to that point where at last after 30 or 40 years of assimilationism he recognizes that the white man is not going to change fundamentally. So he needs to be congratulated about that. And he says that every time we get a, a step forward the whites figure out another way to negate it. 30 years, 40 years to realize this. But he got there. Now he needs to make the next step, which is the step toward revolution. Yeah. But he's afraid to make that and so forth. And listen to the title, The Permanence of Racism. And the reason why the white liberals agonize over it, the title is the way they read into the title. That is, they read the permanence of white racism. But he says, well, the permanence of what? Racism. And apparently he himself tends to think that. But who says why racism is permanent? Why does it have to be permanent? You understand? The statement is not a statement of despair. It's a similar kind of statement that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad made. That the white man is what? Your natural enemy. Yes. Yes. That's not a statement of this, this despair. That is a declaration of law. Yes. When you recognize that this man is your natural enemy, that this man is habitually and innately racist, that means then you got to give up the hope that he will ever be transformed and you must remove his capacity to practice his racism. It means you must educate yourself and organize yourself to bring it to an end. On the other side, too, if you are going to say racism is permanent, it recognizes then that even other races will seek to dominate us and to control us. So if racism is permanent, then let us make sure that we as a race are on top of the heap. Oh yes, if you say it's permanent, then you better make yourself in a position where you won't be affected by it. But you see, you don't want to understand the honor of Elijah Muhammad. You soon as he even mentioned racial superiority to frighten you to death. I saw more people get excited about the idea of black superiority than they ever did about white superiority. So on two levels, we must deal with, with racism and must recognize then if it is permanent, whether it's white racism, or any other kind of racism, the African American community must develop itself to defend itself successfully against the racism of other groups. And we're going to get to that. When you make that your goal and your purpose, it revolutionizes your approach to education, to socializing your children, to organizing your community. When you are filled with the feudal hope that someday, some way, these white boys and little white girls are going to hold hands with little black boys and little white girls. That kind of wishful thinking is going to retard you mentally, socially, and economically.
friend, Brother Maddox, you're talking about thinking. And it's very important that you're putting the emphasis on that. Extremely important. Extremely important. Thinking is the greatest threat to the European. The greatest threat of all. One of the forms of thinking, and, and in, in educating the black child for the 21st century, I go through a whole series of thinking styles and I lay out why those thinking styles had to be repressed in African American people. And the economic and social political role that they play in their repression in maintaining white supremacy. And I named them one by one. Why uh, do we have problems with conceptual thought, abstract thinking, thinking in analogies, hypothetical thinking, understand logical kinds of thought? It has nothing to do with academic issues in this fundamental basis. It has to do with maintaining political dominance. And this just shows up in the academic setting. And we misinterpret it as an academic problem, you see. Hypothetical thinking, let's look at that quickly. Thinking in terms of the as if, or the what if. You see, a lot of our people back off of that immediately when you say, well, what if? Let's, let's act as if. Hold on, hold on, we want to deal with the concrete. Let's deal right now with the thing right in front of us. You see, this is exactly the way people want you to think. Because it is reactionary. It is a kind of thinking that waits until the disaster has occurred before the individual can engage in action. It is not the kind of thinking where the action can be predicted far in the future so that the individual has time to prepare for it. But you see, that's what hypothetical kind of thinking will allow. See, for one, to prepare and to prevent, you see, and to forestall events. But when you make people think concretely and think reactionarily, the event is already occurring. And one of these days, that event will be our annihilation. We won't have time for protest marches. We won't have time to petition the Supreme Court. We won't have time to do the kind of things we're doing because it will be happening right to us right then and right now. However, if you study domination, you can see its development and see where it's going long before it gets there. If you act on the what if, the hypothetical, you can prepare for coming events and be ready for them when they occur, or you can go to meet them and block them before they even get started. Yes. I told you before, there are those of us who are very interested in discovering conspiracies. And that is very important to discover conspiracies. But often, ladies and gentlemen, when you have discovered the conspiracy and the conspirators, it's already too late. They're already on you. What you study is the capacity of those others who can destroy us if they choose to do so. What you look at is what? Capacity to do, not intention to do. You see, you see, we'd rather let the right man and other people have knowledge of AIDS and germ warfare and chemical warfare and all of these things as long as we don't detect in them an intention to use them against us. And then we're going to go into action as soon as we discover that they have an intention to do us in. At that point, it's too late. It's too late. As soon as we discover who the conspirators are, let's pick them out and see where they are. At that point, it's over. You don't have time to prepare to deal with germ warfare at that point. You don't have time to deal with chemical warfare and stuff at that point. You understand what I'm saying? What you must look at is what are these people incapable of doing if they choose one day to do it. I'm not worried about whether they intend to do it, whether they are conspiring to do it. All I know is that they are capable of doing it and for a reason I may not foresee, they may decide one day to what? Do it. And it's the fact that they have the capacity that is going to motivate me to develop a defense and an offensive.
Gracias. This is where you go with hypothetical thinking. And you lay out a lot of ifs and propositions. But you see, a lot of us start going to sleep. You know, you're talking theory. You know, you uh -uh. this is theory is the greatest reality, I'm telling you. Theory is concrete. You see? Why? Because you're in a win-win position. Right? In this situation. If they never use it, you're okay. You know, you haven't lost anything, have you? If you have been prepared that if they should do it, you're also okay because you're in a position to defend yourself against it. You see, so when you operate it on the hypothetical and prepared in terms of the hypothetical, you win either way. Whether they never get around to it, or if they do, being able to do what? Successfully defend yourself against them when they do or before they do. But if you sit around and wait to watch and see when they're going to do it, or wait until they do it, at that point you have a strategic and tactical disadvantage, and you will be overrun. As a matter of fact, being prepared to deal with them often is the very thing that keeps them from making their move. But in order to do that, you must develop appropriate forms of thought. You must develop a kind of abstract thinking that removes you from the immediate world into the distant future, and you must be able to organize current behavior, social relations, and institutions in terms of the distant future. You understand? Therefore, abstraction which removes the individual from the immediate circumstances and propose, makes propositions about the future then becomes the foundation for concrete action. It's not just a playing with ideas. It is the vehicle for concrete activity and preparation. But you see, in order for the Europeans to control us, in order for the Europeans to keep us constantly off balance, in order for the Europeans to be in a position to launch a surprise attack against us, they must repress hypothetical thinking in African American people. They must make us uninterested in hypothetical thinking. They must make us devalue that kind of thought and devalue people who engage in it. You see? And therefore, as I will talk a little later on, the whole social system is organized to destroy these kinds of thinking styles in African people. White paternalism said, look, you don't have to worry about the future, we're going to take care of that for you. <laughs> so, right, you don't need to project into the future. You're not in charge of your future, therefore you don't need to, to organize for it. You see, what did we said before? Why are so many of our people caught up in immediate gratification? Why is the attention span of African people so short? Of course, it has to be short, you know, so that we can forget all of the atrocities committed against us in the past. So that we can forget immediately, two weeks later, every insult that has been visited upon us as a people. And yet you see other people keeping memories alive and sometimes not getting their revenge until three and four or five hundred years later. Because they don't let their history die. But here we have a people for a hot dog and for a cup of coffee at an integrated lunch counter are willing to forget every insult to their ancestors that ever happened. What does it mean then? The loss of memory by African American people the shortness of the attention span becomes politically and economically productive for those people who destroyed their memories in the first place and destroyed their ancestors. When you get a people then who place their faith into, in, in, on, in their enemies and see their enemies as the creators of the future, they will not develop abstract thinking and develop uh, behavior in terms of future projections, they will leave it to the others. And you know what I said, you know, we are always in wonderment. Lord, what are they going to do next? You know, what are we
we are going to do that. That's because of me. Not because they are going to do that. And, and so we will show how many of these thinking styles are designed to maintain political uh, stability and white supremacy. So what do you have here in the African American mind? A mind that has been made bereft of its past. And you see, it takes abstraction to also visit the past, doesn't it? In other words, in order to deal with the past, you have to leave the immediate circumstances and return back to a time that no longer exists in concrete terms. Think about that past. Draw knowledge and information from that past. Draw wisdom from that past. Draw all kinds of conclusions and inferences from that past and use that the past experience, past knowledge, and all of these things to deal with current and future problems. But when you let another people destroy your interest in your past, in your past experiences, in, the, in their past as well, then you lose concrete coping skills and possibilities. You cannot bring to bear many things that have been already generated and used them as tool for confronting current problems and future problems. He puts you then at a disadvantage uh, 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 in the face of people who have long memories and who look at their past constantly and consistently and who keep re-examining their past for lessons and principles and methods and so forth that they use to defend their interests and to advance their interests. Therefore, they, they must develop in their children the capacity to abstract themselves from immediate circumstances and to project into the past and take from the past those gifts that the past had to offer so that they can take those past experiences and take those gifts and recombinate them into new syntheses and to create new combinations of possible solutions to solve the problems that confront them. But when you want to keep the people imprisoned, you make them forget their past. Yes. You must understand that identity and consciousness is a part of a grid of coordinates. We locate who we are and we identify who we are and what we are in relationship to other points in mental space. We know who we are and what we are by comparing ourselves to where we have come from and where we are going and how we are related to various other important points in time. But when you have lost your past and lost the history of your past, you don't know why you are where you are, how you got to where you are. You don't even know where you are. And you don't know where you're going. And you don't know who you are. Because identity rests in a sense of continuity. That there is something in me that has existed and continued from the very first day of birth. And I use that sense of continuity to say who I am and what I am about. And therefore, when a people lose that sense of continuity from their birth and through their history, they lose a sense of who they are and what they are about. They cannot locate themselves in time and space. And a people then who are not determining where they are going also have that same problem. And so what have we done? We've let the Europeans steal our history from us. And we let the European also steal our future from us. And then we complain about our children and ourselves being caught up in immediate gratification. But what else can you be caught up in if you have no future and no past but the present? And so consequently, children, our children in these schools, confronting academic and other problems, which requires that they use abstraction, which requires that they project a purpose and organize their thinking and behavior in terms of their future projection, 
could comprise that they look back and see what information is already available and how that information can be utilized to get them where they're going. When a people have been robbed of their history, of their past, and their future, they will have children then who will have problems in the classroom situation, which depends this kind of thinking. Understand? That's why, ladies and gentlemen, if you are to solve the academic problems of African American children, you must solve the political and economic problem of African American people. You must solve the problem of being dominated by Europeans. Because that domination will create and shape your thinking styles and thought styles and behavioral styles and emotional styles. You have to understand that. And wish you had time to talk about some of these things. There's a lot of confusion around here. We, we, we got some African people around here want to identify thinking imprecisely as an African form of thought. Oh yes. And they want to tell African people that we are only an intuitive people. And that we are only satisfied with approximate thinking, not precise thinking. Don't fall for that baloney. First of all, the study of the history of Egyptian civilization and our other civilization will get you off that kick about African people not being precise. Okay, be very careful. Do not paint European stereotypes of African mentality in the red, black, and green. Okay? Oh yeah, because we got some people who run in this kind of game. When it comes down to hard, straightforward, precise thinking, logical, critical analysis, we have some jokers that say, well, you know, African people are an intuitive people. So, you know, we're just going to uh, intuit this. <laughs> Come on. You got two sides of the brain here. You got a left side and a right side. And you must use them all. Well, you know, we are an emotional and a feeling people. What's that nonsense? Because it is through our emotions and our feelings that our enemies manipulate us. Yes. In order for us to be dominated as a people, we have to be predominantly emotional. And we have to be predominantly guided by feelings. You see, and not know when feeling is appropriate and intuition feeds the thinking process rather than intuition totally dominating the process. You cannot make them. African people are intuitive and precise. We are non-linear and linear thinkers. Understand? We are concrete and abstract. The essence of African education must ultimately mean that we become bicognitive, which means that we use both sides of our brain. And we use them appropriately. Don't come telling me that we only have one form of thinking. You see, and that we cannot acquire other forms of thinking and that we should not acquire other forms of thinking. Uh -uh. That would mean that your creator then has built in a disadvantage, an adaptational disadvantage for you. That says now that you face a group of linear thinkers, you face a group of people who think abstractly and conceptually, and who use that thinking to develop weapons and means of manipulating and controlling you, you being an African should not or cannot develop the kind of thinking necessary to block their intentions. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. We're not buying that. We're going to think intuitively when it's productive for us. 
And we're going to think conceptually and abstractly and linearly who is also productive for us. I've given you an example of that, of the Star Trek situation. Remember, Star Trek is a, is a good example there. We had Mr. Spock, the linear thinker, half man, because he has no feelings, no human qualities. But he's analytical and objective and thinking, and that gives him certain advantages, but he's still not fully developed. That's European man. Then we have Dr. Bones, filled with human emotion and not us. But that places him often at disadvantage because he's too overrun by feeling and emotions. He cannot detach himself at, right, at, at, at appropriate times from his feelings and his emotions. So these two people are the helpmates of Captain Kirk, who is what? Both objective and feeling. You see, he's able when necessary to detach himself and analyze and critically work with the problem. And at other times to allow his feelings and intuition to operate. That's why he's the captain of the ship. And therefore, African men and women, if we as African people want to be captain of the ship Earth and captains of the universe, we will let the other people be one-sided, left brain only or right brain only. We're going to use our whole brain. <laughs> and African civil education is whole brain education. Whole person education, whole body education, whole spirit education. It uses all of the possibilities and uses them appropriately. So let's 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 we have to recognize at the center of African civic education is not only the education into culture and history and so forth. That's extremely important. Because culture is also a way of thinking. More than anything else, culture is a way of thinking and of conceptualizing the world. Not just a way of dressing, a way of dancing, the ways of rituals, that's a part of culture, yes. But on a fundamental level, culture is an intellectual system. It is a system by which people comprehend their world and solve the problems that confront them in their world. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, when African people reclaim African culture and reclaim their identity and consciousness and reclaim their intentionality to be free of any domination by anybody, you will see an intellectual and creative explosion that has only been equaled by Egypt in the past. Because we got the mind for it. We got the brains for it. But let me quickly move on here. I, I, I'm always running over time. But we'll just we'll run quickly through the presentation here this evening. Remember that what I'm saying? Domination is a social problem. Domination creates social problems. Those who dominate benefit from their domination. Keep that in mind. Therefore, they have an investment in perpetuating the problems generated by domination. Okay? You must keep that in mind. Then you will never be surprised why these programs white people propose never work out. And no matter how much they talk about education, it never works. No matter how much they talk about crime reduction, it means we end up in jail. Why they have never solved the problem? Because they have a what? An investment in maintaining the problem. Our problems are sources of their political and economic domination. You understand? 
Some gentleman called me one day when I was on Gilmore Home Show a few weeks ago. And uh, he said, you know, I got a movie and he was looking for support. And he gave me a scenario of the movie he had that was going to present a real uh, uh, nice black adolescent who was doing good things in the world. And he was saying he couldn't get any support for that. You know? Because he wanted this young man to represent, you know, a positive image and perhaps to persuade other people that we weren't all bad. And to, to, to provide a model for other black adolescents. And, you know, that's, that's reasonable and that's a credible uh, thing. But of course, the thing that he ran up against was the fact that he didn't get support from those people in Hollywood. In fact, one or two of them told him, look, we want criminal black young men. <laughs> You know, I'd like to come back and bring us a movie about black criminality and so forth, then we'll find you. Why? Because the image of the black criminal is worth millions of dollars in Hollywood. Billions of dollars. Right? When you project the young black male as criminal, you can fill the theaters. And the people who fill the theaters first are home. Black folk. Black folk. Along with the others. So you know these people are not going to give up that image. It's worth billions to them. You understand what I'm saying? They are invested in that image. That image is worth what? Money to them. I mentioned it today, if you look at this month's Essence magazine, the first fold that you will get after the first page is a nine-page spread that folds right out of the magazine. Nine pages. Full color. Do you know what a full page, first page in every magazine will cost you? Close to forty to fifty thousand dollars per page. And you thought that was a black magazine, didn't you? <laughs> there is no black magazine out here. Tell it, Tell it. Essence magazine represents the greatest economic triumph of white folk among black people. <laughs> the articles are just put in there for a little variety. Essence magazine, Ebony magazine, and Mold magazine are nothing but advertising sheets for white folk. And they're the instruments by which we sell the black community to the white economic structure. The articles are in there merely for variety. And that is why you're not going to find any revolutionary articles in there. That is why you're going to find Emerge Magazine writing about Dr. Jeffries and not permitting him to write in it so that they can control the concept of who he is and what he is. That is why in the Emerge magazine they will pretend to speak to real issues, but they make sure they're edited it in a way that they will not insult those white advertisers. Yes, and if they deal with a strong issue, you will see the lead editorial on the first page mm -hmm. trying to kick down or reduce the possibility of reaction. Look at it. You're going to tell me every magazine is a means by which black business can move all the way out of your <laughs> One inch of that magazine will cost you $1,000 and $175. One inch, a one inch column piece. Black and white page will cost you around $25 or $30,000. A full color front, uh, uh, first page of the magazine, Four colors, fifty thousand dollars. You think that's your vehicle to, to get to the black market? You know, in your mind. <laughs> so when you look at Essence magazine with that nine-page photo, and I don't know what that rates. I was afraid to ask them. Had to ask Emily what his rates were. I thought I was going to have to have these books in it. Forget it. <laughs> but even if Essence sells one full page for twenty thousand dollars a piece. You're talking about an advertiser that's paying a minimum of what? $180,000. Okay? Now, if those were edited pages, you're talking about what? You're talking about
talking about uh, what nine times fifty thousand, four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You know Johnson is not going to rock that boat. Don't you know, ladies and gentlemen, that is so-called black success that imprisons us? Yes. When that success depends upon the patronage of other people. Yes. That is why every magazine, for every magazine, many of the problems and issues that emerge pretends to deal with, but even it pretends they don't even exist. It can't. And when you turn this Essence magazine this month, you will see one cosmetic ad after another. One right after the other, every almost every day. Beautiful ads. Benson and Hedges, a full page golden pack of cigarettes. Beautiful picture. Yes, and a part of this game that told ladies you have come a long way, baby, and tried to make them identify freedom with enslavement by saying that if you enslave yourself to a smoking habit, it means that you are free. <laughs> so you will symbolize your freedom by becoming addicted. But this is the kind of game, this is the way this system must work. I told you before, Rob, in order for this system to work, black people must feel freest when they are what? Most enslaved. Yes. And we must see our enslavement as the essence of freedom. And we look at our magazines enslaved to white advertisers. And we see that as freedom of the press. You're out of your mind. It won't happen. Why are so many cosmetics ads there? And why has Reverend gone into very special research to deal with the black skin? Oh yes, yes, you understand? But you must recognize that blacks were what? 12 or 15 percent of the population are buying 40 percent of the cosmetics. All right? And a good deal of why we are buying those cosmetics is because we are uncomfortable with who we are and what we are as African We have a problem with our natural African beauty. And this industry makes tons of money, enough to invest from $180,000 a month to a half million dollars a month in that problem. And they got to earn their money back and more. So consequently, it is not in their interest that black people never have a problem with the African selves. It's too valuable. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. And we can go on with one problem after another, and I can demonstrate to you any problem that you can name that African people have is an economic, political benefit to Europeans, and they have an investment in maintaining it. And that also involves the problems we have with thinking, the problems we have with education, problem we have with the and any of the others you may name. You must, keep, if you keep these principles in mind, then it will become very clear what's going on. The system, in order to maintain its domination, must generate problems. It must perpetuate those problems. That's why in the end, you've got to destroy it. You see, there are some of us who think and who think that I came here tonight to talk about re how you rehabilitate learning disabled children. <laughs> uh, kidding. I told my class, and I have a class over there, Children at Risk. As I know you expect me to come in right on board, the characteristics of the children at risk. They behave this way, they look this way, they think this way, you know, they come from this kind of family. Yeah. Forget it. Forget it, I didn't come here to do that. The first thing I come here to ask you is, what? Who put them at risk? That's another one question. These are children. Why are they at risk? This is the thing you gotta ask. You see? Who benefits from them being what? At risk. 
You see, if you get these decontextualized white books and these approaches, they will start with the child as it is and with the symptoms that the child presents. And then it's going to get you into a remediational psychology. How do you cure them after they get the problem? And I told my class, I'm not going to sit here and lay out a lot of remediational approaches either. <laughs> That's not the first thing I'm going to do. You know why? Because if you had a remediational approach that was picture perfect, that worked 100% of the time, let us propose that you discover a method of rehabilitating learning disabled children that really works. So 100% of the children came in, that went into the program, came out abled. Would that solve your problem? The problem isn't solved. Because you are working with them when? After the problem has occurred. The system that is generating the problem is still doing what? Generating the problem. And even though you may have the perfect system that operates once they get in there, the system is going to be generating them so fast, they're going to overrun your capacity. And all you can do, we need more social workers, we need more psychologists, we need more school discipline, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you can run over. So the deal is then, while we will look at remediational approaches, we must ultimately look at preventative approaches. We must nip the problems in the bud, and we must prevent and knock out that generated machine. Yes, we must destroy the generator of the problem. Yes, sir. But you can get so caught up in remediation and dealing with the problem until you forget to block it at its source. And the generator of the problems, ladies and gentlemen, is the power differential between African American people and European people. That problem flows out of our relative powerlessness. These people generate these problems because they have the power to do so. And we can prevent them from generating these problems by neutralizing their power and their capacity. That is why then when we study children at risk, we don't sit around and do a whole menu of characteristics all the time. We are busy developing strategy to end the generator and to destroy white power, which is the generator of the problem, and destroy white supremacy, which is invested in the problems, and even invest itself in the remedial program, by the way. You see, what do we say here? We have a system that generates the problems, and then it pretends that it's got the method for curing it. So it profits on both ends. It profits by generating the problem and crippling the mentality and behavior of our people, crippling our communities, crippling our power as a people. And it makes tons of money, as I have just indicated, by doing this on the front end. And then it comes around the back end and pretends that it's got a solution to the problem. And it sends in its agencies and humanitarian workers and helping professionals who then come in to help themselves to us again. Right. And so we're ripped off twice. Right. We gotta end this game. You gotta ask the question, why is it that despite all of this so-called educational technology, despite all of the, uh, the, the sophisticated thinking and learning, we're never able to solve problems we, uh, in, uh, that black people face? The answer to it, of course, is that the problem must continue to exist. We have to end domination. The educational establishment is a part of that system. There are a lot of people who like to take education out of the mix. No, no, no. The educational establishment is as much a part of the system of domination as is any other establishment in this system. There is no exception. It is a major establishment. Racial domination and ruling class supremacy are institutions. The principal functions of institutions is self-perpetuation. Any man of sociology course will tell you that institutions live to do what? Perpetuate themselves and to expand themselves. And to do that, they, they issue 
ideologies that justify their existence. And they generate evidence to justify their, uh, their existence and which, to, and which justifies the necessity for their existence. This is the basic role of institutions. You see, one of the benefits of power is that you can project an ideology that justifies your reason for having it. And then you can actually generate evidence which also can be used to justify your reason. You see? And you gotta look at the fact then that the system generates its evidence. And we, we, I talked to you about that in, 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 in Black on Black Violence. We rule over black people because they're innately criminal. We rule over black people because they have difficulty learning. You see? Therefore, we have these establishments and programs and everything, and they exist to deal with these issues and problems. But watch out. It's the very institutions and programs that also do what? Generate the problem. You see? And create the problem. I told you about the power of, of, of projection in black on black violence. Mm -hmm. The white man projects his criminality onto black people. You see? And it's he who is not the criminal, but black people who are the criminal. And when you combinate that projection with his power, that projection process becomes a process of what? Creation. Because when he believes that you're a criminal, you believe that you're innately less intelligent. His power over the purse, his power to control the conditions under which we live, will mean then that he will control the purse in line with his belief and control the conditions in such a way that they will actually begin to create criminality and learning problems in reality. And then he will go out and document the existence of criminality and the existence of learning problems and say this is the reason why we must be in the position that we're in. And even the victims themselves then will go along with it because they say, well, they have empirical evidence to back up what they say. <laughs> Not realizing that the empirical evidence has been generated and created through a power process. Because, you see, that's all left out. And there's nowhere we are taught in our schools and places to see the processes that takes place. And therefore we are overwhelmed by statistics and so forth. White supremacy has been and is institutionalized in any number of ways. Its institutions are designed to serve its exploitative interests. The educational establishment is one of the major institutions of white supremacy. And its educational ideologies and practices are designed to justify its existence and to provide adjunctive support for white domination and to generate the ev evidentiary conditions which support both its existence, that is the educational establishment, and the existence of the system of which it is an integral part. In fact, educational ideology and practice are potent creators of the material conditions and evidence which maintains and support the white supremacist system, the very ideology itself. You have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, the role of ideology. You have to look at the fact that this system is a system of inequality. It is a culture of inequality. One of the things that characterizes this system is inequality between individuals and people. Where certain people have billions of dollars and others have nothing. How do you justify that idea? How do you justify that situation? And this is the role of the white intellectual establishment to justify white wealth and power and white poverty uh, and black uh, powerlessness and poverty. To justify white wealth and power in the world, and African poverty and powerlessness in the world. You see? And what is the ideology then that this system projects to justify itself? 
It rejects the ideology of individualism. Yes. yes. And the ideology, as I said earlier, of familialism. That is, that people are in the position that they're in as a result of individual defects and deficiencies. Not as a result of power relations between groups. Not as a result of warfare and enslavement and domination. Not as a result of exclusion from economic activity and so forth, but because they have something wrong with their minds and their brains. And with their personalities. You see? And that is why they are where they are. In the older days, it used to be that they had a problem with their moral sense. And that's why in the early days of social work, the people went out trying to preach to the poor lessons in morality. Just as old Dan Quell is trying to preach lessons in values. As if you can eat values and morality. These people suffer from a lack of money. And a lack of income. And a lack of jobs. A lack of support from their government and their system. What else does a government exist for if it, is, if it does not exist to support its people? You understand? But they want to run a game and claim that it is an absence of values and an absence of morals and an absence of some kind of intangible idea that is the cause of people's material sufferings and misery. It is the absence of something within the people themselves. It is a deficiency operating in the family. And a lot of us fall for this nonsense. Well, we've got to deal with the family. And it starts in the family. It doesn't start in the family. The family is a part of a social political system. The African American family was a slave institution, and it is still a slave institution. It was created during slavery time. And even if it had a mama and a daddy and some kids, it was still a slave family. And that made it fundamentally different from a European family, even though in form, it might have looked the same. But do not confuse form and substance. You must understand that. It's just not enough to have a mama and a daddy and some children and to claim that you have the same family as white folks family. You're wrong. Because domination changes that situation. Because the black family, regardless of its com uh, composition, is a family in domination. And ultimately is a family that's designed to do what? Serve the interests of others. And despite its form, whether it had mama, daddy, and young babies, it is still in its fundamental nature being under the domination of another people in many ways still fundamentally different. And its interactions and relationships are shaped by those dominated, they, denominational uh, dynamics. And you've got to understand that, you see. And when domination requires that this family breaks up and falls apart, then that is what's going to happen to the family situation. That is why in the end you just can't solve the problems of African people by merely trying to deal with the African family. You must deal with the forces that shape that family. You must change the nature of the system that impacts on that family. Forces fathers out. Forces men to not have jobs so that they can't support families. One of the reasons why these black men here shy from responsibilities, you call it ladies and gentlemen, is because they are not in the position economically to understand. The ideology of the individualism, free market capitalism, into which it so skillfully socializes its lower classes and the African American community. For the implicit acceptance and extreme practice of these ideologies, that is the ideology of individualism and free market, are individually isolating, overly competitive, and communally divisive. In other words, when we believe this ideology, it divides us. 
isolates us one from the other, puts us into direct competition one with the other, and maintains division within the community in the name of good old American individualism so that a ruling class can manipulate it to its end. And therefore, this philosophy of individualism is impoverishing and disempowering, which is the reason they are foisted on the African American community. We are the only Americans in America. We are the only ones who really believe American uh, ideology. I'm telling you, we are. We are the only people who believe this nonsense. The abiding characteristics of the culture of power and wealth are these. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, when you get off of studying our characteristics, I urge you to study the characteristics of people who rule you. And often you have to reverse these equations, you see. Instead of saying, what are the characteristics of the weak and the powerless? Why not ask, what are the characteristics of the powerful and the wealthy? Because that is what? Where we want to go. What is the nature of the organization of those who rule and control themselves and control the world? You understand? And this is what we'll be doing in the courses on power. We won't be talking about how we are victimized by power. We're going to talk about how we're going to victimize the victimizer. You see, in order for these people to rule us, they must create us in a mentality where we can't see the obvious. Where we can't see what is immediately in front of our face. That's the only way it can work. It must set us up in such a way that we'll spend tons of energy trying to dig under the establishment and see what they're doing. What kind of little conspiracy are they doing under here? We got a lot of people caught up in that, you know. Reading all kinds of books about this underground European conspiracy. Baby, it's the overground one that's working. You know, you know I had a friend, you know, who said, you know, we were worried about the third eye and we can't even deal with the two we got. You know, that right here in our heads. We spent all day trying to locate the third eye. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But also, you know, these eyes were pretty here too, to see things. All right? Any intelligence agency will tell you that about 85% of this intelligence is gathered from standard popular publications. Yeah, just reading newspapers and magazines and journals. That only about 5% of intelligence and of the important intelligence is gathered by some secret underground type of stuff. Most of it is what? Right up front. Right in front. We must gain the capacity to see what's right in front of us. And I tell you, these Europeans reveal themselves to us every day. All the time. One of our greatest powers we have is the European, his whole plan for ruling and everything is right there. We can reach right out and get it. What are the characteristics of, of this? Oh boy, yeah. Okay. What are the characteristics? These are not individualists. That's what I'm trying to show you here. A class, community, and ethnic consciousness. Yes. Yes. Those people who rule know that they are in the ruling class. Yes. They know one another. Yes. They identify with one another. Yes. They hang out with one another. Yes. They go to school with one another. Yes. You understand? Yes. But that's the opposite of what they tell you. Yes. You know, stay separate, be on your own, move on your own, and follow your own thing. What is the other thing they have? Wealth money, not just values, but what? Money, money. That's what you need to rule in this world. But see, they're gonna leave you with this moral nonsense. Control of social and political and other important institutions necessary for reaching group, group goals and for realizing group values. But they have institutions, colleges, universities, think tanks, as you were mentioning here, you see political organizations and institutions so that they can reach the goals that they make for themselves. But they tell the poor that they can achieve what they want through individual salvation, as I have heard, as we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. You see, they go to exclusive colleges and universities. And they build the universities for themselves to work for them 
and they send their people to those universities. And then they tell us we can go anywhere we feel like it and we shouldn't build universities specifically designed for our interests. And so the highest achievement we can make is to go to all kinds of places all over the place without having places that we have created in our own interests. You understand? But they create the universities. I've told you time and time again. I see people here who come to these conferences talking about it takes it took the Egyptian priest 40 years or whatever to be complete in their education. And yet these same people think that they can educate black people with two hour lectures every weekend. Huh? Yeah, that's right. You think you can just hear a lecture on Saturday and that's going to give you enough of what you need to overturn this system? But ladies and gentlemen, what do you think? How long do you think these people go to school? In America. They have institutions open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they take their people through these institutions for 30 and 40 years so that they can rule the world. You understand? And we have to understand then that we have to have our own institutions and we must put our people through the years of training necessary so that we can meet these people on their own terms and deal with them. And that means then that you must have political and social institutions over which you have control. And you remember I told you before, when I see you sitting in these churches, when I see you 15 and 20 years without a building and without anything that you have control on, when the janitor of that church comes in and flicks lights on and off and tells you it's time to go, regardless of what you have to talk about and what you have to do, then you can't be totally sincere about overthrowing the system. And you. you can't be sincere about it. A number one, you must have control of your time. That's right. I can tell you whether a person has real grasp, has a real grasp of the problem that confront African people by the time they give you to talk about the problem. You see? And it indicates then, they, they often indicate that they have no grasp of the problem. You see? Because they say, well, you got an hour and you got 45 minutes. <laughs> You know, something like that. And the same thing goes in the school. I've told you before that in these schools, black people, are, uh, children are torn up by the time system. Because you have inherited a system from another people. That time system is organically related to them. Their goals, their history and experience. That time system in these public schools is not your time system. And this time system destroys our people. Do you know how you feel when you're late? What happens to your body? How you, your heart beats? How your blood pressure rises? And you notice the physiological changes your body undergoes just in terms of the time situation? Do you notice how you start getting nervous, anxious? How when you're sitting in an exam, that stopwatch is up there ticking away and you lose your memory? And you lose your thought and organization? This is what happens then when you let another people set the time for you. When you operate in their time system, that time system will destroy you physiologically and mentally. It will destroy your mentality, your memory, and your capacity to think. You confuse that with a lack of ability. You ever notice once you get out of the exam, how all your stuff comes back to you? Yeah, which means then that, that you didn't lose knowledge, you didn't even lose the memory. You lost the capacity to do what? Under the pressure of time to what? Retrieve it. And to appropriately organize the memory, you see. So if you want your children to appropriately remember, to organize their thought, to organize their behavior, you see, then you must provide them with an appropriate time system. A system that recognizes their history, their experiences, their goals and so forth, and then organizes their time within that construct. You got to throw out these time systems that these people have given you. You got to throw out these time systems that the society lays on you. 
You got to throw out these time systems that they put you on radio. You might hear a lot of people complain. All we have, to, all we hear is people analyzing the problem over and over again. You know why? It's not that often the people don't have the solutions, but often you must set up the analysis of the problem so people can see how the solution is logically related to the analysis. But since you bought white folks radio time, right, and you go on air time when they tell you to go on air time, and you go on news time when they go on news time, you see, in other words, you've inherited a radio system that's vague and a time system in radio that will vitiate your capacity to stick with your people long enough so that you can work from start to finish. You see, are we bought this idea that a guest can only appear once? Then sometimes the guests may have to appear for a whole week. You see, I may have to stay for two straight hours. You see, so that the people can be truly educated. The radio stations and the media must be organized in their time sequences in terms of what we must accomplish as a people. They are not there principally to sell ads. They must be there to educate the people. And therefore, they must provide the time necessary for that education to take place. That is why we need an independent, non-commercial radio. So that we can give the kind of time we need to solve our problems as a people. And you have to understand this kind of situation and understand what is happening. So these people organize their time, they organize their institution. This is what ruling peoples do. You see, they, 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 have, they control the government. African people, you must shoot for the control of the American government. That's why I'm advocating a black party, an independent black party. Yeah. I know some Negroes are saying immediately, well, you never win the president. I don't give a hoot about the president. <laughs> Jesse Jackson could have been a far more powerful leader right. if he'd given up running for the presidency and decided to truly represent black people in this world. He would have been able to influence presidents and to dictate to presidents because he would have had the power of black people behind him. And ultimately, the power is not sitting on the throne. The power is behind the throne. Electoral politics is not governance. Simply because you're voting someone into office doesn't mean you're engaged in government and that you're engaged in the governance process. We got a lot of jokers selling voting. Every time people call up on the radio, every problem that black people suffer from is because they don't vote. basic question. Look at the major victories of black people. Were they attained by voting? Huh? Did we vote in order to get the vote? <laughs> then why are we being sold voting as the chief solution to the problems of African American people? You know why you're being sold voting? That's the chief problem for African American people. Because the bourgeois class that rules us, and I'm speaking now of the black bourgeois class, okay? You see, you gotta learn the principles of domination. Yeah. I'm telling you. One thing that the dominating class does is to make those who are dominated think that the interests of those who dominate are their interests. And that they can and to make the dominated think that they can only achieve their ends by satisfying the interests of the dominated. It's an old trick.
Reagan ran it on America and has broken the country. What did he tell the folk? Supply side economics. Now look, if you give the rich people a tax break, they're going to take that money that they save and they're going to invest it in industry and create jobs for you. And you had old Perot last night saying, well, the trickle down thing didn't trickle down. And he's right. What did they do with the money? Played with it. The parole said it again last night. What did they do? They played with money. And what they did, swap the industries that already exist between each other and just generated false wealth. Not building, not investing. As a matter of fact, that crew took its tax savings, engaged in leveraged buyouts, indebted its corporations to no end, uh, created massive debt in the nation and then had the nerve to deindustrialize America and ship its industries outside of the country. And then they sold us equal opportunity, equal rights, and equal employment. And they include in their ad this is an equal opportunity company. But you know what? The company's not even in America. <laughs> and, the, and the way the companies are, the people don't even have those kind of laws. You can't even get in them. And that's the nature of this beast, you see. They're going to pass all these laws, and when you get ready to execute them, you'll find out that the, that the factors and things that they were supposed to execute it for are no longer there. So now you got the laws on the book, but you're in worse shape than you were before. And so it told, and Reagan then told the American people that if you support the interests of the rich, then they will solve your problems. And now they're learning here in 1992 that their problems have multiplied. And you're going to find that this is the case with any bourgeois class. Yes, sir. It's going to tell the dominated mm -hmm. that they will solve their problems or the lower classes by supporting the interests of the ruling group called the bourgeois class. Uh -huh. The bourgeois class that rules us has to a great extent gained its wealth and prestige through the electoral process. They have gained elective office. They have gained beautiful contracts, set-asides, and they've gained access to some industry and ownership of various resources. Okay? And then they want to tell us and the masses of African people that if they support their electoral interest, which will put them into office, which will permit them to operate within the Democratic Party, that it in some way or other is going to advance the interest of the masses of African people. And therefore then we are so voting and we are made to think that the election of one of these people represents an advancement for the race. Okay? And we think enriching one or two of them will give us a vicarious pleasure while we starve to death out here in the street in our homes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We gotta get ready for revolution. They then set up a set of social relations. They control community resources. These people that rule control what? Resources. That's the essence of power. A control of resources. A control of institutions. Wealth. You understand? A class consciousness. An ethnic consciousness. An identity one with the other. They control their resources, they socialize their own children, they educate their own children, they train their own children, they create the institutions in which this socialization and education and training takes place. This is what ruling groups do. That's why they create their exclusive schools, prep schools, graduate schools, and other kind of things. And why they tell you, you should go and scatter yourself among all these other institutions. They have an ideology of group superiority, of group 
worthiness and an overwhelming desire to be free and independent and a drive for hegemony, a drive to rule and to be in control of themselves. They control superior coercive force. That's how they differ. They're in control of what? The army, the police force, and the control of power. So when you finally get totally out of hand, they're going to bring in what? The National Guard and the army and so forth. If you're going to be a powerful people, then you must control what? Superior coercive forces, superior physical forces, control real power in that regard so that you can maintain yourself and deal with other people. This is what power is about, you see. And these people express a willingness to fully and effectively use them to achieve and defend their group interests. You want power? This is the way you got to go. There's no other way. Pleading to some people's moral side to their humanity and all this other nonsense ain't gonna get it. You have to realize then as I wind it up, you see, that this European is set to continue to rule over us. And while we may, and I'm sorry I didn't get around to special ed tonight, I'll get around to it another day. Because you remember, in order for this society to rule, it must disenable us mentally. It's a political economic requirement that black people be mentally crippled in order for the system to exist. It is a requirement then that the methods that this system generates in its effort to so-called treat these disabilities must contribute to the problem or must not resolve the problem fully. We must understand ourselves as a people. You must get out of this idea that black children come to school behind, already behind. There's no such thing as children coming to school behind. Anybody. They come to school as they are. They come to school at the point where their culture has uh, bought them. They're not behind. They are who they are. They reflect their cultural experience. They are where they should be in terms of their actual experience and circumstance. But as soon as you see them as coming behind and entering this school behind somebody, as soon as you see them as disadvantaged when they enter the school, you're already in trouble and you've already mentally set yourself up to destroy them. One of these nights I'm going to talk to you about oral culture. Because you know, we are an oral people. You see, and you got to understand that culture deeply. And the effect it has on thinking. And the effect it has on behavior, you see. And you have to recognize that, that how it, it expresses itself in thought forms. And in, in, in uh, speech forms. The oral culture and the oral orientation develops out of face-to-face -face cultures. You see, I was talking to a teacher here last week when she was telling uh, me that I teach my students to say, to speak in complete sentences. If they stumble on somebody's toe, I tell them to say, sorry, I am, so I am sorry, so and so, for stepping on your toe. You know, that's fine. And, 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 and instead of just saying, well, sorry, <laughs> okay. However, I'm not condemning her teaching this. In fact, this should be taught, but it's not what you teach as much as the reason for which you teach it, you see. But that is an oral orientation because that oral orientation is one where people operate in small groups and face-to-face -face groups. You see, and in a society that pretty much still has us locked into small groups, so that the people we communicate with, we generally know very well, and and and, and, there, and we share a history and experience such that we can say one word and they understand a ton of things. You see, and this is the nature of our culture, you see. And they can say sorry because everybody saw that you stepped on a person's foot. 
they know who's going to get stepped on, they know who you are, and the whole business, so you say, say, say sorry. But the other parts of the sinners are what? In pride. You see? Now, when you move into a literary culture, that culture is a culture designed for people to communicate over distance. It's essentially designed for communication between strangers and between people who never met each other, seen each other, who do not share a common background. Therefore, it requires elaborated uh, uh, speech skills and descriptive skills and more precision in expression because you've got to supply much more of this in order that the person understand what you're talking about. You see, you have to understand this then. When these children walk into the school, you must understand they're not linguistically deficient. There's nothing wrong with their language. You understand? Their language reflects the kind of social environment in which they operate, and it functions efficiently in that environment. They're not behind anybody. They have no neurological defects. They have no problems with their brain. Even the standard psychologist will tell you that 80% of the children who are diagnosed as learning disabled are mixed diagnosed. I'm telling you. But a lot of it is because people do not know the culture and history of the children they are dealing with. And they misinterpret those children. Now then, when you deal with these children and you know that experience, then you know that your place as a teacher there is to meet that child where that child is. And that you're now to take that child across a bridge into new ways of thinking because now it must confront people who think in a different sort of way. And it must not reject its way of thinking, but it must add on to it and efficiency with new forms of thinking so that it can appropriately deal with people who think in that way and can operate efficiently in their world in terms of its interests. Not because they're going to work for them one day, but because they are going to work them one day. <laughs> okay. you got to look at the culture that we're talking about. You have to understand the psychohistory of these children and the psychohistory of African people. That psychohistory then means that the way people think reflects their level of social activity and their social and, and, and economic political role in society. You understand? And therefore, their thought patterns will tend to be correlated with their work patterns and habits and with the roles that they play in the society. That's why I tell you, job discrimination did not only block black people from making money. It also meant that the kind of thinking styles that were attached to various types of jobs were not inculcated into black people because they did not have the responsibilities of those jobs. And it meant then, not having the responsibilities of those jobs, they were unable subliminally and otherwise to pass on to their children the thought patterns connected with those jobs. So ultimately, job discrimination was a way of manipulating and creating a mentality in black people and a thought style in black people. Then you ask for assimilation and entered then into a school system that took certain thought styles for granted and even thought those thought styles came up as a matter of pure development. And when it did not see, it does not see these thought styles in your children, it then will evaluate them as being defective. You see, and being deficient. No, they are not. They are not deficient at all. It means then that the school systems themselves must be reorganized. One of the major functions of learning disabilities, uh, the learning disabilities establishment, besides the fact that each learning disabled child is worth $7,000 a year to each school, 
You understand? Seven thousand dollars a year. The number of so-called learning disabled doubled within very short years. This learning disabilities orientation is worth over thirteen to fifteen billion dollars to the American educational establishment. What did I say earlier? The people are invested in our so-called disabilities. School systems depend on our having these disabilities, ladies and gentlemen. That's why in the end, you've got to change the nature of school organization. And you've got to organize these schools in line with your psychology as a people and in line with where you want to go as a people. That means a thorough African-centered education is not only an education that is based upon the history and experience of African people, it recognizes that that history and experience of African people has created in us certain thought style orientations. It has created in us certain learning styles. You understand? Yes. We have been conditioned into thinking and learning in certain sort of ways. So then when we enter into other institutions where people have been conditioned in thinking in other ways, we are put at a so-called disadvantage. So then it means an African Senate theory must develop a theory of learning and a theory of thinking. How do African American people think? How do African American people learn? You gotta work this out. You see? Then it must develop a, 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 a theory of pedagogy, a theory of teaching. How must our children be taught given their thought and learning styles and motivational styles in a way that they can become the people we need for them to be in order for us to achieve our liberation? You see, and this is where we have to go. One other, thing on top, one other thing on top of that, besides dealing with our so-called disabilities, we must look at education in terms of the problems we have to solve as black people. And let me tell you, we face some enormous problems. The economic bad news is going to really come out after the election. This economic system is in very, very bad shape. It is also, even if it recovers, going to be fundamentally restructured. You think that our people are suffering because they lack job training? In fact, I think they have an ad in last Sunday's paper. It may, uh, may not be here. And, oh yeah, here it is. In last Sunday's paper here, a cartoon. It says, the first thing says, all I need is a job. And then there's another person that steps in as a professional type. What you need is job retraining. Then he has him studying job retraining. He's writing and scripting and he's learning. And, they find, and the other thing has him handling, handing him a job re retraining certificate. Okay? And the last panel has him saying what? Now all I need is a job. <laughs> In other words, ladies and gentlemen, when you try and you call yourself training these children for jobs, when the jobs don't even exist, white management is being wiped out. Management jobs, white collar jobs are being wiped out. This country is being deindustrialized. What jobs are you saying that you're trying to get your children to be educated for? Are you kidding? You must now educate your children to create jobs. Yeah. You must educate these children into geography. You must educate them into mineralogy. You must educate them into international trade. You see? so that we can build up trade with the Caribbean, with Central and South America, and build up trade with the African continent. We must have Africans owning Africa, shipping to America, 
and this must be shipped through African hands in America itself. That's right. And the reason why we want power in this country, we want the power to manipulate U.S. foreign policy. Okay? We want the power to make African countries most favored nations in America. We want the, we want the power so that the African manufacturer can have access to the American market. But we know that it's not, the Africans cannot manufacture and technologically develop themselves unless they have markets to sell to. And, and this large African American population in America must make one of the largest markets in the world, which is even expanding with the addition of Mexico and Canada. We must make this market open to African manufacturing and African technology. And, and, and we must educate our people then to advance the technological development of Africa, the manufacturing development of Africa, and we must organize the American economy so that they will have a market to sell to. You understand? Yes. And this is what power is about. I warned you the last time I was here that we are caught up in unrealistic expectations. And I told you the last time, every time I see a Negro stand up, he talks about black and Latino. And we got a bunch of people here who want to carry the whole world on their backs, even though they can't walk on their own two feet. You better learn something about reality. These people are going to ride your back until they're able to walk on their own feet. And they're going to turn around on you. There's no love between, between a people. There are interests between people. And they coalesce when their interests coalesce. But when their interests don't coalesce, the love affair is over, man. So the people who may operate with you today may be your enemy tomorrow. And you have to work on that. After I told you that in this month's Atlantic Magazine, what do we have here? Immigration and the New American Dilemma. Blacks versus brown. You read about the high school over here in Brooklyn. You know what's going on over there. There was another piece in the New York Times today about this major fight over the black superintendent of the schools in L.A. Ethnic politics, very strong. I heard a new thing on LIB, but they didn't go into the details of how the Latinos put up a tremendous fight over this man's appointment and the kind of things that they said about it. If you checked Town 13 about two or three weeks ago, you would have seen the organization out there that says, we are no longer going to help the blacks, and we are no longer going to hook into the whites and the Jews. We are going for ourselves. We are 60%. Of, uh, of, of Los Angeles and we're no longer going to be told what piece of the pie we're going to get. We're going to tell how the pie is going to be cut. Okay? That's the way the deal goes out, ladies and gentlemen. You're dealing here with the population that's rapidly growing. And then at the rate it's growing, we'll have the West Coast right on down through Texas and New Mexico and we'll engage in trade interaction with Central and South America build its wealth and power in America by its direct interaction with those countries and use those countries' power and influence in the world to support their own power and influence in America. You understand what we're talking about here? And then you've got another group that will work itself down the East Coast from New York City through Washington, D.C. Before you know anything, you'll be landlocked. You've got to get your own territory and you've got to get control of your own situation. You've got to get into export and import relationships with Africa and, and with, with Central and South America where Africans are to advance your own interests and your own prosperity. And in order to do this, you must educate your children specifically to accomplish this. And in order to do this, they must be educated specifically in the business. As I told people, I'm tired of these little courses how to run a small business. How to, how to write a business plan. Get out with the business plan. I need money. Tell 
Only the general course on business. Why? Because the immigrants have an informal education system. They educate their children by them being in the stores with them. They know how to stock this because they see it going all the time. They know how to make the register because they work it all the time. They know who the wholesalers are because they see their fathers going there to the wholesalers time and time again. You understand? Now for the people who don't have these kind of businesses in abundance, they cannot educate their children in terms of apprenticeship. It means then that our children have to be formally educated and motivated, but they have to be educated specifically. How to run a fruit stand. How to run a grocery store. How to run a hardware store. Who are the wholesalers? How you negotiate with a wholesaler? You understand? Specific information so that we can specifically take over the world. One other thing, stop needing love from other people. Settle down for the fact that we're going to have 20 to 25 years of racial tension. I tell audiences today, and I'm going to tell you tonight, I didn't come here to bring racial harmony. I came here tonight to increase racial tension. Because I know one thing, when the other races are on your back, if you were to stand up, you got to throw them off. And if you're going to have control of your resources, you got to run them out. Yeah. And you got to get used to the idea that they're going to call you everything but a child of God. Yeah. They're going to accuse you of reverse racism. Yeah. They're going to lay everything on you when you move them out. But you got to move them out anyway. Yeah. And you got to move forward. Good night. information about the retreat. Huh? No. Uh, speak to uh, Mrs. Maddox in the back if you are interested. If you're not prepared to uh, register to institutions that can permit them to function in a, in a wholesome uh, way and wholesome direction. I will reveal those kind of things during the sessions. Okay, and, you got uh, we, those that are not uh, available, we will create. At that time, we will talk about them at that time. I cannot miss them at this particular time. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm located in 236. We'll be ready in about a week. East, uh, maybe two weeks. We work on 138 Street. The book, uh, the address is right in the books. Yeah. That's in, in the Bronx. Bronx 10451. Some people get lost because they own 138 Street in Manhattan. But it's in the Bronx, near 3rd Avenue. Uh, you can contact us at 212-993-1111. Uh, two two, two two two. And uh, we can work from there. Uh, the organization I had is called the Pan-African Research and Development Foundation. Mm -hmm. The seminar will last for 10 weeks, and we, uh, the 
time periods that we use, some of these tools are already set up in terms of concept and structure. What we really need now are people to come in and take responsibility for moving them forward. We got credit unions already set up and laid out, loan fund. We're also putting in place export, import relationships, and the kind of courses that I was talking about just a minute ago. Those kind of things. But we need people who can take undertake the responsibility to shepherd these projects through, and that will be developed as a part of the seminars. On power. All right, look about to it. We want people who work.